Talmud, Mas Nazir A C H A P T E R I Mishnah. All the substitutes for the Nazi right vow are equivalent to Nazi right vows. If a man says I shall be one, he becomes a Nazi right. If he says I shall become a Nazi right, a Nazi right, a Nazi right, he becomes a Nazi right. If he says I intend to be like this, or I intend to curl my hair, or I mean to tend my hair, or I undertake to develop tresses, he becomes a Nazi right. If he says I take upon myself an obligation involving birds, our Meir says he becomes a Nazi right. But the sages say he does not become a Nazi right. Gemara, seeing that the Tana is teaching the order Nashim, why does he speak of the Nazi right? The Tana had in mind the scriptural verse, then it cometh to pass if she find no favor in his eyes because he had found some unseemly thing in her, and he reasons thus what was the cause of the woman's infidelity. One further, he proceeds whosoever sees an unfaithful wife in her degradation will take a Nazi right vow and abjure one. How is it? That in enunciating the general rule, the Mishnah mentions first substitutes and then gives examples of illusions. Rob others say Kadi said there is a hiatus in the Mishnah and it should read as follows All the substitutes for the Nazi right vow are equivalent to Nazi right vows, and all allusions to the Nazi right vow are equivalent to Nazi right vows. The following are illusions. If a man says I shall be one, he becomes a Nazi right, etc. Ought not then the substitutes to be enumerated first. It is customary for the Tana to explain first what he mentions last. Thus we learn with what materials may the Sabbath lamp be kindled and with what may it not be kindled, and the exposition begins it is forbidden to kindle, etc. Again we learn with what materials may hot vittles be covered on the Sabbath and with what may they not be covered, and the exposition begins it is forbidden to cover, etc. Again what may a woman wear when she goes out on the Sabbath and what may she not wear when she Goes out and the exposition begins. She must not go out, etc. But have we not learned with what trappings may an animal go out on the Sabbath and with what may it not go out? Whilst the exposition begins, the camel may go out, etc. And again, some both inherit and bequeath, and some inherit, but do not bequeath. Some bequeath and do not inherit, and some neither inherit nor bequeath. Whilst the exposition begins, the following both inherit and bequeath. The truth is that the ten adopts sometimes one method and sometimes the other according to circumstances. In the first set of cases, it is because the prohibition is a personal one. This personal prohibition is expounded first. On the other hand, in the case of the animal, since the prohibition arises primarily through the animal, those things which are permitted are mentioned first. Talmud, Mas Nazir, be with inheritance. Again, the basic type of inheritance is dealt with first. Granted, all this in the case of the Nazi right vow, why should not the Substitutes be enumerated first. There is a special reason viz that the rule regarding the efficacy of the illusions is derived from the scriptural text by a process of inference, and therefore the Tana set a special value on it. Then why does he not mention them first for opening the subject? The Tana prefers to mention the basic type of vow, but in his exposition he illustrates the illusions first. If a man says, I shall be one, he becomes a Nazi right, but might he not mean I shall keep a fast day? Samuel said, We must suppose that a Nazi right is passing by when he makes this declaration. Are we to infer from this that Samuel is of the opinion that illusions, the significance of which is not manifest, have not the force of a direct statement? Let me explain what Samuel means is that if a Nazi right is passing by, there is no reason to suspect a different intention, but without question, if no Nazi right is passing by, we say that he might mean I shall keep a fast day, but perhaps his Purpose was to free the other from his sacrifices. We presume it to be known that he added mentally a Nazi right. If so, it is surely obvious that he becomes a Nazi right. It might be thought that we require his utterance and his intention to coincide. And so we are told that this is not so. I shall become Lee. He becomes a Nazi right. Perhaps he means I shall become Lee before him in the performance of precepts. As has been taught, the verse This is my God and I will glorify him means I will glorify him in the performance of precepts. I shall build an attractive booth, procure a faultless palm branch where elegant fringes write a magnificent scroll of the law and provide it with wrappings of choices. Silk Samuel said, We assume that he takes hold of his hair when he says, I shall become Lee. Seeing that to become a Nazi right is in a way a sin. Can it be termed comely Talmud? Mas Nazir, yes, for even our Eliezer Hakapper who says that a Nazi right is accounted a sinner means only the Nazi right who has contracted ritual impurity for since he must nullify his previous abstinence in accordance with the rule laid down by the merciful one but the former days shall be void because his consecration was defiled there is a danger that he may break his Nazi right vow but a Nazi right who remains ritually clean is not termed a sinner I intend to be like this granted that he takes hold of his hair he does not say I intend to be through this but only like the Samuel said we suppose that a Nazi right is passing by at the time I intend to curl my hair how do we know that this word mesel cell refers to the curling of the hair from a remark made by a maidservant of rabbi's household who said to a certain man how much longer are you going to curl mesel cell your hair but perhaps it refers to the Torah in accordance with the verse extol her salsa and she will exalt thee Samuel said here too we suppose that he takes hold of his hair I mean to tend my hair how do we Know that this word mikalkal refers to the tending of his hair from what we learned with regard to Orpiment. Our Judah said that there must be sufficient to depilate the kilkal and Rab commented this means the hair of one of the temples but might it not mean tending the poor in accordance with the verse and Joseph sustained W.A. Yekakal his father and his brother Samuel said here too we assume that he takes hold of his hair I undertake to develop tresses he becomes a Nazi right how do we know that this word shilwa signifies increase from the verse that shoots shilohi are a park of pomegranates but perhaps it has the significance of removal in accordance with the verse and sendeth we surely waters upon the fields the occurrence of the word paratresses in connection with the Nazi right gives the tent of the clue it says here he shall be holy he shall let the locks para grow long and it says elsewhere regarding an ordinary priest nor suffer their locks para to grow long Yishli, who alternatively we can say that the Sholia used of water also signifies increase for when produce is watered it shoots up if he says I take upon myself an obligation involving birds Armeir says he becomes a Nazi right what is Armeir's reason Rishlake said in making this vow he has in mind the birds that are coupled with hair in the scriptural verse till his hair was grown long like eagle's feathers and his nails like birds claws Armeir is of the opinion that a man will refer to one thing when he means something else occurring in the same context Talmud, Mas Nazir be whilst the rabbis are of the opinion that a man will not refer to one thing when he means another Aryohan and said both Armeir and the rabbis are agreed that a man will not refer to one thing etc and Armeir's reason is that we take account of the possibility that what he had undertaken was to bring the birds of a ritually unclean Nazi right but if we are to take possible meanings into account why should we not say that he was undertaking to bring a free will offering of birds in that event he would have said I undertake to bring a nest but perhaps he meant I undertake to bring the birds of a leper we must suppose that a Nazi right passes by at the time but perhaps it was a ritually unclean Nazi right and he desired to free him from his obligatory sacrifices we must suppose that a ritually clean Nazi right passes by at the time what practical difference is there between them there would be a difference for example if he should say I take upon myself an obligation involving the birds mentioned in the same context as here according to our Yohan and notwithstanding that he says this he becomes a Nazi right if one is passing at the time but not otherwise whereas according to our Simeon Belakish even though no Nazi right passes by at the time he becomes a Nazi right but is there any authority who disputes that a man may refer to one thing and mean another occurring in the same context? Has it not been taught if a man says by my right hand it is accounted an oath now surely the reason for this is the verse when he lifted up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swore by him who liveth forever not so it is because the expression by my right hand is itself an oath as it has been taught how do we know that if a man says by my right hand it is accounted an oath from the verse the Lord hath sworn by his right hand and how do we know that if a man says by my left hand it is accounted an oath because the verse continues and by the arm of his strength mission if a man says I declare myself a Nazi right to abstain from pressed grapes or from grape stones or from pulling or from contracting ritual defilement he becomes a Nazi right and all the regulations of Nazariteship apply to him Gemara the mission is not in agreement with our Simeon for it has been taught our Simeon says
Service in the verse drink no wine nor strong drink thou nor thy sons with thee just as for the Nazi right only wine is forbidden but not other beverages so in connection with the temple service only wine is forbidden to the priests but not other intoxicating beverages this conflicts with the opinion of our Judah for it has been taught our Judah said that a priest who eats preserved figs from Gila or drinks honey or milk and then enters the temple is guilty alternatively our Simeon rejects it. Principle that a prohibition can come into operation when a prohibition on a different count is already present as has been taught our Simeon says that a man who eats carrion on the day of atonement is not liable to a penalty for breach of observance of the day what do the rabbis make of the verse he shall eat nothing that is made of the grapevine the rabbis will tell you that this teaches that the various kinds of food forbidden to a Nazi right can combine together our Simeon on the other. And does not require a rule about combination for it has been taught our Simeon says that a might of forbidden food is sufficient to entail liability describes a quantity equivalent to an olive is required only where a sacrifice is the appropriate penalty mission if a man says I vow to be like Samson the son of Manoah who was the husband of Delilah or who plucked up the gates of Gezer or whose eyes the Philistines put out he becomes a Nazi right like Samson tomorrow why must the mission specify all these expressions all are necessary for if he were to say I wish to be like Samson I might think that some other Samson was intended and so we are told that he must add like the son of Manoah again if he were to add only the son of Manoah I might think that there is someone else so named and so we are told that he must add like the husband of Delilah or like him whose eyes the Philistines put out mission what difference is there between a Nazi right like Samson and a life Nazi right a life Nazarite whenever his hair becomes burdensome may thin it with a razor and then offer three animal sacrifices whilst should he be ritually defiled he must offer the sacrifice prescribed for defilement the Nazi right like Samson is not permitted to thin his hair should it become burdensome and if ritually defiled does not offer the sacrifice prescribed for defilement tomorrow how does a life Nazarite come in here there is a hiatus in the mission and it should read as follows if a man says I intend to be a life Nazarite he becomes a life Nazarite what difference is there between a Nazi right like Samson and a life Nazarite a life Nazarite whenever his hair becomes burdensome may thin it with a razor and then offer three animal sacrifices whilst should he be ritually defiled he must offer the sacrifice prescribed for defilement the Nazi right like Samson is not permitted to thin his hair with a razor should it become burdensome Talmud Mas Nazir B and if Ritually defiled does not offer the sacrifice prescribed for defilement. You say that the Nazi right like Samson does not have to offer the sacrifice prescribed for defilement, enabling me to infer that he is subject to the Nazi right obligation which forbids him to defile himself, who then is the author of our mission, seeing that it can be neither our Judah nor our Simeon, for it has been taught our Judah said that a Nazi right like Samson is permitted to defile himself deliberately by contact with the dead, for Samson himself did so. Our Simeon says that if a man declares I intend to be a Nazi right like Samson, his statement is of no effect since we are not aware that Samson personally ever pronounced a Nazi right vow. We ask then who is the author of our mission, it cannot be our Judah, for he says that a Nazi right like Samson may even defile himself intentionally, whereas our mission merely states that no sacrifice need be offered if he has become defiled accidentally, nor can it. Be our Simeon since he says that the vow does not become operative at all actually it is our Judah and the Nazi right like Samson is permitted to defile himself but because in referring to the life Nazarite the Mishnah uses the expression should he be ritually defiled the same expression is used in referring to the Nazi right like Samson may we say that the difference of our Judah and our Simeon is essentially the same as that of the following Tanaim for it has been taught if a man says this. Food shall be as forbidden for me as a firstling our Jacob says he may not eat it but our Jose says he may may we not say then that our Judah agrees with our Jacob in holding that the object with which the comparison is made need not itself be one forbidden as a result of a vow whilst our Simeon agrees with our Jose in holding that the object with which comparison is made must be one forbidden as a result of a vow this is not so both our Judah and our Simeon are agreed that it is necessary for. The object with which comparison is made to be one forbidden as the result of a vow, but the case of the firstling is different since in the verse when a man vowed a vow unto the Lord, the superfluous words unto the Lord include the firstling as a legitimate object of comparison. What does our Jose reply to this argument? He will say that the expression unto the Lord serves to include the sin offering and the guilt offering, but not the firstling. We may ask him on what ground and are the sin offering and the guilt offering included rather than the firstling. He would reply the sin offering and the guilt offering are included because they have to be expressly dedicated, but the firstling is excluded since it need not be expressly dedicated. And our Jacob, he can rejoin firstlings who are expressly dedicated, for it has been taught the members of our teacher's household used to say, How do we know that when a firstling is born in a man's flock, it is his duty to dedicate it? Expressly for the altar because it says the male shalt thou dedicate and our Jose he can reply granted that it is a religious duty to dedicate it expressly yet if he fails to do so is it not nevertheless sacred it may be said in the case of the Nazi right too is there not a phrase into the Lord this is required for the purpose taught in the following passage Simon the just said in the whole of my life I ate of the guilt offering of a defiled Nazi right only once this man who came to me from the south country had beauteous eyes and handsome features with his locks heaped into curls I asked him why my son didst thou resolve to destroy such wonderful hair he answered in my native town I was my father's shepherd and on going down to draw water from the well I used to gaze at my reflection in its waters and my evil inclination assailed me seeking to compass my ruin and so I said to it base wretch why dost thou plume thyself on a world that is not thine own for thy latter end is with worms and maggots I swear I shall shear these locks to the glory of heaven then I rose and kissed him upon his head and said to him like unto thee may there be many Nazi rites in Israel of such as thou art does the verse say when a man shall clearly utter a vow the vow of a Nazi rite to consecrate himself unto the Lord but was not Samson a Nazi rite in the ordinary sense surely the verse states for the child shall be a Nazi rite into God from the womb it was the angel who said this how do we know that Samson did defile himself by contact with the dead shall I say because it is written with the jawbone of an ass have I smitten a thousand men but it is possible that he thrust it at them without touching them but we know it again from the following and smote thirty men of them and took their spoil but it is possible that he stripped them first and slew them afterwards it says clearly first and he smote and then and took but it is still possible that he merely Wounded them mortally before stripping them, we must say therefore that it was known by tradition that he did come into contact with them. Where does it state in the scriptures that a life Nazarite may thin his hair? It has been taught Rabbi said that Absalom was a life Nazarite, for it says, and it came to pass at the end of forty years that Absalom said to the king, Pray thee, let me go and pay my vow which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. He used to cut his hair every twelve months. For it says, and when he pulled his head, now it was at every year's Yamam end that he pulled it Talmud, Mas Nazir and the meaning of the word Yamam here is decided by its meaning when used in connection with houses in walled cities, just as there it means twelve months, so here it means twelve months are near. He said Absalom used to pull every thirty days, our Jose said he used to pull on the eve of each Sabbath, four princes usually pull on the eve of each Sabbath. We have said that Rabbis. Reason for interpreting Yamam as a year is because of its occurrence in connection with houses in walled cities but has not Rabbi himself said that Yamam in that connection means not less than two days the only reason that he uses the comparison at all is because of the reference to the heaviness of Absalom's hair and two days growth is not heavy why should it not be two years in accordance with the verse and it came to pass at the end of two full years from a text containing Yamam. Without mention of years conclusions may be drawn concerning another text containing Yamam without mention of years but no conclusion can be drawn here from this verse where there is mention of years why should it not be thirty days for there is a verse but a whole month from a text mentioning Yamam without months conclusions may be drawn concerning another text mentioning Yamam without months but this verse affords no indication since months are mentioned there with why should not it? Inference be made from Yamam Yamama from days to days conclusions may be drawn concerning a text containing Yamam from another text containing Yamam but not from one containing Yamama but what is the difference between
Citing our Joshua said that it means 40 years after the Israelites had demanded a king it has been taught the year in which they demanded a king was the tenth year of the principate of Samuel the Ramathia and Mishnah Nazi right now of unspecified duration remains in force 30 days tomorrow once is this rule derived our Matina said the text reads he shall be Yeholi and the numerical value of the word Yeholi is 30 bar but is said the duration of the vow corresponds to the number of times that parts of the root Nazar are found in the Torah of his 30 less one why does not our Matina derive the number of days from the occurrences of the various parts of Nazar he will tell you that some of these are required for teaching special lessons thus the verse he shall abstain its ear from wine and strong drink is required to prohibit wine the drinking of which is a ritual obligation as well as wine the drinking of which is optional whilst the verse shall clearly utter a vow the vow of a Nazi right to consecrate himself teaches that one Nazi right vow can be superimposed on another Talmud, Mas Nazir B to which Barpada can reply is there not even one recurrence of the part of Nazar that is not needed for a special lesson since this one may be used for computation L may be used for computation we have learned the Nazi right vow of unspecified duration remains in force 30 days now this fits in well enough with the view of our Matina but how can it be reconciled? With Barpada's view Barpada will tell you that because the period of the vow closes with the 30th day on which the Nazi right pulls and brings his sacrifices the Mishnah says 30 days we have learned if a man says I declare myself a Nazi right he pulls on the 31st day now this fits in well enough with the view of our Matina but how is it to be reconciled with Barpada's view Barpada will say consider the clause which follows this should he pull on the 30th day his Obligation is fulfilled. We see then that the second clause of this Mishnah lends support to his view, whilst the original clause must be read as though it contained the word "I declare myself a Nazi." Right for thirty whole days, does not the second clause need to be reconciled with our Matina's view? He considers part of a day equivalent to a whole day. But have we not learned? Should someone say, "I intend to be a Nazi," right for thirty days and pull on the thirtieth day? His obligation is not fulfilled. We presume that he said whole days. We have learned if a man undertakes two Nazi right shifts, he pulls for the first one on the thirty-first day and for the second on the sixty-first day. This fits in well enough with the view of our Matina Talmud, Mas Nazir. But how is it to be reconciled with Barpada's view? Barpada will say, consider the clause which follows. Visit, however, he should pull for the first on the thirtieth day. He can pull for the second on the sixtieth day. Thus it. Second clause lends support to his view whilst the original clause must be read as though it contained the words whole days is not our Matina in conflict with the second clause our Matina can reply this must be interpreted in the light of the next clause which says that the 30th day counts as belonging to both periods this is taken to signify then that part of a day is equivalent to a whole day but as he the tan not stated this once already it might be thought that this is only true for one Nazi right ship but not for two and so we are told that it is also true for two we have learned should he pull on the day prior to the 60th he has fulfilled his obligation since the 30th day is included in the required number now this fits in well enough with the view of our Matina but for Barpada what necessity is there for this statement since he says that the normal duration is 30 days less one he will say this is the very passage on which I rely for my Opinion we have learned if a person says I intend to be a Nazi right and contracts ritual defilement on the 30th day the whole period is rendered void now this fits in well enough with the view of our Matina but does it not conflict with that of Barpada Talmud, Mas Nazir B. Barpada will say consider the subsequent clause which reads our Eliezer says only the next seven days are void now if you assume that 30 days are necessary as the minimum period of Nazi right separation should not all be void our Matina however will reply our Eliezer is of the opinion that part of a day is equivalent to the whole we have learned if a man says I intend to be a Nazi right for 100 days and contracts ritual defilement on the 100th day the whole period is rendered void our Eliezer said that only 30 days are rendered void now if we assume that our Eliezer considers part of a day to be equivalent to a whole day surely only seven days should be annulled again on the other hand if we Assume that he does not regard part of a day as equivalent to a whole day should not the whole period be annulled in point of fact we do not regard part of a day as equivalent to a whole day in that case why is not the whole period annulled said Reshalakish our Eliezer's reason is as follows scripture says and this is the law of the Nazi right on the day when the days of his consecration are fulfilled thus the Torah expressly declares that if he contracts ritual defilement on the day of fulfillment the law for a Nazi right vow of unspecified duration is to be applied to him may we say that the difference between our Matina and Barpada is the same as that between the following ten aim for it was taught from the verse until the days be fulfilled I can only infer that the vow must continue in force at least two days and so the text adds he shall be holy he shall let the locks grow long and hair does not grow long in less than thirty days this is the view of our Josiah our Jonathan. However said that this reasoning is unnecessary for we have the text until the days be fulfilled what days then are those which have to be fulfilled you must say the 30 days of the lunar month may we assume that our Matina agrees with our Josiah and Barpada with our Jonathan our Matina can maintain that both authorities agree that 30 days is the necessary period and the point at issue between them is whether the word until preceding a number signifies the inclusion or exclusion of the last unit of that number our Josiah is of the opinion that in the term until the last unit is not included whereas our Jonathan is of the opinion that by the use of until the last unit is included the master stated what days then are those which have to be fulfilled you must say the 30 days of a lunar month but could it not be a week in the case of a week what deficiency is there to make up Talmud, Mas Nazir could it then not be a year are these reckoned in days surely the Rabbis of Caesarea have said how do we know that a year is not reckoned in days because scripture says months of the year this signifies that months are counted towards years but not days Mishnah if he says I intend to be a Nazi right for one long period or I intend to be a Nazi right for one short period then even if he adds for as long as it takes to go from here to the end of the earth he becomes a Nazi right for 30 days tomorrow why is this so has he not said from here to the end of it? Earth his meaning is for me this business is as lengthy as if it would last from here to the end of the earth we have learned if a man says I wish to be a Nazi right as from here to such and such a place we estimate the number of days journey from here to the place mentioned and if this is less than 30 days he becomes a Nazi right for 30 days otherwise he becomes a Nazi right for that number of days now why should you not say in this case also that his meaning is for me this business? Seems as if it would last from here to the place mentioned Rob replied we assume that when he made the declaration he was setting out on the journey then why should he not observe a Nazi right ship of 30 days for each parasang our papa said we speak of a place where they do not reckon distances in parasangs then let him observe a Nazi right ship for every stage on the road for have we not learned that a man who says I intend to be a Nazi right as the dust of the earth or as the hair of my head or as the sands of the sea becomes a life Nazirite pulling every 30 days this principle does not apply to a Nazi right vow in which a definite term is mentioned and this has indeed been taught explicitly a man who says I intend to be a Nazi right all the days of my life or I intend to be a life Nazirite becomes a life Nazirite but even if he says a hundred years or a thousand years he does not become a life Nazirite but a Nazi right for life Rabbi said hairs are different. From parasangs or stages since each is separate from the others in the case of days do we not find the verse and there was evening and there was morning one day there it is not because days are discrete entities that the verse says one day but to inform us that a day with the night preceding it together count as a day though they are really not discrete entities Rabbi said why raise all these difficulties the case in which he says from here to the end of the earth is different because he has already said I intend to be a Nazi right for one single period Mishnah if a man says I intend to be a Nazi right plus one day or I intend to be a Nazi right plus an hour or I intend to be a Nazi right once and a half he becomes a Nazi right for two periods tomorrow what need is there for the Mishnah to specify all these cases they are all necessary for had it mentioned only I intend to be a Nazi right plus one day it might have been thought that here only do we apply the rule that there is no Nazi right ship for a single day and so he must reckon two periods whereas when he says I intend to be a Nazi right plus an hour he is to reckon 31 days so this case is mentioned explicitly Talmud, Mas Nazir B. Again if it had simply added
Nazirite as the hairs of my head or the dust of the earth or the sands of the sea he becomes a life Nazirite pulling every 30 days Rabbi said that such a man does not pull every 30 days the man who pulls every 30 days is the one who says I undertake Nazirite ships as the hair on my head or the dust of the earth or the sands of the sea if he says I intend to be a Nazirite as the capacity of this house or as the capacity of this basket we interrogate him if he says that he has vowed one long period of Nazirite he becomes a Nazirite for 30 days but if he says that he has vowed without attaching any precise meaning to his statement we regard the basket as though it were full of mustard seed and he becomes a Nazirite for the whole of his life if he says I intend to be a Nazirite as from here to such and such a place we estimate the number of days journey from here to the place mentioned if this is less than 30 days he becomes a Nazirite for 30 days Otherwise he becomes a Nazirite for that number of days if he says I intend to be a Nazirite as the number of days in a solar year he must count as many Nazirite ships as there are days in the solar year our Judah said such a case once occurred and when the man had completed his periods he died tomorrow we regard the basket as though it were filled with mustard seed and he becomes a Nazirite for the whole of his life but why mustard seed surely we could regard it as though it were full of cucumbers or gourds and so provide him with a remedy as he said this is a matter on which opinions differ the author of our mission being our Simeon who has affirmed that people do undertake obligations in which the use of an ambiguous formula results in greater stringency than the use of a precise one for it has been taught if a man has said I intend to be a Nazirite provided this heap of grain contains a hundred core and on going to it he finds that it has been stolen or lost our Simeon declares him bound to his vow since whenever in doubt as to a Nazarite's liabilities we adopt the more stringent ruling our Judah however releases him since whenever in doubt as to a Nazarite's liabilities we adopt the more lenient ruling our Yohanan said it is even possible that the author of the Mishnah is our Judah for in the case just mentioned the man has possibly not entered into a Nazarite ship at all if there were not 100 core in the heap whereas in this case mentioned in the Mishnah he does at any rate enter into a Nazarite ship on what grounds can he be released from it but why not regard the basket as though it were full of cucumbers and gourds and so provide him with a remedy such an idea ought not to cross your mind for he has undertaken one unbroken Nazarite ship Talmud Mas Nazir B. Our Judah agreeing with Rabbi as we have learned Rabbi said that such a man does not pull every 30 days the man who pulls every 30 days is the one who says I undertake Nazirite ships as the hair of my head or the dust of the earth or the sands of the sea is it then a fact that our Judah agrees with Rabbi have we not learned if he says I intend to be a Nazirite as the number of days in a solar year he must count as many Nazirite ships as there are days in the solar year our Judah said such a case once occurred and when the man had completed his periods he died now if you say that this man by using this formula undertook consecutive Nazirite ships we can understand why our Judah says that when he finished he died but if you say that he undertook a single Nazirite ship could it ever be said of such a man that he had completed moreover could our Judah possibly agree with Rabbi seeing that it has been taught our Judah said if a man says I intend to be a Nazirite as the number of heaps of the fig crop or the number of ears in the field in the sabbatical year he must count Nazirite ships as the number of heaps of the fig crop or the number of ears in the field in the sabbatical year where he explicitly mentions the word number it is different but does rabbi make a distinction where the word number is used has it not been taught if a man says i intend to be a nazirite as the number of days in a solar year he must count as many nazirite ships as there are days in the solar year if he says as the days of a lunar year he must count as many nazirite ships as there are days in a lunar year rabbi said that this does not hold unless he says i undertake nazirite ships as the number of days in the solar year or as the number of days in the lunar year our Judah agrees with rabbi on one point and differs from him on the other he agrees with him on one point because that what is undertaken is a single nazirite ship but differs from him on the other for whilst our Judah distinguishes between the cases where the word number is mentioned and where it is omitted rabbi does not so distinguish our rabbis taught a man who says i wish to be a Nazirite all the days of my life where I wish to be a life Nazirite becomes a life Nazirite even if he says a hundred years or a thousand years he does not become a life Nazirite but a Nazirite for life our rabbis taught if a man says I wish to be a Nazirite plus one he must reckon two Nazirite ships if he adds and another he must reckon three and if he then adds and again he counts for surely this is obvious it might be thought that the words and again refer to the whole preceding number making six in all and so we are told that this is not so our rabbis taught when a man says I wish to be a Nazirite Simicos affirmed that by adding hand he must reckon one to two trigon three tetragon four pentagon five Nazirite ships our rabbis taught a house that is round or digon or trigon or pentagon does not contract defilement through the plague of leprosy one that is tetragon does what is the reason for scripture both in the latter part and in the earlier part of it Passage dealing with the leprosy of houses puts walls in the plural instead of wall in the singular thus making four walls in all Talmud, Mas Nazir A-C-H-A-P-T-E-R-2 Mishnah if a man says I intend to be a Nazirite and abstain from dry figs and pressed figs Beth Shammai say that he becomes a Nazirite in the ordinary sense but Beth Hillel say that he does not become a Nazirite our Judah said even though Beth Shammai did affirm that the formula is of some effect they meant only where he said they are forbidden to me as is a sacrifice Gemara if a man says I intend to be a Nazirite and abstain from dry figs and pressed figs Beth Shammai say that he becomes a Nazirite but why does not the divine law say nothing that is made of the great vine Beth Shammai adopt the view of our mayor who said that a man does not make a declaration without meaning something whilst Beth Hillel adopt the view of our Jose that a man's intentions are to be gathered from the concluding portion of his statement equally with the first portion and in consequence the value carries with it its annulment but surely Beth Shammai also agree that the value carries with it its annulment we must therefore say that Beth Shammai adopt the view of our mayor who said that a man does not make a declaration without meaning something and so immediately he utters the words I intend to be a Nazirite he becomes a Nazirite and in adding and abstain from dry fix and press fixes purpose is to obtain release from his vow and Beth Shammai reject this in accordance with their general principle that there can be no release from vows made for sacred purposes and since there can be no release from vows made for sacred purposes there can be no release from Nazirite ship Beth Hillel on the other hand agree with our Simeon as we have learned our Simeon declared him free of obligation since his offering was not undertaken in the customary manner Talmud Mas Nazir B.R. Mishnah is not in agreement with the following tenet for it has been taught our Nathan said that Beth Shammai declare him both to have vowed to abstain from fix and to have become a Nazirite whilst Beth Hillel declare him to have vowed to abstain from fix but not to have become a Nazirite here Beth Shammai agree with our Meir and our Judah and Beth Hillel with our Jose according to another report our Nathan said that Beth Shammai declare him to have vowed to abstain from fix but not to have become a Nazirite whilst Beth Hillel declare him neither to have vowed nor to have become a Nazirite here Beth Shammai agree with our Judah and Beth Hillel with our Simeon we have learned elsewhere a man who says I undertake to bring a meal offering of barley flour must nevertheless bring one of wheat and flour if he says of course meal he must nevertheless bring fine meal if without oil and frankincense he must nevertheless add oil and frankincense of half a tenth he must offer a whole tenth of a tenth and a half he must offer two tenths our Simeon declared him free of obligation since his offering was not undertaken in the customary manner who is the tenna who asserts that if anyone undertakes to bring a meal offering of barley flour he must bring one of wheat and flour Hezeki replied the matter is a subject of controversy the tenna here representing Beth Shammai for have not Beth Shammai averred that when a man says I intend to be a Nazirite and abstain from dry fix and press fix he becomes a Nazirite so too if he says of barley flour he must bring one of wheat and flour are on the other hand replied that it is possible to maintain that the passage quoted represents the views of both Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel and that it refers to a man who says had I known that such vows are not made I should not have vowed in this wise but in the correct manner Hezekiah said the rule just laid down applies only where he said of barley but if he says of lentils he need bring
Otherwise, even there we are told that he must bring one of wheat and flour Mishnah. If he says this heifer is saying I shall become a Nazi right if I rise, or the store is saying I shall become a Nazi right if I open Bet I say that he becomes a Nazi right, but Beth Hillel say that he does not become a Nazi right. Arjuna said, even though Bet I did affirm that the formula was of some effect, it was only where he says this heifer shall be forbidden to me as is a sacrifice if it should stand. Up of itself, Gemara, is it possible for a heifer to talk? Rami Biham replied, the Mishnah here refers to where a heifer lay crouching before him, and he said this heifer thinks that it is not going to stand up. I intend to be a Nazi right and abstain from its flesh if it stands up of its own accord, and it then arose of its own accord. Bet now apply their customary view, and Beth Hillel their customary view. Bet who affirmed that in spite of his saying from dry fix and pressed. Fix he becomes a Nazi right assert here that even when he says from its flesh he becomes a Nazi right whilst Beth Hillel declare that he does not become a Nazi right but have not Beth Shammai asserted this once already Rob replied a second and a third time did they repeat it Arhaya too taught it a second and a third time and so did Arashaya teach it a second and a third time and they are all necessary statements for if the rule had been stated merely in the case of dry fix and pressed figs. It might have been argued that Beth Shammai were of the opinion there that his words take effect and he becomes a Nazi right because figs and grapes can be confused whereas flesh and grapes cannot be confused similarly had it been affirmed regarding flesh it might have been argued that Beth Shammai were of the opinion in this instance that he becomes a Nazi right because flesh and wine are naturally associated but it would not apply to dry fix and pressed fix and so this case also is. Given explicitly again had it been affirmed in these two cases only it might have been argued that only in these cases was Beth Shammai's assertion to be applied whilst as concerns the door they would defer to Beth Hillel further had only the door been referred to it might have been argued that only in this case do Beth Hillel dissent but in the other two they defer to Beth Shammai and so we are told that this is not so nevertheless said Rabbah does the mission say if the cow rises of its own accord but said Rabbah we must explain thus the heifer for example is recumbent before him and he says I undertake to bring it as a sacrifice this is all very well as regards the heifer which can be offered as a sacrifice but can a door be sacrificed Rabbah therefore corrected himself and said the heifer for example is recumbent before him Talmud, Mas Nazir B and he says I undertake a Nazarite vow to abstain from wine if it does not stand up and it then stood up of its own accord in Beth. Shammai's opinion the substance of this man's ballet and his intention to cause the heifer to rise by force and this he did not do whereas Beth Hillel are of the opinion that the vow was made because the heifer was recumbent and it has risen if this is the meaning of the mission how is the subsequent clause to be understood Bizar Judah said even though Beth Shammai did affirm that the formula was of some effect it was only where he says and shall be forbidden to me as a sacrifice etc. Does his vow then attach to the heifer at all it must be therefore that he said for example I undertake a Nazi right vow to abstain from its flesh if it should not stand up and it then stands up of its own accord in Beth Shammai's opinion the substance of this man's vow is his intention to cause the heifer to rise by force and this he has not done whereas according to Beth Hillel the substance of his vow lies in the fact that the heifer was recumbent and it has risen but our Beth. Hillel of the opinion that if the heifer does not stand up the man becomes a Nazi right have they not said that by a vow to abstain from flesh he does not become a Nazi right they were arguing on the premises of Beth Shammai in our opinion he does not become a Nazi right even if the heifer should not stand up but you who say that he does become a Nazi right should at least admit that the substance of his vow lay in the fact that the heifer was recumbent and it has since risen Beth Shammai. Reply that this is not so and the substance of the man's vow lay in his intention to cause the heifer to rise by force and this he has not done Talmud, Mas Nazir Mishnah if a cup of wine duly tempered is offered to a man and he says I intend to be a Nazi right in regard to it he becomes a Nazi right on one occasion a cup of wine was offered to a woman already intoxicated and she said I intend to be a Nazi right in regard to it the sages ruled that all that she meant was to forbid it to herself. As a sacrifice, I ask forbidden Gemara, you cite a case to disprove the rule. You begin by saying that he becomes a Nazi right, and then quote the case of the woman who does not become a Nazi right, from which I should conclude that by means of this formula he forbids to himself only this cup that is offered to him, but is allowed to drink other wine. There is a hiatus in the Mishnah which should read if a cup of wine duly tempered is offered to a man, and he says, I undertake a Nazi right vow to abstain from it, he becomes a Nazi right. If however he was already intoxicated when he said, I intend to be a Nazi right, and abstain from it does not become a Nazi right, since he is accounted as having nearly forbidden it to himself as a sacrifice is forbidden. If you should object that he ought to have said so unambiguously, the reply is that he thought they would bring a fresh one and importune him, and so he thought I will say something to them which will leave them in no doubt as to my Intention on one occasion to a woman already intoxicated etc. Mission if a man says I declare myself a Nazi right on condition that I can drink wine or can have contact with the dead he becomes a Nazi right and all these things are forbidden him if he says I was aware that there is such a thing as Nazi right but I was not aware that a Nazi right is forbidden to drink wine he is bound to his vow Arsimian however releases him if he says I was aware that a Nazi right is forbidden to drink wine but I imagine that the sages would give me permission since I cannot do without wine or since I am a sexton he is released Arsimian however binds him to his vow tomorrow why does Arsimian not descend from the first ruling also our Joshua believe I said Arsimian did in fact descend from the first ruling also Rubin said in the opening clause Arsimian does not descend because the condition there attached to the vow is contrary to an injunction of the Torah and whenever a condition is Contrary to an injunction of the Torah, it is void. Our Joshua Levi, on the other hand, considered that the words on condition here are equivalent to accepted has been taught in support of Rabbanah's view. If he said, I declare myself a Nazi right on condition that I may drink wine or have contact with the dead, he becomes a Nazi right, and all these things are forbidden to him since the condition he lays down is contrary to an injunction of the Torah, and whenever a condition is contrary to an injunction of the Torah, he is void. If he says, I was aware that a Nazi right is forbidden to drink wine, etc., in the preceding clause, we find it is the rabbis who bind him to his vow, and Arsimian who releases him, and why is it not the same here? Here too, it should read the rabbis bind him whilst Arsimian releases. Alternatively, you need not reverse the text Talmud, Mas Nazir B, and we may explain thus in the first clause where he makes a Nazi right vow to abstain from one thing only according to the Rabbis who hold that the Nazi right vow takes effect even though he forswears one thing only he becomes a Nazi right and the things forbidden to a Nazi right are forbidden to him whereas according to our Simeon who holds that the Nazi right vow does not take effect until he forswears all of them all the things forbidden to a Nazi right are permitted to him in the subsequent clause where he forswears all and desires release as regards one thing according to the rabbis who declare him to be a Nazi right even though he forswears one thing only if he desires release as regards one only he is released from all according to our Simeon who requires him to forswear them all he cannot obtain release from one until he obtains release from all this is the reason we have the reading in the second clause our Simeon binds him yet another solution is possible the controversy concerns vows broken under pressure and the difference between our Simeon and the rabbis is the same as that between Samuel and R.C. in the following passage for we have learned four types of vows were remitted by the sages incentive vows vows of exaggeration inadvertent vows and vows broken under pressure and commenting thereon Arjuna said R.C. ruled that it was necessary with these four types of vow to seek remission from a sage when I told this to Samuel he said to me the Tana says that the sages have remitted them and you say that they must still be asked to remit them the rabbis agree with Samuel R.C. and with R.C. Mishnah should a man say I declare myself a Nazi right and I undertake to pull a Nazi right and should his companion hearing the say I too and I undertake to pull a Nazi right then if they are clever they will pull each other otherwise they must pull other Nazi rights Gemara the question was propounded if his companion on hearing his vow says simply I too what are the consequences does the remark I too embrace the whole of the original statement
Subsequent one then they are repeated in the subsequent one unnecessarily it is true because they are included in the first one where it is important but if you maintain that it is of importance neither in the first mission nor in the subsequent one would it be included unnecessarily in both our Isaac B. Joseph citing our Johan and said if a man instructs his representative Talmud, Mas Nazir to go and betroth for him a wife without specifying any woman he becomes in the meanwhile forbidden. To marry any woman in the world since it is presumed that the messenger carries out his commission and since he did not specify the woman he does not know which he betrothed for him Rush Lakish raised an objection against our Yohanan from the following if a dove of an indeterminate pair should fly away into the air or amongst those sin offerings that have to be killed or if one of the pair should perish a partner is to be taken for the other one this implies that with a determinate pair. There is no remedy though all other pairs in the world would be valid now why should this be so should we not say of each one perhaps this is one that flew away he replied I spoke of a woman who is stationary and you raise objections from prohibited things that are mobile should you argue further that here too the woman may be mobile for it is possible that he may have met her in the street and betrothed her the cases are still different for the woman returns to her customary place but can the same be said of the bird beer Rabbah said are Yohanan would admit that a woman who has among her unmarried relatives neither daughter daughter's daughter nor son's daughter neither mother nor maternal grandmother nor sister although she may have a sister who was divorced after the representative was sent such a woman would be permitted to him because at the time that he gave his instructions the sister was still married and when a person appoints a deputy it is to perform something. That is possible at the time but for something that is not possible at the time he does not appoint a deputy we have iron should a man say declare myself a Nazi right and I undertake to pull a Nazi right and should his companion hearing the say I too and I undertake to pull a Nazi right then if they are clever they will pull each other otherwise they must pull other Nazi rights now the suggestion is all very well as regards the latter since the former had become a Nazi right first but as to the former was the latter a Nazi right when he made his vow Talmud, Mas Nazir B it follows therefore that he must have meant if I should find one who is a Nazi right I shall pull him and so here too perhaps he means if you find one who is divorced you can betroth her on my behalf we may put our maxim thus a person can appoint a deputy only for a commission that he himself can execute at the moment but he cannot appoint him for a commission that he himself cannot execute at the moment but can only do later but is that so come and here if a man says to his agent you are to declare void any vows that my wife makes from the present moment until the time I return from such and such a place and he does so it might be imagined that they become void but scripture says her husband may let it stand or her husband may make it void this is the opinion of our Josiah our Jonathan said in all circumstances do we find that a man's representative is equivalent to himself now our Josiah's reason derives from the statement of the divine law her husband may let it stand or her husband may make it void and but for this the agent would be able to declare them void whereas where the husband himself is concerned it has been taught should a man say to his wife all the vows that you may make from the present moment until I return from such and such a place are to stand this is of no effect should he say they are to be void our Eliza declares them void but the sages say that they are not Void now assuming that our Josiah agrees with the rabbis that he himself could not make them void we nevertheless find that had not the divine law said her husband may let it stand or her husband may make it void the agent could have declared them void it is possible that he agrees with our Eliza that the husband can make them void in advance if that is so why does he trouble to appoint a deputy why does he not declare them void himself he fears that at the moment of departure he might forget or be angry or be too busy mission should a man say I undertake the polling of half a Nazi right and his companion hearing the say I too I undertake the polling of half a Nazi right then according to our mayor each must pull a Nazi right completely but the sages say each pulls half a Nazi right Gamara Rabbis said all agree that if he says I undertake half the sacrifices of a Nazi right he is obliged to bring only half the sacrifices if he says I undertake the sacrifices of half a Nazi right he must Bring a complete set of sacrifices since partial Nazi rightship is impossible where they differ is when the phraseology of the mission is used our mayor considers that as soon as he says I undertake to pull he becomes liable to the complete sacrifice of Nazi rightship and when he afterwards specifies half a Nazi rightship it is no longer within his power to limit his obligation the rabbis on the other hand look upon it as a vow accompanied by its own modification mission should a man say undertake to become a Nazi right when I shall have a son and a son be born to him he becomes a Nazi right if the child born be a daughter or sexless or an hermaphrodite he does not become a Nazi right should he say when I shall have a child then even if it be a daughter or sexless or an hermaphrodite he becomes a Nazi right Talmud Mas Nazir should his wife miscarry he does not become a Nazi right our Simeon said in this case he must say if it was a viable child I am a Nazi right obligatorily otherwise I undertake a Nazarite ship voluntarily should his wife later bear a child he then becomes a Nazi right our Simeon said he should say if the first was a viable child the first Nazarite ship was obligatory and the present one will be voluntary otherwise the first one will have been voluntary and the present one is obligatory Gamara for what purpose are we told this because of the subsequent clause is if it be a daughter or sexless or an hermaphrodite he does not become a Nazi right but is not this obvious it might be thought that his meaning was if I beget a child and so we are told that this is not so should he say when I shall have a child etc but is not this obvious it might be thought that he only meant the child that is reckoned amongst men and so we are told that any child is meant should his wife miscarry he does not become a Nazi right the author of the statement is the Arjuna of the heap of grain our Simeon said he should say if the child was viable then I am a Nazi right Obligatorily otherwise I undertake Nazarite ship voluntarily our Abba put the following question to our Hunashid a man say I undertake to become a Nazi right when I shall have a son and his wife miscarries and he set aside a sacrifice and then his wife gave birth to a son what is the law from whose standpoint was this problem propounded if from the standpoint of our Simeon what problem is there does not our Simeon say that wherever there is a doubt in questions concerning Nazi right ship we adopt it. More stringent ruling it must therefore be from the standpoint of our Judah who maintains that in questions concerning Nazarite ship if there is a doubt the more lenient ruling is adopted the query then is whether the animal became sacred or not but what practical difference can it make which it is there would be the question of whether he might cheer it or work with it the problem was unsolved Ben Rehumi put the following question to Abba should a man say I undertake to become a Nazi right when I shall have a son and his companion hearing this ad and I undertake likewise what would be the law is the reference to his words or to him himself should your finding be that the reference is to him himself then if a man should say I undertake to become a Nazi right when I shall have a son and his companion hearing this ad I too what would be the law is the reference to himself I or does he mean I am as much your good friend as you or yourself should your finding be that whenever the other is present Talmud, Mas Nazir B he would be ashamed to refer to himself then if a man should say I undertake to be a Nazi right when so and so has a son and his companion hearing this ad I too what would be the law would it be said then that because the other is not present he is referring to himself or does he mean I am as good a friend to him as you or the problem was left unsolved mission if a man says I intend to be a Nazi right now and a Nazi right when I shall have a Son and begins to reckon his own Nazarite ship and then has a son born to him he is to complete his own Nazarite ship and then reckon the one on account of his son if he says I intend to be a Nazi right when I shall have a son and a Nazi right on my own account and he begins to reckon his own Nazarite ship and then has a son born to him he must interrupt his own Nazarite ship reckon the one on account of his son and then complete his own Gemara Rabba put the following question if he should say I wish to be a Nazi right after 20 days time and then for 100 days commencing now what would be the law seeing that these 100 days will not be complete in 20 are they to be an operative for the time being or seeing that there will remain sufficient time afterwards for the hair to grow long do they come into operation immediately why does Rabba not first raise the question of a second Nazi right ship of short duration it is a problem within a problem that he has raised Talmud, Mas Nazir suppose it is decided that with a short Nazi rightship since only 10 days remain these 10 days would certainly not be reckoned what are we to say of a Nazi rightship of 100 days seeing that 80 remain would these 80 
as well, but Reshlakish said it is not void. Aryohan said that it becomes void because the whole is one long period of Nazi rightship, but Reshlakish said that it is not void since its own Nazi rightship and the one on account of his son are distinct Talmud. Mas Nazir B. If he contracts ritual defilement during the period that he is leprous, Aryohan said this renders void the earlier period of Nazi rightship, but Reshlakish said it is not void. Aryohan said that it becomes void since he is in the midst of his period of Nazi rightship, but Reshlakish said that it is not void because the period of leprosy and the Nazi rightship are distinct, and it is necessary to have both these controversies on record. For if only the first were recorded, we might say that there Aryohan was of the opinion that the first period becomes void because the same term Nazi rightship applies to both, whereas in the other he would agree with Reshlakish that the Nazi right period and the leprosy are distinct. Similarly, had only the other regarding leprosy been recorded, we might suppose that only there did Reshlakish hold the two periods to be distinct. Whereas in the first, he would agree with Aryohan, and thus the necessity for recording both controversies is demonstrated if he becomes unclean on a day during the period that his hair is growing. Rav said this does not render void the earlier period. This even according to Aryohan, who said above that the earlier period does become void. For this is only so when the uncleanness is incurred during the Nazi rightship itself, but not during the period his hair is growing, which is merely the complement of the Nazi rightship. Samuel, on the other hand, said it does render void the earlier period, and this even according to Reshlakish, who said above that the earlier period does not become void. For whereas there there are two distinct Nazi rightships here, there is but one Nazi rightship. Arhista said all would agree that should his hair be. Still unshorn when the blood of his sacrifice had been sprinkled, he would have no remedy with whose opinion does the statement accord. It cannot be with that of our Eliezer, foreseeing that in his opinion polling stops him from drinking wine. The uncleanness is still prior to the fulfillment of his consecration, and the whole period should become void, nor can it accord with the rabbis, seeing that they say that the polling does not stop him from drinking wine. In point of fact, it does. Accord with the opinion of the rabbis, the phrase he would have no remedy, meaning he would have no means of fulfilling the precept of polling in purity. Our Jose, son of Arhanan, is said a Nazi right whose period is completely scourged for contracting ritual defilement, but not for polling or for drinking wine. Why is he scourged for ritual defilement? Assuredly, because scripture says all the days that he consecrates himself unto the Lord, he shall not come near to a dead body, thus including it. Days after fulfillment equally with the days before fulfillment, but in that case for polling too he should be liable to scourging, seeing that the all-merciful law says all the days of his Nazi rightship there shall come no razor upon his head, thereby including the days after fulfillment equally with the days before fulfillment. Again, all the days of his Nazi rightship shall he eat nothing that is made of the grapevine should also include the days after fulfillment equally with the days before fulfillment. Talmud, Mas Nazir, a defilement is different for the all-merciful law says and he defiled his consecrated head, showing that the penalty for defilement lies wherever the Nazi rightship depends on the head. An objection was raised. A Nazi right who has completed his period is forbidden to pull or drink wine or have contact with the dead. Should he pull or drink wine or have contact with the dead, he is to receive the forty stripes. This is a refutation of our Jose, son of our Hanan, a mission issued a man. Say I undertake to become a Nazi right when I shall have a son and to be a Nazi right for 100 days on my own account and a son be born to him before the expiration of 70 days he loses none of this period but if after 70 days these 70 days are void since there can be no polling for less than 30 days Imara Rav said the 70th day itself is reckoned as part of both periods we learned if a son be born to him before the expiration of 70 days he loses none of this period now if you assume that the day of birth is reckoned as part of both periods not only does he not lose but he actually profits strictly speaking there should have been no mention of the period before the 70th day but because it says in the subsequent clause of the mission that birth after the 70th day renders these 70 days void the period before the 70th day is mentioned in the first clause come then and hear the subsequent clause if it be born after the 70th day the 70 days are void the meaning of after is after the day after the 70th day you say then that a birth on the day after the 70th day itself would not render void the previous period but if this is so why should we be told that if the birth occurs before the 70th day none of the period is lost seeing that the same is true of a birth occurring on the day after the 70th day it is consequently to be inferred that after means the day after literally and thus the mission unquestionably contradicts Rab whose authority was Rab following in making this assertion shall we say it was Abbas all in connection with whom we have learned if a man bury his dead three days before a festival the enactment of seven days full mourning ceases to apply to him if eight days before the festival the enactment of thirty days half mourning ceases to apply and he may trim his hair on the eve of the festival should he however fail to trim his Hair on the eve of the festival he is not permitted to do so afterwards until the thirty days half-morning elapsed Talmud, Mas Nazir B. Abbasal said even if he should fail to trim his hair before the festival he is permitted to do so afterward s for just as the observance of three days before the festival causes the enactment of seven days full-morning to lapse so the observance of seven days full-morning before the festival causes the enactment of thirty days half-morning to lapse. Now Abbasal's reason is surely that the seventh day is reckoned as part both of the full-morning and of the half-morning possibly Abbasal only makes this avowal in connection with the periods of the seven days morning which are a rabbinic enactment whereas he would not do so in connection with Nazi rightship a scriptural enactment it must therefore be that Rab follows our Jose for it has been taught our Jose said that a woman on the way for Gunnarin issue on whose behalf the Paschal. Lem has been slaughtered and its blood sprinkled on the second day of her waiting and who later in the same day observes an issue may not eat of the Passover and does not have to prepare the second Passover now our Jose's reason is surely because in his opinion part of the day counts as a whole day so that she becomes unclean only from the moment of observing the issue and thereafter is this indeed our Jose's opinion has it not been taught our Jose said that a sufferer from Gonorrhoe who has observed unclean issue on two occasions and on whose behalf the Paschal Lem has been slaughtered and its blood sprinkled on the seventh day of his impurity and similarly a woman on the way for Gonorrhoe issue on whose behalf the Paschal Lem has been slaughtered and its blood sprinkled if they afterwards observe an unclean issue then even though they render unclean couch and seed retrospectively they are not obliged to offer the second Passover the uncleannesses Retrospective only by enactment of the rabbis, this is indeed evident. For if it were scriptural, on what grounds would they be exempt from the second Passover? No, in point of fact, it would be possible for the uncleanness to be retrospective in biblical law. Also, the concealed impurity of Gonorrhoe not being reckoned a ban to the offering of the Passover. Our Ashiya too is of the opinion that the retrospective incidence is rabbinic in origin. For it has been taught, Our Ashiya said that one who observes a Gonorrhoe issue on his seventh day renders void the preceding seven days. Our Yohanan said to him only that day itself becomes void. But consider what is Our Yohanan saying? If it renders void at all, it should render all seven days void. Otherwise, it should not render void even the same day. Read. Therefore, Our Yohanan said that it does not even render void the same day. Talmud, Mas Nazir, Ar Ashiya replied, You have on your side, Our Jose, who said that the uncleanness is incident. According to the scripture from the moment of observation and thereafter now was it not our Jose who said that the uncleanness was retrospective we see therefore that the retrospective incidents must in his opinion be rabbinic now seeing that our Jose is of the opinion that part of a day counts as a whole day how is it ever possible for there to be a certified female sufferer from Gonorrhoe to offer the prescribed sacrifice for if the issue is observed in the second half of the day then it first half of the day counts as a period of waiting it is possible either if she should have continual issue for three days or alternatively if she observes the issue on each of the three days shortly after sunset so that there is no part of the day that can be reckoned as a period of cleanness C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I mission if a man says I intend to be a Nazi right he pulls on the 31st day but should he pull on the 30th day his obligation is fulfilled if however he says I intend to be a Nazi right for 30 days and polls on the 30th day his obligation is not fulfilled if a man undertakes two Nazarite
The whole period our Lizer says only the seven days are void Talmud, Mas Nazir B. Our Lizer is of the opinion that any defilement contracted after the fulfillment of the period renders only seven days void if he says I intend to be a Nazi right for thirty days and contracts ritual defilement on the thirtieth day the whole period is void here our Lizer does not dissent because we assume that the man said whole days if he says I intend to be a Nazi right for a hundred days and contracts. Ritual defilement on the hundredth day he renders void the whole period our Lizer says only thirty days are void all this may be taken in two ways according as we follow Barpada or Armatina as explained above Mishnah if a man makes a Nazi right thou whilst in a graveyard and even if he remains there for thirty days these are not reckoned and he does not have to bring the sacrifice prescribed for ritual defilement if he leaves it and re-enters the period is reckoned and he must bring it. Sacrifice prescribed for defilement our Lizer said not if he re-enters on the same day for it says but the former days shall be void implying that there must be former days Gemara it has been stated if a man makes a Nazi right thou whilst in a graveyard and according to our Yohan and the Nazi right ship takes effect but according to Resh Lakish it does not take effect our Yohan says the Nazi right ship does take effect because he considers it merely to be suspended and in readiness so that whenever he becomes ritually clean it commences to operate whereas Resh Lakish holds that the Nazi right ship does not take effect if he repeats the vow later when he is clean it will commence to operate but not otherwise our Yohan raised an objection to Resh Lakish from the following if a man makes a Nazi right thou whilst in a graveyard and even if he remains there for thirty days these are not reckoned and he does not have to bring the sacrifice prescribed for ritual defilement this implies does. It not that it is only the sacrifice prescribed for ritual defilement that he does not have to bring but the vow does take effect he replied not so he does not come within the scope of the law either of ritual defilement or of the sacrifice an objection was again raised by him from the following if a man is ritually defiled and vows to become a Nazi right he is forbidden to pull or to drink wine or to touch a dead body should he pull or drink wine or touch a dead body he is to receive the 40 stripes if now you admit that the vow takes effect then we see why he receives the 40 stripes but if you say that it does not take effect why should he receive the 40 stripes Talmud, Mas Nazir we are dealing here with the case in which he left the graveyard and re-entered it a further objection was raised by him as follows the only difference between the person ritually defiled who makes a Nazi right vow and a ritually clean Nazi right who becomes unclean is that the Former reckons his seventh day of purification as part of his period of Nazi rightship, whereas the latter does not reckon his seventh day of purification as part of his new period. If now you assume that the vow of the unclean person does not take effect, how is the seventh day to be counted in his period? Marbi Arashi said both Aryohanan and Reshlakish agree that the vow does take effect. Where the difference is whether there is to be a penalty of stripes. Aryohanan is of the opinion that since the vow takes effect, he suffers the penalty of stripes. But Reshlakish is of the opinion that there is no penalty of stripes, although the vow does take effect. Aryohanan raised an objection to Reshlakish from the following: If a man makes a Nazi right vow whilst in a graveyard, and even if he should remain there for thirty days, these are not reckoned, and he does not have to bring the sacrifice prescribed for ritual defilement. This implies, does it not, that it is only? The sacrifice prescribed for ritual defilement that he does not have to bring but he does suffer stripes strictly speaking it should have stated that he does not receive stripes but since it was requisite in the subsequent clause to mention that where he leaves the graveyard and re-enters the period is reckoned and he must bring the sacrifice prescribed for defilement the initial clause to mentions that he need not bring the sacrifice prescribed for ritual defilement come and hear the only difference between a ritually defiled person who makes a Nazarite vow and a ritually clean Nazirite who becomes unclean is that the former reckons his seventh day of purification as part of his period of Nazirite ship whereas the latter does not reckon his seventh day as part of his period does not this imply that as regards stripes they are on a PAR he replied not so where they are on a PAR is as regards pulling you over then that the latter receives stripes but the former does not do so why is this not mentioned the Beritha is referring to that which is serviceable to him not to that which is to his detriment come and here whosoever was ritually defiled and vowed to be a Nazi right is forbidden to pull or to drink wine if he should pull or drink wine or come into contact with the human dead he is to receive the forty stripes this is on data refutation Rabbah inquired if a man vows to be a Nazi right whilst in a graveyard what is the law has he to be in the graveyard a certain time for him to be liable to stripes or not what are the circumstances if he was told not to make a Nazi right vow why should any length of stay be necessary what is the reason why no length of stay in the graveyard is necessary for the ritually clean Nazi right to be liable to stripes it is because he was forewarned and here too he was forewarned Talmud, Mas Nazir B we must suppose therefore that he entered the graveyard in a box or a chest or a portable turret and his fellow came and broke away the covering the question then arises whether the rule requiring a certain length of stay was only laid down with reference to defilement within the temple precincts but not outside or whether there is no distinction the problem was unsolved Arashi raised the following question if a man vows to become a Nazi right whilst in a graveyard is he required to pull or not is polling required only of a ritually clean Nazi right who has contracted ritual defilement because he has defiled his consecration and not of a ritually unclean person who makes a Nazi right vow or is there no difference between the two come and here if a man makes a Nazi right vow whilst in a graveyard then even if he remains there for 30 days these are not reckoned and he does not have to bring the sacrifice prescribed for ritual defilement this implies does it not that it is only the sacrifice prescribed for ritual defilement that need not be brought but that polling is Necessary that is not so the statement is made as a reason for something else the reason that he need not bring the sacrifice prescribed for ritual defilement is that polling is unnecessary come and here the only difference between a ritually defiled person who makes a Nazi right vow and a ritually clean Nazi right who contracts ritual defilement is that the former reckons his seventh day of purification as part of his period of Nazi rightship whereas the latter does not reckon his seventh day as part of his new period surely then as regards polling both are on the same footing nowhere both are on the same footing is as regards stripes in the case of polling you over that one poles and the other does not then why not mention this the seventh day is mentioned and includes all observances dependent upon it come and here I am only told here that the period of his ritual defilement is not reckoned in the days of his Nazi rightship how do we know that the same is true of it? Period of declared leprosy this can be derived from an analogy between the two just as after the period of ritual defilement he is required to pull and bring a sacrifice so after the period of declared leprosy he is required to pull and bring a sacrifice and so just as the period of ritual defilement is not reckoned the period of declared leprosy ought not to be reckoned not so for in the case of the period of defilement it may he because this renders void the former reckoning that it is not reckoned whereas the period of declared leprosy does not render void the former reckoning and therefore it should itself be reckoned I will put the argument differently seeing that a Nazi right in a graveyard whose hair is right for polling does not count the days spent in the graveyard as part of his Nazi rightship surely the period of declared leprosy when his hair is not right for polling should not be counted now surely polling as a result of his defilement is meant no the reference may be to Polling after observing the Nazi right vow in ritual purity this is indeed evident Talmud, Mas Nazir for if you assume that polling as a result of the defilement is intended does he not have to pull after the period of declared leprosy no this does not constitute proof for the references to the polling on account of the Nazi right ship come and hear the verse and he defile his consecrated head refers to a ritually clean Nazi right who contracts ritual defilement it enjoins on such a one to remove his hair and sacrifice bird offerings but by implication exempts one who vows to become a Nazi right at a graveside from removing his hair and sacrificing bird offerings for you might argue a fortiori if the ritually clean Nazi right who contracts ritual defilement must remove his hair and sacrifice bird offerings all the more must one who commenced his Nazi right ship whilst defiled remove his hair and sacrifice bird offerings therefore the text says expressly and he defile his Consecrated head implying that only the ritually clean Nazi right who contracts ritual defilement is required by scripture to remove his hair and s
recommences on the seventh day of purification thus the case contemplated could arise if he were to contract defilement on the seventh day of purification and then again on the seventh day after that nevertheless since there was no period when he could have brought his sacrifice he need offer one sacrifice only for both defilements according to rabbi however if he contracted ritual defilement on the seventh day and then again on the seventh day the whole is one long period of ritual defilement whilst if we suppose he contracts ritual defilement upon the eighth day and again upon the eighth day then there is a point of time on each occasion when he could bring his sacrifice what is rabbi's reason for his opinion the verse says first and make atonement for him that he sinned by reason of the dead and then and he shall hallow his head and what does our jose son of our judah say to this if this is its intention the text should read simply and he shall hallow his head Talmud, Mas Nazir be what is the purpose of the additional phrase that day since it cannot refer to the eighth day we may take it as referring to the seventh day and Rabbi he can say that the purpose of the phrase that day is to tell us that even if he should fail to bring his sacrifices the Nazirite ship commences now what compelled our Hista to ascribe the authorship of this dictum to our Jose son of our Judah why should he not have interpreted it as referring to where he became unclean on the eighth night and ascribed the authorship to Rabbi are we to understand from the fact that he does not ascribe the authorship to Rabbi that in his opinion the night before the day that his sacrifice is due is not regarded as belonging to the preceding period our Adabi I have replied one thing depends on the other if we hold that the night before the day his sacrifice is due is regarded as belonging to the preceding period then since he can offer his sacrifice only in the morning the Nazi rightship does not begin to operate until the morning whereas if the night before the day his sacrifice is due is not regarded as belonging to the preceding period the Nazi rightship after purification from defilement begins in the evening our rabbis taught if a Nazi right contracts defilement on the seventh day of purification and then he again contracts defilement on the seventh day following he is only required to offer one sacrifice if he contracts defilement on the eighth day and then once more on the eighth day following he is required to offer a sacrifice for each defilement he begins to reckon the new Nazi rightship immediately this is the opinion of our Eliezer but the sages say he is required to offer but one sacrifice for all the defilements so long as he has not yet offered his sin offering if he has brought his sin offering and then contracts defilement and again offers his sin offering and again contracts defilement he is required to furnish a full Sacrifice for each defilement if he has furnished his sin offering but not his guilt offering he nevertheless commences to reckon the new Nazi rightship our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan B. Baraka said just as his sin offering stops him from commencing to reckon the new Nazi rightship so does his guilt offering now all is in order according to our Eliezer for the verse says and he shall hallow his head that same day even though he may not yet have provided the sacrifices and likewise the rabbis. Explain that day implying even though he may not yet have provided the guilt offering but what does our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan B. Baraka make of the words that day he will reply his Nazi rightship commences that day even though he may not yet have provided the burnt offering and the rabbis they do not consider it necessary to have an excluding phrase for permission to dispense with the burnt offering since it is brought simply as a gift what is the rabbis reason for stating. That the guilt offering is no bar it has been taught what is the implication of the verse and he shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his Nazi rightship and shall bring a helam of the first year for a guilt offering since we find that all other guilt offerings mentioned in the Torah are a bar to atonement so long as they are not brought it might have been thought that this one is also a bar Talmud, Mas Nazir and so the text says and he shall consecrate and shall bring a guilt offering implying that even though he may not yet have brought the guilt offering he is to consecrate our Ishmael son of our Yohanan B. Baraka said and he shall consecrate and shall bring one does he consecrate after he has brought who is the tenor of the following teaching taught by the rabbis if a woman undertakes a Nazi right vow and contracts ritual defilement and then her husband declares her vow void she must bring the sin offering of a bird but not the burnt offering of a bird are. His store replied it is Arishmael how comes Arishmael to this ruling if he holds that the husband nullifies his wife's vow then she should not be required to bring the sign offering of a bird whilst if he holds that the husband only terminates the vow why should she not be required to bring the burnt offering of a bird as well actually he is of the opinion that a husband nullifies his wife's vow and he further agrees with our Eliezer HaKapper for it has been taught our Eliezer HaKapper. The Rabbi said why does the scripture say and make atonement for him for that he sinned by reason of the soul against what soul did he then sin it can only be because he denied himself wine if then this man who denied himself wine only is termed a sinner how much more so is this true of one who is ascetic in all things but the verse is referring to an unclean Nazi right whilst we are applying it even to a ritually clean Nazi right our Eliezer HaKapper is of the opinion that a ritually clean Nazi right is also a sinner and the reason that scripture teaches this lesson in connection with the defiled Nazi right is that he repeats his sin if he leaves it and re-enters the days are reckoned it is stated that they are reckoned does then the Nazi right ship begin to operate merely because he has left the graveyard Samuel said we are speaking of where he has left it been sprinkled the first and the second time and bathed but are we to infer that if he re-enters then only are they reckoned whilst if he does not re-enter they are not reckoned the argument is progressive not only do they count if he leaves but they count also if he re-enters immediately after purification our Kahana and RC asked Rabbi have you not explained the mission to us in this matter he replied I was under the impression that you did not require to be told Realizer said not if he does so on the same day for it says and the former days shall be void implying that there must be former days Ola said R. Eliezer was referring only to a ritually defiled person who makes a Nazi right vow but a ritually clean Nazi right who contracts ritual defilement makes his Nazi right ship void even on the first day Talmud, Mas Nazir Birab added our Eliezer's reason is that the text continues because his consecration was defiled i.e. because he undertook the Nazi right ship during defilement Abbe raised an objection from the following if a man says I wish to be a Nazi right for 100 days and contracts ritual defilement at the very beginning of them it might be held that this makes void the Nazi right ship but the text reads and the former days shall be void there must first be former days and here there are no former days if he contracts ritual defilement at the end of the hundred days it might be held that this makes void the Nazi right ship but the text reads and the former days shall be void implying that there are later days too and here there are no days to come if he contracts ritual defilement. On the 99th day it might be held that he should not make void the Nazi right ship but the text reads and the former days shall be void implying that there must be days to come and here there are both former days and days to come now it cannot be said that we are dealing with a ritually defiled person who makes a Nazi right now since the account begins I wish to be a Nazi right for a hundred days and he contracts defilement at the very beginning of them and yet it says that former days are necessary this indeed is a refutation of all our Papa asked Abbe regarding the days that are required is it sufficient if one has passed and the defilement occurs when the second begins or must two pass and the defilement occur when the third has begun Abbe had no information on the subject so Rab Papa went and asked Rabbi he replied the text reads they shall fall away both the word days and the plural form they shall fall away are needed for if the divine law had used the word Days and not the form they shall fall away it might have been held that it is sufficient if one day has passed and the second begun and so the divine law wrote they shall fall away and if it had used the form they shall fall away and not the plural days it might have been held that even one day is sufficient and so the divine law uses the word days mission if a man vows a Nazarite ship of long duration and completes it and then arrives in the land of Israel Beth Shammai say that he is a Nazi right for 30 days but Beth Hillel say that his Nazarite ship commences again as at first it is related that Queen Helena when her son went to war said if my son returns in peace from the war I shall be a Nazi right for seven years her son returned from the war and she observed a Nazarite ship for seven years at the end of the seven years she went up to the land of Israel and Beth Hillel ruled that she must be a Nazi right for a further seven years towards the end of the seven years she Contracted ritual defilement and so altogether she was a Nazi right for 21 years. Our Judah said she was only a Nazi right for 14 years. Gamar the first clause reads Beth Shammai say he is a Nazi right for 30 days, but Beth Hillel say that his Nazarite ship commences again as at first may
Taught in the same sense, Arjuna quoting our Eliezer said that the implication of the verse and this is the law of the Nazirite on the day when the days of his separation are fulfilled is the Torah says that if he contracts ritual defilement on the day of his fulfillment he is to be given the law of the Nazirite mission where two groups of witnesses give evidence concerning a man one saying that he vowed two Nazirite ships and the other that he vowed five Beth I say that the evidence is conflicting in total and no Nazirite heship operates at all but Beth Hillel say that five includes two so that he becomes a Nazirite for two periods Gemara the mission disagrees with the following tenet for it has been taught our Ishmael the son of our Yohanan B. Baraka said that Beth Shammai and Beth Hillel did not dispute that five included two where there are two groups of witnesses one saying five and one two where they differed was one of a single pair of witnesses one says five and the other Two Beth Shammai averring that this is conflicting evidence whilst Beth Hillel maintained that here also five includes two reps all are agreed that where the witnesses enumerate the evidence is conflicting Arhamah said to our Hista, what does this mean it cannot mean that one says it was five and not two and the other it was two and not five for they plainly contradict each other and if again it means that one says he vowed a first and a second time and the other a third fourth and fifth time Talmud, Mas Nazir B we may ask what need is there for the SE condominium to repeat the first two seeing that the second witness testifies to the more stringent ones then he certainly testifies to the first two that are less stringent in the West they maintain that where there is enumeration there is no conflicting of evidence C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-B mission should a man say I intend to be a Nazi right and his companion over here and add I too and the next repeat I too all become. Nazi rights if the first is released from his vow all are automatically released but if the last one is released he alone becomes free the others remaining bound by their vows if he says I intend to be a Nazi right and his companion overhears and adds let my mouth be as his mouth and my hair as his hair he also becomes a Nazi right if he says I intend to be a Nazi right and his wife overhears and adds I too he can declare her vow void but his own remains binding if a woman says I intend to be a Nazi right and her husband overhears and adds I too he cannot declare her vow void if he should say in conversation with his wife I intend to be a Nazi right what about you and she answer amen he can declare her vow void but his own remains binding but if she should say I intend to be a Nazi right what about you and he answer amen he cannot declare her vow void Gamar Resh Lakish was once seated in the presence of Arjuna the prince and discoursed as follows they become Nazi rights. By saying I too only if they all attach their vows within the interval of a breaking conversation and how much is the length of such an interval the time sufficient for a greeting and how much is this the time taken by a disciple to greet his master Arjuna said to him you do not allow a disciple any further opportunity Talmud, Mas Nazir the same principle is taught in the following passage if a man says I intend to be a Nazi right and his companion over here and delay long enough to make a breaking conversation and then add I too he himself is bound by his vow but his companion is free the length of a breaking conversation is the time taken by a disciple to greet his master may we say that the following passage corroborates Resh Lakish's statement for the mission says should a man say I intend to be a Nazi right and his companion over here and add I too and the next repeat I too all become Nazi rights and carries the series no further do you expect the tanda to string Together a list like a peddler crying his wares then why should he not mention I too once only and leave us to infer the rest he could very well have done so but because in the clause that follows he says if the first is released from his vow all are automatically released but if the last one is released he alone becomes free the others remaining bound by their vows thus using a phrasing which implies that there is a person or persons in between he mentions I too twice in the opening clause the question was propounded does each link up with his immediate predecessor or do they all link up with the utterance of the first the practical issue involved is whether the process can be continued indefinitely if each links up with his immediate predecessor then it would be possible to continue indefinitely but if they all link up with the first one the process could not continue for longer than the space of a breaking conversation what then is the law comment here should a man say I intend to be a Nazi right and his companion over here and add I too and the next repeat I too without going further and so we can infer that they all link up with the first for if it be the case that each links up with his immediate predecessor why should not the phrase I too be repeated many more times do you expect the tanda to string together a list like a peddler crying his wares then let him mention I too once and indicate all the rest in this matter since he continues if the first is released from his vow all are automatically released but if the last one is released he alone becomes free the others remaining bound by their vows thus using a phrasing which implies that there are persons in between he therefore mentions I too twice in the first clause come and here if the first is released from his vow all are released it follows that only on the release of the first are the others released but not on the release of an intermediate one and so we can infer that they all link up with the first one I can reply that actually each links up with his immediate predecessor and the reason why the first is mentioned is that the tanda desired to say that all are released and if he had stated this in connection with the intermediate one there would have remained the first one unreleased therefore he preferred to mention in this connection the first come and here if the last one is released he alone becomes free the others remaining bound by their vows now the reason for this is presumably because there are no others following him but if the second one who is followed by others were released these would also become free and so we can infer that each links up with his immediate predecessor in point of fact I can argue that they all link up with the first and that the expression the last as used by the tanda refers to those in between also but because he speaks in the preceding clause of the first he refers to the others as the last come and here the following passage where it is taught explicitly if the first is released they all become free if the last is released he alone becomes free the rest remaining bound if an intermediate one is released those following him also become free but those preceding him remain bound this shows conclusively that each links up with his immediate predecessor if he says I intend to be a Nazi right and his companion overhears and adds let my mouth be as his mouth and my hair as his hair he also becomes a Nazi right simply because he says let my mouth be as his mouth and my hair as his hair does he become a Nazi right Talmud, Mas Nazir B Talmud, Mas Nazir B does not this conflict with the following passage it has been taught that if a man says let my hand be a Nazi right or let my foot be a Nazi right his words are of no effect but if he says let my head be a Nazi right or let my liver be a Nazi right he becomes a Nazi right the rule is if the organ is one upon which life depends he becomes a Nazi right Rav Judah replied in the Mishnah he is presumed to say let my mouth be as his mouth as regards wine or my hair as his hair as regards shearing if a woman says I intend to be a Nazi right and her husband overhears and adds I too he cannot declare her vow void the question was propounded does the husband nullify or does he only terminate the vow the difference is of importance for deciding the case of a woman who vows to be a Nazi right and whose companion overhears and says I too and whose husband subsequently hears of the matter and declares her vow void if it be decided that he nullifies her vow her companion is also set free but if it be decided that he merely terminates the vow she herself will be released and her companion will remain bound to the vow what then is the law come and here if a woman says I intend to be a Nazi right and her husband overhears and adds I too he cannot declare her vow void now should you Suppose that the husband terminates the vow he ought to be able to declare his wife's vow void whilst remaining bound himself it surely follows therefore from the fact that he cannot do so that a husband nullifies his wife's vow not at all strictly speaking the husband in general only terminates the wife's vow and hereby rights he should be able to declare her vow void and the reason why he cannot do so is because his saying I too is equivalent to saying I confirm it for you and so if he later seeks to have the confirmation revoked he can then declare his wife's vow void but not otherwise come and here if a woman undertakes a Nazi right vow and sets aside the requisite animal for the sacrifice and her husband subsequently declares the vow void then if the animal was one of his own it can be put to pasture with the herd but if it was one of hers the sin offering is to be left to die etc now should you suppose that the husband nullifies the vow the animal should become profane it surely follows therefore that the husband merely terminates the vow in point of fact we can maintain that the husband nullifies the vow but the animal remains sacred for this reason since she no longer requires atonement the case is similar to that of a sin offering whose owner has died and it is a tradition that sin offerings whose owners have died are left to die come and here if a woman undertakes a Nazi right vow and then drinks wine or is defiled
One is a burnt offering. Now, if you suppose that the husband terminates the vow, she ought also to bring a bird as a burnt offering. What then would you have us think that the husband nullifies the vow? Then she ought not to bring a bird as a sin offering either. That is so here. However, we are being given the opinion of our Eliezer Hakapar, for it has been taught our Eliezer Hakapar Gurabai said it may be asked, Why does scripture say and make atonement for him for that he sinned by reason? Of the soul, for against what soul has he sinned? The reply is, however, that because he denied himself wine, he is called a sinner. If then this man who denied himself wine only is called a sinner, how much more so is this true of one who is a setic in all things come and hear the following where it is taught explicitly if a woman vows to be a Nazi right and her companion overhears and says I too, and then the husband of the first woman declares her vow void, she is released from her vow, but her companion remains bound from this. It follows that the husband terminates the vow. Our Simeon, however, says that where her companion says to her, I undertake the same obligation as you both become free Talmud, Mas Nazir be Talmud, Mas Nazir be Marzitra, the son of Rabmari said the same problem is raised here as was raised by Rami Bihama, for Rami Bihama wished to know the effect of saying, Let these vittles be as far as I am concerned as the flesh of this peace offering does a man in thus. Linking one thing with another refer to the original state of the subject of comparison or to its ultimate state but surely the two cases do not bear comparison for when he says in that case let these vittles as far as I am concerned be as the flesh of this peace offering the fact remains that even though once the blood is sprinkled this may be eaten outside the temple precincts yet it is still sacred in our case on the other hand if we suppose that she has the ultimate state in mind. Then the husband of the first woman has declared the vow void some consider that our problem and that of Rami Biham are undoubtedly identical if a woman says to her companion I intend to be a Nazi right in your wake what would the law be does in your wake mean I intend to follow in your wake in every respect so that she becomes free or does it refer to her companion's condition before her husband declared the Nazi right ship void so that she remains bound come and here if a woman does. To be a Nazi right and her husband overhears and adds I too he cannot declare her vow void now should you assume that when he says I intend to follow in your wake he has in mind the original situation why should he not be able to declare her vow void whilst allowing his own to remain does it not follow therefore that what he refers to is the situation with all its developments and so it is only when he himself is involved that he cannot declare the vow void but where another woman says I intend to follow in your wake she would also be free this is not the case in point of fact he may be referring to the original situation but in this case when he says I too it is as though he says I confirm it for you and so if he consults a wise man in order to have his ratification upset he will be able to declare her vow void but not otherwise if he should say in conversation with his wife I intend to be a Nazi right what about you and she answer amen he can declare her vow Void, but his own remains binding. The following passage seems to contradict the statement. If a man says to his wife, I intend to be a Nazi, right? What about you? If she answers, Amen, both become bound to their vows, but otherwise both are free because he made his vow contingent on hers. Rab Judah replied, You should amend the Beritha to read. He can declare her vow void, but his own remains binding. Abay said, It is even possible to leave the reading intact. The Beritha supposes him to say to her, I intend to be a Nazi, right? With you, thus making his vow contingent on her vow Talmud. Mas Nazir, whilst our mission supposes him to say to her, I intend to be a Nazi, right? What about you? And so he may declare her vow void, but his own remains binding. Mission If a woman undertakes a Nazi, right? Vow and then drinks wine or is defiled by a corpse, she is to receive 40 stripes. If her husband declares it void without her being aware of it, and she drinks wine or is defiled by a corpse, she does not. Receive the forty stripes, our Judah said, although it may be a fact that she does not receive the forty stripes, she should receive the stripes inflicted for disobedience. Imara, our rabbis taught in the verse, her husband hath made them void, and the Lord will forgive her. Scripture is speaking of a woman whose husband has declared her vow void without her knowledge, intimating that she requires atonement and forgiveness. When our Akiba reached this verse, he wept for if one who intended to take swine's flesh and by chance takes lamb's flesh stands in need of atonement and forgiveness. How much more so does one who intended to take swine's flesh and actually took it stand in need thereof? A similar inference may be made from the verse, though he knoweth not yet is he guilty and shall bear his iniquity if of one who intends to take lamb's flesh and by chance takes swine's flesh. For instance, in the case of one who ate a slice of fat concerning which it was uncertain whether it was. Of the permitted or the forbidden kind, the text says, and shall bear his iniquity. How much more so is this true of one who intended to take swine's flesh and actually took it? Isib Judah interpreted the verse, though he knoweth not yet is he guilty and shall bear his iniquity. As follows, if of one who intends to take lamb's flesh and takes swine's flesh, for instance, in the case of one who eats one of two slices of fat, one of which is forbidden fat, and the other permitted fat, the text says, and shall bear his iniquity. How much more so is this true of one who intended to take swine's flesh and actually took it? For this, let them grieve that are faint to grieve. But what need is there for all these cases? They are all necessary. For if we had only been told about the woman, we might have thought that atonement and forgiveness are necessary there, because from the very beginning her intention was to do that which is forbidden. Whereas with the slice concerning which it is uncertain. Whether it is forbidden or permitted fat where his intention was to do that which is permitted we might have thought that atonement and forgiveness are not necessary if on the other hand we had only been told about the latter we might have thought that it is because there is a definite prohibition involved whereas the woman whose husband has declared her vow void and whose act is consequently permitted should not require atonement and forgiveness again if we had only been told of these two cases we might have thought that in these two cases atonement and forgiveness suffice since the presence of something forbidden is not definite whereas with two slices of which one is forbidden and one permitted fat where the presence of something forbidden is definite atonement and forgiveness do not suffice we are therefore told that there is no difference Rabbi Barhana quoting our Yohanan said the verse for the ways of the Lord are right and the just do walk in them but transgressors do stumble therein may be illustrated by the following example two men roast their paschal lambs one eats it with the intention of fulfilling the precept and the other eats it with the intention of having an ordinary meal to the one who eats it to fulfill the precept applies and the just do walk in them but to the one who eats it to have an ordinary meal applies but transgressors do stumble therein Rashlakish remarked to him do you call such a man wicked granted that he has not fulfilled the precept in the best possible manner he has at least carried out the Passover right rather should it be illustrated by two men each of whom had his wife and his sister staying with him one chances upon his wife and the other chances upon his sister to the one who chances upon his wife applies and the just do walk in them and to the one who chances upon his sister applies but transgressors do stumble therein but are the cases comparable we speak in the verse of one path whereas herein the example given there are two paths rather is it illustrated by Lot when his two daughters were with him to these the daughters whose intention it was to do right applies the just do walk in them whereas to him Lot whose intention it was to commit the transgression applies but transgressors do stumble therein but perhaps it was his intention also to do right do not think this for a moment for our Yohanan has said the whole of the following verse indicates Lot's lustful character. And Lot lifted up his parallel by and his master's wife lifted up her eyes upon his eyes is parallel by for she hath found grace in my eyes and beheld his parallel by and Shechem the son of Hammer beheld her all the kicker plain of the Jordan by for on account of a harlot a man is brought to a kicker loaf of bread and fat it was well watered everywhere by I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water my wool and my flax my oil and my drink but Lot was a victim of Compulsion it had been taught on behalf of our Jose son of Arhoni that the dot over the letter Bob underscore and in the word Ubekamah and when she arose occurring in the story of the elder daughter is to signify that it was her lying down that he did not notice but he did notice when she arose but what could he have done since it was all over the difference is that he should not have drunk wine the next evening Rob expounded as follows what is the significance of the verse a brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city Talmud, Mas Nazir B and their contentions are like the bars of a castle a brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city refers to Lot who separated from Abraham and their contentions are like the bars of a castle for he gave rise to
Good as a precept performed for an ulterior motive as it is written, Blessed above women shall jail be the wife of Eber the Kenite above women in the tent shall she be blessed and by women in the tent Sarah Rebecca Rachel and Leah are meant are Yohanan said that wicked wretch Sarah had sevenfold intercourse with jail at that time as it says at her feet he sunk he fell he lay etc. But she derived pleasure from his intercourse are Yohanan said all the favors of the wicked are evil to thee. Righteous for it says take heed to thyself that thou speak not to Jacob either good or bad now that he was not to speak bad we can understand but why was he not to speak good thus it may properly be inferred that the good of such a one is an evil the above text states Rab Judah citing Rab said a man should always occupy himself with the Torah and its precepts even though it be for some ulterior motive for the result will be that he will eventually do them without ulterior motive for as reward for the forty two sacrifices which the wicked Balak offered he was privileged to be the progenitor of Ruth for our Jose son of Arhanan has said that Ruth was descended from Elon the grandson of Balak king of Moab our high Abba citing our Yohanan said how do we know that the holy one blessed be he does not withhold the reward even for a decorous expression the elder daughter of Lot called her son Moab and so the all merciful one said to Moses be not at enmity with Moab neither Content with them in battle only war was forbidden, but they might be harassed. The younger daughter on the other hand called her son's name Ben Ami, and so it says harass them not nor content with them. They were not to be harassed at all. Our high Bob and said our Joshua B. Korha said a man should always be as alert as possible to perform a precept for as reward for anticipating the younger by one night. The elder daughter of Lot Talmud, Mas Nazir, was privileged to appear in the genealogical record of the royal house of Israel four generations earlier. Mission if a woman makes a Nazi right vow and sets aside the requisite animal for the sacrifice, and her husband subsequently declares the vow void, then if the animal was one of his own, it can be put to pasture with the herd, but if it was one of hers, the sin offering I has to be left to die. The burnt offering is to be offered as an ordinary burnt offering, and the peace offering I has to be offered as an ordinary peace offering this last. However, may be eaten for one day only and requires no loaves if she has a lump sum of money set aside for the purchase of sacrifices. It is to be used for free will offerings if earmarked money. The price of the sin offering I has to be taken to the Dead Sea. The use of it is forbidden but involves no malappropriation for the sum set aside for the burnt offering. A burnt offering I has to be provided. The use of which involves malappropriation whilst for the sum set aside for the peace offering. A peace offering I has to be provided which may be eaten for one day only and requires no loaves. Gemara, who is the tenor of our Mishnah, who intimates that the husband is not liable for the wife's sacrifices, are his da said it is the rabbis for if you suppose it is our Judah, then since he is liable, why should the animals be sent to pasture with the herd for it has been taught our Judah says a man who can afford to do so must offer the rich man's sacrifice on his wife's behalf as well as all. Other sacrifices for which she may be liable for thus does he write to her in the marriage settlement because I shall pay every claim you may have against me from before up to now. Rabbi said it may even be our Judah the reply to Arhista's objection being that the husband is liable only for something which she needs but not for something which she does not need. Another version of the above discussion is as follows who is the tenor of our mission Arhista said it is our Judah the husband however. Being liable only for something that she needs but not for something that she does not need for if it were the rabbis do they not say that he is not liable for her sacrifices at all the only possible interpretation of the liability implicit in the mission would be that he transferred the animals to her but on transference it becomes her own property Talmud. Mas Nazir B. Rabbi said it may even be the rabbis for even when he transfers it to her his intention is to provide something which she needs but he does not transfer it to provide something she does not need if it was one of hers the sin offering I has to be left to die the burnt offering I has to be offered where did she get it from seeing that it has been affirmed that whatever a woman acquires becomes her husband's our papa replied she saved it out of her housekeeping money another possibility is that it was given to her by a third person with the proviso that her husband should have no control over it the burnt offering I has to be offered as an ordinary burnt offering and the peace offering I has to be offered etc Samuel said to Abab Bihi you are not to sit down until you explain to me the following dictum the four rams that do not require loaves as an adjunct of the sacrifice are the following is hers and those after death and after atonement he explained as follows hers is the one referred to in our mission as is referred to in the following mission for we learned a man is able to impose a Nazi right. Thou on his son, whereas a woman cannot impose a Nazi right, thou on her son. Consequently, if the lad pulls himself within the period of his Nazi rightship or is pulled by his relatives, or if he protests or his relatives protest on his behalf, then if a lump sum was set aside, it is to be used to provide free will offerings, and if earmarked money, the price of the sin offering is to be taken to the Dead Sea. The use of it is forbidden, but involves no malappropriation for the price of the burnt offering. A burnt offering is to be provided, and this can involve malappropriation, whilst for the price of the peace offering, a peace offering is to be provided, which may be eaten for one day only and requires no loaves. Whence do we know this of the one after death? For we have learned, should a man set aside money for his Nazi right offerings, the use of it is forbidden, but involves no malappropriation, since it may all be expended on the purchase of a peace offering if he should die, money's not. Earmarked are to be used for providing free will offerings whilst with regard to earmarked monies the price of the sin offering is to be taken to the Dead Sea the use of it is forbidden but involves no malappropriation for the price of the burnt offering a burnt offering is to be provided and this does involve malappropriation whilst for the price of the peace offering a peace offering is to be provided which may be eaten for one day only and requires no loaves that the one after atonement requires no loaves we learn by a process of reasoning for the reason that the one after death does not require loaves is because it is not eligible for the purposes of atonement but then neither is the one after atonement eligible for the purpose but are there no more one of the following passage that Levi taught all other peace offerings of a Nazi right not slaughtered in the prescribed manner are fit for the altar but they do not count as fulfillment of their owner's obligation they may However, be eaten for one day only and do not require loaves or the gift of the shoulder to the priest. The enumeration of Samuel includes animals offered in the prescribed manner, but omits those not offered in the prescribed manner. If he should die and have a lump sum of money, it is to be used for providing free will offerings. Talmud, Mas Nazir, but money for a sign offering is included in it. Or Yohanan said this is a traditional rule relating to the Nazi right. Rush said it. Torah says in the verse whether it be any of their vows or any of their free will offerings, this indicates that anything left over from money subscribed for vowed offerings is to be spent on free will offerings. Now, if we accept the view of Ar Yohanan who says that this ruling concerning the Nazi right is traditional, we can understand why it applies only to a lump sum of money and not to earmarked money. But on Rush view that it is derived from the verse whether it be any of their vows. Or any of their free will offerings, why should it apply only to money in a lump sum? Surely it should also apply to earmarked money's robber replied. You cannot maintain that the reference is also to specific monies for a tana of the school of Arishmael has already given a different decision as follows the verse only thy holy things which thou hast and thy vow speaks of the offspring and substitutes of sacred animals. What is to be done with them? Thou shalt take them and go unto the place. Which the Lord shall choose it might be thought from this that they are to be taken to the temple and kept without food and drink until they perish. But scripture continues, and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings the flesh and the blood as much as to say as you do with the burnt offering, so do with its substitute as you do with the peace offering, so do with its offspring and substitutes. It might further be thought that the same applies to the offspring and substitutes of a sin offering. And the substitute of a guilt offering, but the text states only precluding these. The above is the opinion of Arishmael. Our Akiva says that it is unnecessary to use this argument for the guilt offering, for it says it is a guilt offering which shows that it retains its status. The above passage states it might be thought that they are to be taken to the temple and kept without food and drink until they perish. But Scripture continues, and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, the blood and the flesh. But why should one think the seeing that only in regard to the sin offering is there a traditional teaching that it is left to perish? Were it not for the verse, it might have been thought that the offspring
What need is there of the verse since we have it as a traditional ruling that wherever an animal if intended as a sin offering is left to perish if intended as a guilt offering it is to pasture until a blemish appears that is so and the verse is only necessary for the case described by Rab for Arhuna citing Rab said if a guilt offering which had been relegated to pasture until a blemish appears was slaughtered as a burnt offering it is a fit and proper sacrifice this is true only if it was already relegated but not otherwise for the verse says it is a guilt offering implying that it retains its status the master said above this is a traditional ruling concerning the Nazi right are there than no other spheres in which it applies has it not been taught and all others required by the Torah to offer a nest of birds Talmud Mas Nazir who set aside money for this purpose and then desire to use it to provide an animal as sin offering or as burnt offering can do so should such a one die and leave a lump sum of money it is to be used to provide free will offerings he mentions the Nazi right meaning also to include those required to offer birds whose case is similar but excluding the following case for it has been taught if a man under an obligation to offer a sin offering says I undertake to provide a burnt offering and sets aside money saying this is for my obligation should he then desire to provide from it either a sin offering or a burnt offering he must not do so should he die and leave a lump sum of money it is to be taken to the Dead Sea or as he said in the statement that money's earmarked must not be used for free will offerings you should not presume the meaning to be that he said this portion is for my sin offering this for my burnt offering and this for my peace offering for even if he says simply all this is for my sin offering burnt offering and peace offering it counts as earmarked money others say that Arashi said do not presume that he must say all this is for my sin offering burnt offering and peace offering for even if he says all this is for my obligation it is regarded as earmarked money Rabbah said though we have said that a lump sum of money is to be used for free will offerings yet if the money for the sin offering becomes separated from the rest all is regarded as earmarked Talmud Mas Nazir B it has been taught in agreement with Rabbah if a Nazi right says this is for my sin offering and the remainder for the rest of my Nazi right obligations and then dies the money for the sign offering is to be cast into the Dead Sea and the rest is to be used half to provide a burnt offering and half a peace offering the law of malappropriation applies to the whole of it but not to any separate part of it if he says this is for my burnt offering and the remainder for the rest of my Nazi right obligations and then dies the money for the burnt offering is to be used for a burnt offering and it can suffer Malappropriation whilst the rest is to be used to provide free will offerings and can suffer malappropriation Rab Huna citing Rab said that our rule applies only to money but animals would be regarded as earmarked Arnaman added that the animals that would be regarded as earmarked would only be unblemished animals but not blemished ones three bars of silver on the other hand would be counted as earmarked Arnaman B Isaac however considered even bars of silver as unspecified but not three Piles of timber are Shimai B Ashi asked our Papa what is the reason for the distinctions made by these rabbis is it that they interpret money as meaning neither animals nor bars of silver nor piles of timber as the case may be for if so they should also say money but not birds should you reply that they do make this distinction too how comes our Hista to say that birds do not become earmarked except when earmarked by the owner at their purchase or by the priest at their preparation seeing that our tradition is that only money is regarded as unspecified Talmud, Mas Nazir he replied but on your own argument that all these are unspecified how are we to explain the following which we learned our Simeon B. Gamaliel said that if a Nazi right brings three animals and does not say explicitly what they are for the one which is fit to be a sin offering shall be offered as a sin offering the one fit to be a burnt offering shall be offered as a burnt offering and the one fit for a peace offering shall be offered as a peace offering now why should this be so do you not say that animals are not regarded as earmarked Arshai B. Ashi rejoined the explanation is this in our Hista's case the reason is because the Almerciful has said and she shall take two turtle doves the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering and also and the priest shall take the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering showing that they can be earmarked either one day. Owner takes them or when the priest offers them in our Simeon B. Gamaliel's case to Talmud, Mas Nazir B. Would it be possible to say that the one that should be the sin offering is to be the burnt offering seeing that one is female and the other male are ham not erased in objection do we really say that an animal which has a blemish is regarded as unspecified come then and hear the following what are the circumstances in which a man is permitted to pull at the expense of his fathers. Nazi right ship suppose his father had been a Nazi right and had set apart the money for his Nazi right sacrifices and died and the son then said I declare myself a Nazi right on condition that I may pull with my father's money then he may do so if he leaves unspecified monies they fall to the temple treasury to provide free will offerings if there were animals set apart the sin offering is left to die the burnt offering is to be offered as a burnt offering and the one for a peace offering is to be. Offered as a peace offering is not this the case even if the animal is blemished no only if it is without blemish but if a blemish one is unspecified why is money mentioned the text ought to read if he left a blemished animal it is to be used to provide free will offerings that is precisely what it means for a blemished animal is made sacred purely in respect of the price it will bring and this price is included in money robber raised an objection it has been taught the expression his offering signifies that he can discharge his obligation with his own offering but not with that of his father it might be thought that this means merely that an obligation with regard to a serious offense cannot be discharged with an offering set aside by his father for a less serious offense or vice versa whereas he could discharge an obligation entailed by a less serious offense with an offering set aside by his father for a similar offense or an obligation entailed by a more serious Offense with an offering set aside for a similar offense and scripture repeats the words his offering to show that he can discharge an obligation with his own offering but not with that of his father even in this instance again it might be supposed that the rule that he cannot discharge an obligation with his father's offering applies only if it is an animal set aside by his father albeit for an offense of a similar degree of gravity since there is a similar rule that a man cannot make use of his father's Nazi right animal for pulling in respect of his own Nazi rightship but that he could discharge his obligation with motley set aside by his father and even transfer it from a serious offense to one less serious or vice versa for a man can make use of his father's Nazi right money for pulling in respect of his own Nazi rightship Talmud, Mas Nazir always provided that it is a lump sum and not earmarked money and scripture repeats the expression his offering a third Time to show that he can discharge his obligation with his own offering but not with that of his father even in this instance it might be thought further that we can only lay down that he is unable to discharge an obligation with money set aside by his father albeit for an offense of equal gravity but that he could discharge his obligation with an offering he himself has set apart even transferring it from a less serious to a more serious offense or vice versa hence scripture uses the expression his offering for his sin to show that the offering must be for the particular sin it might be argued again that we can only lay down that he cannot discharge his obligation with an animal which he has set apart for himself whether for an equally serious offense or for an offense of a different degree of gravity since we know that if he sets aside an animal to make atonement for the offense of eating forbidden fat and by mistake sacrifices it for the offense of eating Blood or vice versa he has not been guilty of malappropriation and consequently has not procured atonement but we might think that he could discharge his obligation with money which he set aside for himself whatever be the degree of gravity of the offense since we know that if he set aside money for himself to make atonement for the offense of eating forbidden fat and used it by mistake for the offense of eating blood or vice versa he is guilty of malappropriation and consequently does procure atonement and so scripture says for his sin to show that the offering must be for the particular sin even in such circumstances now this passage refers simply to an animal surely this includes even a blemished one not at all one without blemish is meant but if a blemished animal is regarded as not earmarked why go on to speak of money set aside by his father when it could speak of an animal which has a blemish instead that is precisely what is meant for the only use of such an animal for sacrificial purposes is for the price it will bring and this price is money mission if one of the kinds of blood has been sprinkled on her behalf the husband can no longer annul the vow our Akiva says if even one of the animals has been slaughtered on her behalf he can no longer annul the vow the above is true only if she is pulling after observing the Nazarite ship in purity but if she is pulling after ritual defilement he
Were some other sacrifice when it would be permitted to eat the flesh, or has it not been taught if the lambs prepared for the festival of assembly were slaughtered as though they were a different sacrifice, or before or after the proper time the blood is to be sprinkled and the flesh can be eaten? Should the mistake occur on a Sabbath, the blood is not to be sprinkled, but if notwithstanding it is sprinkled, the sacrifice is acceptable, but the portions belonging to the altar must be roasted after dark. The reply is as if it were the burnt offering or the peace offering that had been slaughtered. This procedure could be followed, but the mission assumes that the sin offering was slaughtered first, as could in fact happen. For we have learned if the Nazirite polls after the sacrifice of any one of the three, his duty is performed. The above is true only if she is polling after observing the Nazirite in purity, but if she is polling after ritual defilement, he can. Still annul the vow because he can say I cannot tolerate an unseemly wife. Rabbi says that he can annul her vow even if she is polling after observing the Nazarite Heshep in purity since he can aver that he cannot tolerate a woman who is polled the first tanna does not allow this objection because she can wear a wig but Rabbi considers that the husband will not be satisfied with a wig because of the dirt it collects. Mishnah a man is able to impose a Nazarite vow on his son but a woman cannot impose a Nazarite vow on her son if the lad polls himself or is polled by his relatives or if he protests or his relatives protest on his behalf and if the father had set aside an animal for the sacrifice the sin offering I has left to die the burnt offering I has to be offered as an ordinary burnt offering and the peace offering I has to be offered as an ordinary peace offering this last however may be eaten for one day only and requires no loaves if he had unspecified monies they Fall to the temple treasury to provide free will offerings whilst with regard to earmarked monies the price of the sin offering is to be taken to the Dead Sea it being neither permissible to use it nor possible to malappropriate it for the price of the burnt offering a burnt offering is to be provided and this can suffer malappropriation whilst for the price of the peace offering a peace offering is to be provided which may be eaten for one day only and requires no loaves a man can subject the son to a Nazi right vow but not a woman why are you said it is a traditional ruling with regard to the Nazi right are Jose son of Arhan and Talmud Mas Nazir reciting Reshlakish said so as to train him to carry out his religious duties if so why should not a woman also be able to do so Reshlakish holds that it is a man's duty to train his son to carry out his religious duties but not a woman's duty to train her son now on Arhan's view that it is a traditional ruling with regard to the Nazi right vow, we can understand why he can do this with his son but not with his daughter. But according to Rashi Lakish, not the same to be true of a daughter. He holds that it is his duty to train his son but not to train his daughter. Now, on our Yohanan's view, that it is a traditional ruling with regard to the Nazi right, we can understand why he can impose Nazi right ship on his son but not ordinary vows. But on Rashi Lakish's view, why should he not be able to impose ordinary vows to the mission? Argues progressively, not only is it his duty to train his son by imposing upon him vows which do not make him unseemly, but it is even his duty to impose a Nazi right ship, although this will make him unseemly. Now, on our Yohanan's view, that it is a traditional ruling with regard to the Nazi right, we can understand how it teaches if he protests or his relatives protest on his behalf. The Nazi right ship is void, but on Rashi Lakish's view, as cited by our Jose son of R. Hannah to have relatives the power to tell the father not to instruct the son in religious duties he holds that the son objects to any training which is undignified now on our Yohanan's view that it is a traditional ruling with regard to the Nazi right we can understand why the boy is permitted to pull although this means rounding the corners of the head but on Reshlakish's view as cited by our Jose son of Arhana that it is in order to train him to carry out his religious duties he would be transgressing in rounding the corners of his head Reshlakish holds that the rounding of the whole head is prohibited only by rabbinic enactment and since training is a duty imposed by the rabbis the duty as to training imposed by the rabbis can overrule the rabbinic enactment against rounding the whole head now on our Yohanan's view that it is a traditional ruling with regard to the Nazi right we can understand why the boy is allowed to pull and offer the sacrifices of a Nazi right but on the view of Resh Lakish as cited by our Jose son of Arhana that it is in order to train him to carry out his religious duties he would be bringing profane animals into the temple court Resh Lakish holds that the prohibition against the bringing of ordinary animals into the temple court is not scriptural now on our Yohanan's view that it is a traditional ruling with regard to the Nazi right we can understand why if he contracts ritual defilement he may bring an offering of a pair of birds which the priest will eat after pinching off the head but on Resh Lakish's view as cited by our Jose son of Arhana he will be eating carrion Resh Lakish agrees with our Jose son of Arjuna that fowl do not require to be ritually slaughtered in Torah law and considers that the prohibition against bringing non sacred fowl into the temple court is not scriptural is this in fact our Jose's opinion has it not been taught our Jose son of Arjuna said once do we Infer that a sin offering of fowl brought in a doubtful case of childbirth is not to be eaten from the verse and of them that have an issue whether it be a man or a woman woman is here compared to man just as a man is required to bring an offering for a transgression which has certainly been committed so must a woman bring an offering for a childbirth which has certainly occurred and just as there is an offering to be brought by a man after a doubtful transgression so must an offering be brought by a woman after a doubtful childbirth again just as a man brings an offering of the same kind in a case of doubtful transgression as he does after a certain one so must a woman bring an offering of the same kind after a doubtful childbirth as she does after a certain one shall we then infer further that just as in a doubtful case a man brings an offering that is eaten so is the offering brought by the woman to be eaten Talmud, Mas Nazir B you cannot say so whilst this applies in the case of a man where only one forbidden act is involved. You cannot argue that this should also be the case with a woman where two forbidden acts are involved. Now, what are the two forbidden acts referred to? Are they not the prohibition against the eating of carrion and the prohibition against the entry of profane sacrifices into the temple court? Araha, the son of Araka, however, demurred to this inference being drawn for it is surely possible that the eating was forbidden. Because it would appear as though two rabbinic enactments were being transgressed, can we say that the controversy between our Yohanan and Reshlakish is the same as that between the following Tanaim? For it has been taught, Rabbi says that he can impose a Nazi right vow on his son until his majority, but our Jose, son of Arjuna, says only until he reaches the age of making vows for himself. Now, surely the controversy between our Yohanan and Reshlakish is the same as that between these. Tanaim Rabbi considering it to be a traditional ruling with regard to the Nazi right so that though the son may have reached the age of making vows for himself the father can still impose a Nazi right vow on him until he attains his majority whereas our Jose son of Arjuna who asserts that he can do so only until the son reaches the age of making vows for himself is of the opinion that the father may impose a Nazi right ship in order to train him to carry out his religious duties and now that he has passed out of his father's control there is no longer an obligation to train him I will tell you not at all both Rabbi and our Jose son of Arjuna may agree that this is a traditional ruling with regard to the Nazi right where they differ is about the vows of one who can discriminate but who has not quite reached manhood Rabbi considers that a youth who can discriminate but who has not quite reached manhood is permitted to make vows only by enactment of the rabbis. And so the right granted by the Torah to the parent overrules the rabbinical right of the youth whereas our Jose son of Arjuna considers that a youth who can discriminate but who has not quite reached manhood has a scriptural right to make vows alternatively it may be that both rabbi and our Jose son of Arjuna would agree that the father may impose a Nazi right ship in order to train him to carry out his religious duties and that the right of a youth who can discriminate but who has not quite reached manhood to make vows is rabbinic rabbi on the one hand holds that the parent's duty to train which is itself rabbinic overrules the right of the youth who can discriminate but who has not quite reached manhood to make vows for himself which is also rabbinic whilst our Jose son of Arjuna who says that the father's right lasts only until the lad reaches the age of making vows holds that the rabbinic duty to train the lad does not set aside the right of a Youth who can discriminate but who has not quite reached manhood to make his own vows although this is also rabbinic can we say that the controversy between the
said I intend to be one on my father's account if he still has the right to impose it and on my own account otherwise now if he had in fact reached manhood at that time his own Nazi rightship would take effect if he reached manhood after observing the Nazi rightship he would have observed his father's Nazi rightship but suppose he reaches manhood during this period what is to happen and now on our Jose son of our Judah's view that the father's right lasts until the age at which he can make vows for himself all will be well but on Rabbi's view that the right lasts until he reaches manhood how will you explain what happened in point of fact on Rabbi's view no other solution is possible than that he should observe Nazi rightships both on the father's account and on his own account Mishnah a man can pull with offerings due for his father's Nazi rightship but a woman cannot do so where for example a man's father had been a Nazi right and has set apart a lump sum of money for the sacrifices of his Nazarite Heship and died and the son and said I declare myself a Nazirite on condition that I may pull with my father's money our Jose said that these monies are to be used for free will offerings and that such a man cannot pull at the expense of his father's Nazarite Heship who can do so he who was a Nazirite together with his father and whose father had set apart a lump sum of money for his Nazirite sacrifices and died only such a man can pull at the expense of his father's Nazarite Heship tomorrow why cannot a woman pull with her father's money our Yohan and said it is a traditional ruling with regard to the Nazirite surely this is obvious and so what purpose does the ruling serve for a son inherits his father but a daughter does not do so it is not necessary except in the case where he had a daughter only it might have been thought that the tradition received was that all ears could pull Talmud Mas Nazir B and so the ruling tells us that this is not so the question was asked do the rabbis differ from our Jose or not and if it should be decided that they differ whether with the first clause only or with the subsequent clause also come and here in what circumstances was it said that a man may pull at the expense of his father's Nazi rightship where his father who had been a Nazi right set apart money for the sacrifices of his Nazi rightship and died and the son and said I declare myself a Nazi right on condition that I may pull with my father's money he the son is permitted to pull with his father's money but where both he and his father were Nazi rights together and his father set apart money for the sacrifices of his Nazi rightship and died the money is to be used for free will offerings the above is the opinion of our Jose our Elizer our Meir and our Judah said just such a one may pull with his father's money rabbi raised the problem suppose the Nazi right has two sons both Nazi rights what is the law did the tradition state simply that there is a halachah so that the one who was first to become a Nazi right may pull or did it state that the son may use the money because it is his inheritance and so they divided robber raised the problem suppose the sons were the firstborn and another what would the law be was the tradition received as a halachah and the firstborn is therefore not entitled to receive for pulling the same proportion as he receives of the rest of the estate or is the money for the Nazi right sacrifices part of his inheritance and just as he takes a double portion there so also is it with the money for polling should it be decided that the money for the Nazi right sacrifices is part of the inheritance so that the firstborn receives for polling in proportion to what he receives of the rest of the estate does the firstborn receive a double portion only when the money is profane but not when it becomes sacred or is there no difference seeing that he has acquired a double portion for polling, suppose his father was a life Nazarite and he an ordinary Nazi right, or his father an ordinary Nazi right and he a life Nazarite. What would the law be? Was the halacha received only with regard to ordinary Nazi rightships, or is there no difference? Should it be decided that such is the case here because both the Nazi rightships were discharged in ritual purity? Then Arashi raised a further problem. Suppose his father were an unclean Nazi right and he a clean Nazi right, or his father were a clean Nazi right and he an unclean Nazi right. What would be the law? The problem was unsolved. C H A P T E R V Mishnah Beth Shammai say that consecration in error is effective consecration. Talmud, Mas Nazir, but Beth say that it is not effective. For example, if someone says the black bowl that leaves my house first shall be sacred and a white one emerges, Beth Shammai declare it sacred, but Beth say that it is not sacred. Or if he says the golden dinar that comes into my hand first. Shall be sacred and a silver dinar came to his hand Beth Shammai declare it sacred whilst Beth Hillel say that it is not sacred again if he says the cask of wine that I come across first shall be sacred and he comes across a cask of oil Beth Shammai declare it sacred but Beth Hillel say that it is not sacred tomorrow Beth Shammai say that consecration etc Beth Shammai's reason is that they compare original consecration with secondary consecration just as substitution even when made in error is effective so original consecration even when made in error is effective Beth Hillel however contend that this is true only of substitution but that no consecration in error can take effect in the first instance but suppose according to Beth Shammai someone says this animal is to replace that one at midday it would surely not become a substitute immediately from that moment but only when midday arrives and so here too surely consecration should not take effect until the condition under which it was made becomes realized our papa replied the reason that the word first was mentioned by him was simply to indicate that one of his black oxen which should emerge first but the text says a black bull and surely it contemplates the case where he may have only the one in the case considered he is assumed to have two or three Bethilel however contend that if this was his intention it should have said the black hole that leaves earliest Rabbah Barnish said to our Ashi is this called consecration in error it is surely intentional consecration he replied quite so but it is called consecration in error because at first the expression he used gave a wrong impression is it indeed Beth Shammai's opinion that consecration in error is not effective consecration have we not learned if a man who vows to be a Nazi right sets aside an animal for the sacrifice and then applies to the sages for absolution from his vow and they release him the animal goes Forth and pastures with the flock Bethilel said to Beth Shammai do you not admit that this is a case of consecration in error and yet the animal goes forth and pastures with the flock whence it follows does it not that Beth Shammai hold consecration in error to be effective no Bethilel were mistaken they took the reason for Beth Shammai's view to be that consecration in error is effective but the latter replied that the consecration is effective not because it was consecration in error but because at first the expression he used gave a wrong impression but is it Beth Shammai's opinion that consecration in error is not effective come then and here if some people were walking along the road Talmud, Mas Nazir B and saw someone coming towards them and one said I declare myself a Nazi right if it is so and so whilst another said I declare myself a Nazi right if it is not so and so and a third man I declare myself a Nazi right if one of you is a Nazi right a fourth I Declare myself a Nazi right if neither of you is a Nazi right a fifth I declare myself a Nazi right if both of you are Nazi rights and a sixth I declare myself a Nazi right if all of you are Nazi rights Beth Shammai say that all six of them are Nazi rights now this is a case of consecration in error and yet the Mishnah teaches that all of them are Nazi rights from this it certainly follows that Beth Shammai are of the opinion that consecration in error is effective but not from the other Abbe said. You should not assume that the declaration was made in the morning we speak here of a case where it was already midday and he then said the black bull that left my house first today shall be sacred and when informed that a white one left first he remarked had I known that a white one left I should not have said black but how can you say that it refers to what took place at midday seeing that the text reads a golden are that comes red that has come but the text also reads a cask. Of wine that I come across, read that I came across. Arista said, Black oxen amongst white ones spoil the herd. White patches on black oxen are a blemish. We have learned if someone says a black bull that is the first to leave my house shall be sacred, and a white one emerges. Bet I declare it sacred. Now, when a person consecrates, he does so with an ill grace. And yet, Bet I say that the white bull is sacred. Do you suggest then that a person consecrates with a good grace? If so, how can we explain the following clause? If he says the gold dinar that comes into my hand first shall be sacred, and a silver dinar came to his hand, Bet I declare it sacred. Do you submit then that a person consecrates with an ill grace? Consider then the following: If he says the cask of wine that I come across first shall be sacred, and he comes across a cask of oil, Bet I declare it sacred. And yet, oil is superior to wine that raises no difficulty, for it was taught with. Reference to Galilee where wine is superior to oil but the first clause of our Mishnah seems to contradict our Hista. Our Hista will reply my statement referred to Carmenian oxen our
Man vows to be a Nazi right and transgresses a rule of his Nazi rightship. His case is not examined unless he first observes in Nazi right abstinence as many days as he has passed in indulgence. Our Jose said that 30 days are enough now if the author be the rabbis. The case also of Nazi rightship for a long period offers difficulty, whilst if it be our Jose, the case of Nazi rightship for a short period offers difficulty. It may be maintained either that the author is our Jose or that the authors are the rabbis. It may be maintained that the author is our Jose by supposing that the mission refers to a long period of Nazi rightship only and the very to a short period of Nazi rightship as well. It can also be maintained that the authors are the rabbis, in which case we must read in the mission not from the time that the vow was made, but equal to the period which has elapsed since the vow was made if he seeks release from the sages and they absolve him, etc. Our Jeremiah said from. The opinion of Beth Shammai we can infer that of Beth Hillel do not Beth Shammai assert that consecration in error is effective and yet when it becomes clear that the Nazi right vow is not valid the animal goes forth to pasture with the herd so too for Beth Hillel although they say that substitution in error is effective substitution this is only true where the original consecration remains but where the original consecration is revoked the consecration resulting from the substitution is also revoked the master said do you not admit that if he calls the ninth the tenth etc it has been stated in the case of the tithe Arnam and said that this is the rule only if this is done in error not if it is done intentionally are his and Rabbi are not however said that it is certainly the rule if it is done in error and all the more so if it is done intentionally Rabbi said to Arnam according to you who assert that it is the rule only if it is done in error and not if done Intentionally, when Beth Shammai asked Beth Hillel, do you not admit that if he called the ninth, the tenth, the tenth, the ninth, or the eleventh, the tenth, that all three are sacred? And Beth Hillel were silent. Why could they not have answered that the case of tithes is different since these cannot be made sacred intentionally? Our Shammai B. Ashi replied, the reason that they did not do so is because of an unfortunate argument that might be based on this by Beth Shammai. For Beth Shammai might have argued that if tithes that cannot be consecrated out of turn intentionally can be so consecrated in error, then ordinary consecration that can be done intentionally should certainly take effect in error. This argument, however, would be unsound. For ordinary consecration depends entirely upon the intention of the owner. Mishnah, if a man vows to be a Nazi right and ongoing to bring his animal for the sacrifice, finds that it has been stolen. Then, if he had declared himself a Nazi right before the theft. Of his animal, he is still a Nazi right Talmud, Mas Nazir B. But if he had declared himself a Nazi right after the theft of his animal, he is not a Nazi right. It was on this point that Nahum the Mead fell into error when Nazi rights arrived in Jerusalem from the diaspora and found the temple in ruins. Nahum the Mead said to them, Had you known that the temple would be destroyed, would you have become Nazi rights? They answered, No, and so Nahum the Mead absolved them when, however, the matter came to the notice of the sages. They said, Whoever declared himself a Nazi right before the destruction of the temple is a Nazi right. But if after the destruction of the temple he is not a Nazi right, Gemara Rabbi said, The rabbis overruled our Eliezer and laid down the law in accordance with their own views, for we have learned it is permitted to grant release on the ground of improbable contingencies. This is the opinion of our Eliezer, but the sages forbid this Rabbi said further, although the rabbi said that. Improbable contingencies cannot be made the grounds for release yet conditions involving improbable contingencies can be made a ground for release for example it would have been possible to say to them suppose someone had come and said to you that the temple would be destroyed would you have uttered your vow or Joseph said had I been there I should have said to them is it not written the temple of the Lord the temple of the Lord the temple of the Lord are these which points to the destruction of the first and second temples granted that they knew it would be destroyed did they know when this would occur have they objected and did they not know when is it not written seventy weeks are determined upon that people and upon thy holy city all the same did they know on which day Mishnah if people were walking along the road and saw someone coming towards them and one said I declare myself a Nazi right if it is so and so whilst another said I declare myself a Nazi right if it is not so and so and the third man declare myself a Nazi right if one of you is a Nazi right a fourth I declare myself a Nazi right if neither of you is a Nazi right a fifth I declare myself a Nazi right if both of you are Nazi rights and a sixth I declare myself a Nazi right if all of you are Nazi rights Beth Shammai say that all six of them are Nazi rights but Beth Hillel say that only those whose words were not fulfilled are Nazi rights our Tarfan said not one of them is a Nazi right if the person approaching turned away suddenly without being identified he is not a Nazi right our Simeon says he should say if I was right I am a Nazi right obligatorily otherwise I wish to be a Nazi right voluntarily tomorrow why should the ones whose words were not fulfilled become Nazi rights Rab Judah replied read those whose words were fulfilled Talmud Mas Nazir Abbe replied we suppose him to have added for example even if it be not so and so I intend to be a Nazi right the meaning of the phrase his words were not fulfilled Used in the Mishnah being his first words were not fulfilled but his later ones were if the person approaching turned away suddenly without being identified he is not a Nazi right etc. The reason that he is not a Nazi right is because the other turned away which would show that had the other come before us he would become a Nazi right who is the author of this opinion Talmud. Mas Nazir should you say it is our Tarfan would he become a Nazi right for since he did not know at the time he uttered. The Nazi right now whether it was so and so or not would the Nazi right ship have become operative at all for have we not been taught our Judah on behalf of our Tarfan said that not one of them is a Nazi right because Nazi right ship is not intended except when assumed unequivocally it must therefore be our Judah who indicated this in connection with the heap of grain for it has been taught if a man says I declare myself a Nazi right provided that this heap of grain contains 100 core and then finds. That the heap has been stolen or is lost, our Simeon binds him to a Nazi right ship whilst our Judah frees him from the vow. Our Simeon holds that since had it not been stolen, it might have been found to contain 100 core, in which case he would have become a Nazi right. He must now also become a Nazi right here too, since had the other come before us and we had known that it was so and so, he would have become a Nazi right now that the other has not come, he also becomes a Nazi right. Mishnah, if one man saw a koi and said, I declare myself a Nazi right if that is a beast of chase, and another, I declare myself a Nazi right if that is not a beast of chase, a third said, I declare myself a Nazi right if that is cattle, a fourth said, I declare myself a Nazi right if that is not cattle, a fifth said, I declare myself a Nazi right if that is both a beast of chase and cattle, and a sixth said, I declare myself a Nazi right if that is neither beast of chase nor cattle, and a seventh said, I declare myself a Nazi right if one of you is a Nazi right and eight said I declare myself a Nazi right if not one of you is a Nazi right whilst a ninth said I declare myself a Nazi right if you are all Nazi rights then all of them become Nazi rights tomorrow in one very it is taught that nine can become Nazi rights and in another that nine Nazi right ships can be undertaken now there would be nine Nazi rights if for example a number of men referred to the koi one after another but how is it possible for nine Nazi right ships to be undertaken by one man there could indeed be six as enumerated in our mission but how could the other three be undertaken Arshis hate replied he could say I declare myself a Nazi right and undertake the Nazi right ships of you all C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V I mission three things are forbidden to a Nazi right his ritual defilement polling and products of the bind all products of the bind can be reckoned together whilst there is no penalty unless he eats an olive's bulk of grapes Talmud. Mas Nazir B or according to the earlier Mishnah unless he drinks a quarter of a log of wine our Akiva said that there is a penalty even if he soaks his bread in wine and enough is absorbed to make up altogether an olive's bulk there is a separate penalty for wine for grapes for Harzanim and for Zajim our Eliezer B as Arai said there is no penalty in the case of the last two species unless he eats two Harzanim and one Zag by Harzanim and Zajim are meant the following according to our Judah. Harzanim means the outer portion of the grape Zag the inner portion but our Jose said that you may not hear think of the Zog bell of an animal of which the outer part is termed the Zog hood and the inner part the inbal clapper Gemara three things are forbidden to a Nazi right his ritual defilement etc products of the vine are forbidden but not
Particulars and so whatever is fruit or fruit refuse is prohibited should you object that in the specification ripe fruit is particulars and so only what is ripe fruit is prohibited the reply is that in this view nothing would be left implicit in scripture everything being explicitly mentioned fresh grapes and dried grapes are mentioned as are also wine and vinegar it follows that the inference must be drawn not in the latter form but in the first form again seeing that we finally include everything similar to fruit or fruit refuse for what purposes from pressed grapes even to the grape stone mentioned separately from the other specification to tell us that wherever a specification is followed by a general statement it is not permissible to extend the terms of the specification so as to include only whatever is similar to it but the general statement widens the scope of the specification unless scripture indicates the specification in the manner in which it is Indicated in the case of the Nazi right the master said in the specification fruit and fruit refuse are particulars and so whatever is fruit or fruit refuse is prohibited fruit means grapes but what is fruit refuse vinegar what is meant by whatever is fruit unripe grapes and by whatever is fruit refuse are Kahana said that this serves to include worm eaten grapes and what is the significance of even to the grape stone Robin has said that this serves to include the intermediate part it. Master said should you object that in the specification raw ripe fruit is particulars and so only what is ripe fruit is prohibited the reply is that on this view nothing would be left implicit in scripture everything being explicitly mentioned fresh grapes and dried grapes are mentioned as are also wine and vinegar it follows that the inference must be drawn not in the latter form but in the first form again seeing that we finally include everything similar to fruit or fruit refuse for what purposes from pressed grapes even to the grape stone mentioned separately from the other specification to tell us that wherever a specification is followed by a general statement it is not permissible to extend the terms of the specification as, as to include only whatever is similar to it but the general statement widens the scope of the specification unless scripture indicates the specification Talmud, Mas Nazir in the manner in which it is indicated in the case of the Nazi right. Now our Eliezer B. Ezra utilizes the clause from the pressed grapes even to the grape stone for the inference that there is no penalty unless he eats two pressed grapes and one grape stone where does he find a second specification he will agree with our Eliezer who interprets the passage as a clause that amplifies followed by a clause that limits alternatively it can be argued that he agrees with the rabbis for he might say if the sole object of this clause were the inference of R. Eliezer B. Ezra the Torah could have included from the pressed grapes even to the grape stone with the other items specified why then does it appear after the general statement to show that the text is to be construed as a general statement followed by a specification but why should not this be its sole object if this were so the verse should have read either pressed grapes and grape stones with both words in the plural or pressed grape and grape stone with both in the singular the reason why the all merciful says from the pressed grapes even to the grape stone can only be that we should both interpret as a general statement followed by a specification and infer that there is no penalty unless he eats two pressed grapes and one grape stone now our Eliezer interprets the text as consisting of a clause that amplifies and a clause that limits where then does he find in the scripture the typical example of specification general statement and second specification are about said that he finds it in the following verse if a man deliver unto his neighbor an ass or an ox or a sheep is a specification or any beast is a generalization to keep is a further specification and so we may infer only what is similar to the specification Rabbah said that our Eliezer could find one in the following verse and if his offering be of the flock is a specification so flock a general statement and whether of the sheep or of the goats a further specification and so we may infer only what is similar to the specification Rab Judah of discard ask Rabbah why should not our Eliezer find it in the following verse yes shall bring your offering of is a specification the cattle beast a general statement and of the herd or of the flock a further specification and so only what is similar to the specification can be inferred he replied this is not a clear case for if he inferred it from there it could be argued that in the expression the cattle Talmud Mas Nazir be. Cattle includes beasts of chase Rab Judah retorted could beasts of chase be included in cattle in this instance for the herd and the flock are mentioned making in fact a specifications a general statement and a specifications and only what is similar to the specification can be inferred how do we know that the rule is correct it has been taught and thou shalt bestow the money for whatsoever thy soul desireth is a general statement for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink a specification and or for whatsoever thy soul asketh of be a further general statement making a general statement a specification and a second general statement only what is similar to the specification may be inferred and so because the specification particular is the product of that which is itself a product whose sustenance is drawn from the earth whatever is a product of a product bearing species that draws its sustenance from the earth may be purchased seeing that when there is a General statement the specifications and a general statement we infer whatever is similar to the specification what is then the function of the second general statement it is to add whatever resembles the thing specified again seeing that when there is a specifications a general statement and a specifications what is similar to the specification is inferred what is the purpose of the second specification but for its presence it would be said that it is a case of general statement being added to the first specification further seeing that both when there are two general statements separated by a specification and when there are two specifications separated by a general statement what is similar to the specification is inferred what then is the difference between the two cases it is that whereas in the former case we include even things that resemble the specification in one respect only in the latter case we include only what resembles the specification in two respects but not what resembles it in one respect seeing that when a specification is followed by a general statement the general statement supplements the specification all things being included and again when a limitation is followed by an amplifying clause this amplifies to the fullest extent all things being included what then is the difference between the two cases the difference is that whereas in the case of a specification followed by a general statement both shoots and leaves say would be included in the case of a limitation followed by an amplifying clause only the shoots but not the leaves would be included our said our Yohanan said that what is permitted is not reckoned together with what is forbidden in the case of any prohibition of the Torah with the exception of the prohibitions of the Nazi right where the Torah says explicitly neither shall he drink that which is soaked in great juice Talmud Mas Nazir Zeiri said another exception is leaven which it is prohibited to Burn on the altar according to whom will Zeiri infer this evidently after the manner of our Eliezer who interprets the particle kol any but then should not another exception be leavened on Passover quite so but Zeiri wish to indicate his descent from the opinion of Abay that the burning of even less than an olive's bulk counts as an offering and so he incidentally tells us that the burning of less than an olive's bulk does not count as an offering as our Dimi was once sitting and repeating the above reported decision of our Yohanan Abay raised the following objection the Mishnah says if part of a stew of terima containing garlic and oil of hollen is touched by a defiled person who had bathed that day the whole is rendered unfit to be eaten if part of a stew of hollen containing garlic and oil of terima is touched by a defiled person who had bathed that day only that part that was touched becomes unfit to be eaten now in discussing this it was asked why the Part touched should become unfit and Rabbi B. Barhan quoting our Yohanan replied the reason is that a layman would be scourged for eating an olive's bulk surely this Talmud, Mas Nazir B is because permitted food combines with forbidden Ardimi replied no what our Yohanan means by an olive's bulk is that an olive's bulk of actual terima would be consumed during the time taken to eat a pair's Abbe objected is then the time taken to eat a pair's reckoned as a meal by the Torah Ardimi replied it is then Abbe asked why do the rabbis differ from our Eliezer as regards Babylonian Qutah Ardimi replied let Babylonian Qutah alone since there is no olive's bulk of leaven consumed in the time it takes to eat a pair's for if a man does gulp down a large quantity at once we disregard such a fancy as being quite exceptional whilst if one merely dips other food into it you will not find an olive's bulk of eleven consumed in the time taken to eat a pair's Abbe raised Objection against Ardini's ruling from the following passage it has been taught if two spice mortars one containing terima and the other Holland stood near two pots one containing terima and the other Holland and the contents of the first pier fell into the other pier both dishes may be eaten for we assume that Holland fell into Holland and terima into terima now if it is a fact that the consumption of an olive's bulk within the time taken to eat a pair is prohibited by the Torah. Why do we make this assumption but if granting your view replied Ardini
Olive's bulk is consumed within the time taken to eat a pear is what difference would the predominance of Holland make? Ardimi replied, do not seek to argue from Terima at the present time for its sanctity is rabbinic. Abay asked Ardimi what ground is there for assuming that the purpose of the phrase soaked in is to indicate that what is permitted and what is forbidden combined for may not its purpose be to indicate that the taste is equivalent to the substance itself is not this curious. First Abay is perplexed by Ardimi's statement and points out all the above contradictions and then he suggests that perhaps after all the flavor is equivalent to the substance after Ardimi had answered him he went on to suggest that perhaps its purpose is to indicate that the taste is equivalent to the substance itself for it has been taught the phrase soaked in makes the taste equivalent to the substance itself so that if the Nazi right soaked grapes in water and this acquired the taste of wine there would be a penalty for drinking it from this case an inference may be drawn applicable to all prohibitions of the Torah foreseeing that in the case of the Nazi right where the prohibition is not permanent where he is not forbidden to derive any benefit from wine and where he may even have the prohibition removed the taste was declared to be equivalent to the substance then in the case of mixed seeds in the vineyard where the prohibition is permanent where it is forbidden to derive any benefit from them and where there is no way in which the prohibition can be removed it surely follows that the flavor is to be equivalent to the substance itself the same argument applies to Orla which has two of these properties Ardimi replied the above represents the view of the rabbis whereas Arabah when making a statement on behalf of our Yohanan was following the opinion of our Akiba to what statement of our Akiba does this refer shall I say that it is the dictum of our Akiba to be found here in our Mishnah where we learn our Akiba said that there is a penalty even if he soaks his bread in wine and enough is absorbed to combine into an olive's bulk but once do you know that the olive's bulk includes the bread eaten may it not mean that the wine alone must be an olive's bulk and should you object that the statement would then be obvious to this we may reply that its object is to indicate dissent from the opinion of the first tana that there is no penalty unless he drinks a quarter of a log of wine it must therefore be the statement of our Akiba to be found in the following very where it is taught our Akiba said that a Nazi right who soaks his bread in wine and eats an olive's bulk of the bread and wine is liable to the penalty Araha the son of Ari we ask our Ashi whence will our Akiba who interprets the phrase whatever is soaked in as implying that permitted and forbidden foods combined derive the rule that the taste is equivalent to the substance itself he can derive it from the prohibition of meat and milk seated together for there is no more than a mere taste in that case and yet it is forbidden whence we may infer that the same is true here the rabbis do not allow this inference to be made from meat and milk because it is an anomalous prohibition what constitutes its anomaly shall I say it is the fact that each constituent is permitted separately while the combination is forbidden surely also in the case of mixed seeds each constituent is permitted separately and the combination is forbidden it is therefore the fact that if soaked in milk all day long the meat remains permitted and yet unseating it becomes forbidden must not our akibah to agree that the seeding together of meat and milk is an anomalous prohibition it must therefore be Talmud, Mas Nazir be that he derives the rule from the necessity for scalding the vessels of a Gentile for the all merciful law has said everything that May abide the fire, ye shall make go through the fire, etc., telling us that they are otherwise forbidden. Now the scalding of the Gentiles' vessels must be done because the mere taste is forbidden, and so here too the same is true. Then why should not the rabbis also infer this rule from the scalding of the Gentiles' vessels? Rabbi Ashi replied there too, the prohibition is anomalous for everywhere else in the Torah, whatever imparts a worse in flavor is permitted, whereas in the case of it, scalding of the Gentiles' vessels, a worse in flavor is forbidden. Must not our Akiba agree that this case is anomalous? Arhunabi High replied, according to our Akiba, the Torah only forbade utensils that had been used by a Gentile on the same day, in which case the flavor is not detrimental, and the rabbis they considered that even with the pot that had been used on the same day, it was impossible for the flavor not to be slightly detrimental. Araha, the son of Ari, we have said to our Ashi, the rabbis' opinion. Should throw a certain light on the views of our Akiba for the rabbis say that the phrase whatever is soaked in has as its object to indicate that the taste is equivalent to the substance itself and further that a rule may be derived from this applicable to all prohibitions of the Torah and so ought not our Akiba also who interprets the same phrase whatever is soaked in as implying that what is permitted combines with what is forbidden and for further from it a rule applicable to all prohibitions of the Torah our Ashi replied he does not do so because the Nazi right and the sin offering are dealt with in two verses of scripture from which the same inference is possible and whenever there are two verses from which the same inference is possible no other cases may be inferred the Nazi right passage is the one just explained what is the inference from sin offering it has been taught the verse whatsoever food shall touch the flesh thereof shall be holy might be taken to Imply that it becomes holy even if none of the sin offering is absorbed by its scripture however says the flesh thereof this indicates that it becomes sacred only when it absorbs from its flesh it then shall be holy that is have the same degree of sanctity as the sin offering itself if the latter is ritually unfit to be eaten the other becomes unfit also whilst if it is still permitted the other is also permitted only under the same conditions of stringency as the sin offering. What can the rabbis say to this argument they will contend that both verses are necessary for if the all-merciful had inscribed only the verse relating to the sin offering it would have been said that we have no right to infer from it the case of the Nazi right for we could not infer anything about the Nazi right from regulations applying to sacrificial meats again had the all-merciful inscribed only the verse relating to the Nazi right it could have been argued that no rule can be derived from. The Nazi right since the prohibitions in his case are very severe indeed for he is forbidden even the skin of the grape on this ground we should have been able to infer nothing thus both verses are necessary what is our Akiva's reply to this argument he will reply that both verses are certainly not necessary granted that had the all-merciful inscribed only the verse relating to the sin offering we could not have deduced the case of the Nazi right because what is profane cannot be inferred from regulations applying to sacrificial meats yet the all-merciful could have inscribed only the verse relating to the Nazi right and the case of the sin offering could have been deduced from this since in any case all other prohibitions of the Torah are inferred from the Nazi right prohibition and the rabbis they can reply that while the verse relating to sin offering tells us that permitted and forbidden foods combined we cannot infer from regulations applying to sacrificial meats any rule Concerning profane food whereas when the phrase whatever is soaked in tells us that the taste is equivalent to the substance itself a rule is inferred from this applicable to all prohibitions of the Torah and our Akiva he considers that both verses are intended to tell us that what is permitted combines with what is forbidden so that these are two verses from which the same inference can be made and when two verses occur from which the same inference can be made no other cases may be inferred. Our Ashi said to our Kahana how are we to explain the following where it is taught the verse nothing that is made of the grapevine from the pressed grapes even to the grape stone teaches that the things forbidden to a Nazi right can combine together foreseeing that it is possible according to our Akiva for what is permitted to combine with what is forbidden need we be told that the same is true of two species of forbidden substances our Kahana replied what is permitted combines with what is Forbidden only if they are eaten together whereas two species of forbidden substances combine even if eaten consecutively now our Simeon Talmud, Mas Nazir does not require the principle of combination what interpretation does he put on the verse nothing that is made etc. he requires it for the rule that one cannot become a Nazi right without undertaking explicitly to abstain from all the things that are forbidden a Nazi right are about quoting our Eliezer said in none of the instances in the Torah requiring a quarter of a log does what is permitted combined with what is forbidden with the exception of the quarter of a log of the Nazi right where the Torah uses the phrase soaked in what is the difference between our Yohanan and our Eliezer it is that the former includes solid foods the latter liquids only but no other things our Eliezer said that there are ten quarters of a log and our Kahana knew for a fact that five involved red liquids and five white for the five red ones there. Is the following mnemonic a Nazi right and a celebrant of the Passover who delivered judgment in the sanctuary and died a Nazi right indicates the quarter log of wine entailing a penalty for the Nazi right who drinks it a celebrant of the Passover refers to the following dictum quoted by
Learn for all other liquids a legal quantity is a quarter of a log and for always liquids a legal quantity is a quarter of a log but is there no instance other than the ten mentioned requiring a quarter of a log there is surely the case with a quarter of a log of water the hands of one person and even of two may be washed before food disputed cases are not included but we have also the following case he brought an earthenware file and poured into it half a log of water from the labor according to Arjuna it was only a quarter of a log disputed cases are not included but we have also the following how much water must be poured into the chamber pot as little as one pleases our Zakai said it must be a quarter of a log disputed cases are not included but there is also the ritual bath there are ten cases besides this one for the rabbi subsequently disallowed this quantity Talmud, Mas Nazir be whilst there is no penalty unless he eats an olive's bulk of grapes etc the first tana does not put all the things forbidden and not right on the same footing as drinking whereas our Akibal because of the verse nor eat fresh grapes nor dried says that just as in eating an olive's bulk entails a penalty so for all the prohibitions an olive's bulk is sufficient to entail a penalty there is a separate penalty for wine etc our rabbis taught the verse nor eat fresh grapes nor dried indicates that there is a penalty for eating the one by itself and a penalty for eating the other by itself from your rule may be derived applicable to all prohibitions of the Torah just as here where we have a single species grapes known by two different names fresh and dried each entails a distinct penalty so wherever we find a single species known by two different names each entails a penalty distinct from the other in this way new wine and grapes are included said for eating fresh grapes the Nazi right is scourged twice for eating grape Stones he is scourged twice for eating both pressed grapes and grape stones he is scourged three times Rabbi said he is scourged once only in the first two cases since we do not scourge for breach of the prohibition expressed in general terms our papa raised an objection it is taught our Eliezer said that a Nazi right who drank wine all day long would be scourged once only if however he was warned do not drink and again do not drink and so on there would be a penalty for each warning if he ate fresh grapes dried grapes pressed grapes grape stones and squeezed a cluster of grapes and drank the liquor he would be scourged five times now if Abbe is right he should be scourged six times including once on account of he shall eat nothing that is made of the grapevine Abbe replied he mentioned some and omitted others but what other count is omitted that the one referred to should have been omitted he omitted he shall not break his word had this last however been the only one, it would not have been considered an omission as it could be argued that our Eliezer mentioned only those prohibitions that are not found elsewhere, whereas this one is found in connection with ordinary vows to Rubin of Parasikia said to our Ashi, but he has in any case omitted the intermediate portion of the grape, but said our Papa in reply to the various arguments advanced five is not actually mentioned in the Beritha, but our Papa Talmud, Mas Nazir quoted the passage in contradiction of Abbe because of the five scourgings and if five is not mentioned in it, why did he quote it as a contradiction? Our Papa said to himself, I imagine that Abbe's opinion was not a tradition he had received, and so he would retract on hearing my quotation, for I did not know that it was a tradition and that he would not retract our Eliezer B as arrived, said, etc. Our Joseph said in agreement with whom is the rendering in the Targum as from the kernels even unto the skins in. Agreement with the opinion of our Jose Mishnah, a Nazarite of unspecified duration lasts 30 days should the Nazi right pull himself or be pulled by bandits 30 days are rendered void a Nazi right who pulls himself no matter whether he uses a scissors or a razor or who trims his hair however little incurs a penalty Gamara the academy wished to know whether the growth of the hair takes place at the roots or at the tips the knowledge is of importance for the case of a Nazi right pulled by bandits who left enough of each hair for the end to be curled in towards the root if the hair grows at the roots the consecrated part has been removed but if it grows at the tips then the part he consecrated is still there judged from the live knit found at the root of a strand of hair for if it were true that the growth is at the root ought it not to be found at the tip the growth may well be at the tip but the knit being alive continually moves down towards the root judged from the dead Knit that is found at the end of a strand of hair for if it were true that the growth takes place at the end ought it not to be found near the root there again it may well be because it has no power to grasp the hair that it slides more and more along it just from the pigtails of heathens that loosen near the root after growing for some time there too it may well be because of its being creased by his lying on it that it grows loose just from the cicada for the wool grows fresh. Again underneath the marking and this is something which we learned in a mission further when old men dye their beards these grow white again Talmud, Mas Nazir be at the roots from this we can justly infer that hair increases at the roots this proves it but it has been taught as follows a Nazi right pulled by bandits who left sufficient of each hair for the end to be curled inwards towards the root is not required to render void his Nazi right ship now if it is true that the hair grows. From beneath why should he not render it void it is here assumed that they pulled him after the termination of his Nazi rightship and the author is our Eliezer in whose opinion whatever happens after the termination of the Nazi rightship renders void only seven days his reason being that he applies the same rule to pulling in ritual purity as to pulling after defilement just as in pulling after defilement seven days become void so in pulling in ritual purity seven days are to become void and it rabbis knew for a fact that every seven days enough hair grows for the tip to be curled inwards towards the root a Nazi right who pulls himself no matter whether he uses a razor or scissors or who trims his hair however little incurs a penalty our rabbis taught from the word razor I only know that he is forbidden to use a razor how do I know that if he pulls his hair out or plucks it with tweezers or trims it however little he is equally culpable the verse continues he shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow long the above is the opinion of our Josiah whereas our Jonathan said that razor implies razor only and if he plucks his hair or pulls it out or trims it but a little there is no penalty but it says he shall be holy etc this is to tell us that if he removes it with a razor he has transgressed both a positive and a negative precept another very the taught razor tells me only that he is forbidden to use a razor how do I know that if he pulls out his hair or plucks it or trims it but a little he is equally culpable the verse reads a razor shall not come upon his head now seeing that we are finally intended to include all means of removing the hair why are we told that a razor shall not come upon his head this is because we should not otherwise be able to infer that the final pulling must be done with a razor for it is impossible to derive this from the leper Talmud Mas Nazir since we could not argue to the less Stringent from the more stringent and impose on the former greater stringency rabbi said this argument is unnecessary for the text can be read a razor shall not come upon his head until the days of his Nazi rightship are fulfilled so that the Torah says explicitly that after fulfillment pulling is to be carried out only with a razor but it also says a razor shall not come upon his head this is to provide for a penalty on two counts are his said that stripes are incurred by removing one. Here the completion of his Nazi rightship is held up if two hairs remain the Nazi rightship does not become void unless the greater part of his hair is removed by a razor are we to understand that a razor only is meant by our but no other method is it not taught how do we know that all other methods of removing the hair are equally forbidden etc you must therefore say in our histos dictum removed as though by a razor likewise has it been taught a Nazi right who pulls out his hair. Or plucks it or trims it, but a little incurs a penalty. But he does not render void the previous period unless he shaves the greater part of his head with a razor. Our Simeon Bijuda, in the name of Our Simeon, said just as two hairs, if they are left, hold up the termination of the Nazi rightship. So also the removal of two hairs renders void the previous period. We learn elsewhere there are three who must pull, and whose pulling is a religious duty. The Nazi right, the leper, and the levites. If any one of them pulled without a razor or left behind two hairs, his act is invalid. The master said there are three who must pull, and whose pulling is a religious duty. Surely this is obvious. It might have been thought that they are simply required to remove their hair, and even smearing it with nashat is valid. And so we are told that this is not so. It is also stated if any one of them pulled without a razor, etc. Now we can grant this in the case of a Nazi right where there is written there shall no. Razor come upon his head and of the levites where there is written and let them cause a razor to pass over all their flesh but how do we know that a leper must use a razor should you reply that this can be inferred from the levites by the following argument viz the levites required to pull and the pulling must be performed with
applies to one side does not apply to the other and what applies to the other side does not apply to the one side what they have in common is that they both require to pull and this pulling must be done with a razor and so I will infer with regard to the leper who is also required to pull that his pulling must be done with a razor said Rabbah varnished to Arashi but can it not be objected that another common property of the Levites and the Nazirite is Talmud, Mas Nazir be that their sacrifice could not be offered in poverty whereas the sacrifice of a leper could be offered in poverty Rabbah B. Meshesh said to Rabbah this Tana first asserts that the rule of the Nazirite could not be deduced from that of the leper because we must not argue to the less stringent from the more stringent in order to impose on it the same stringency and then he goes on to say that the case of the leper itself should be inferred by argument whereas in fact we are not able to infer it from any argument. Robert replied the former discussion is based on the view of the rabbis the latter on that of Arlizer for we have learned whilst there is no penalty unless he plucks out the hair with a razor Arlizer said that even if he plucks it with tweezers or with a rohit knee he incurs a penalty what is the reason of the rabbis it has been taught why does scripture mention his beard because we find elsewhere the verse neither shall they shave off the corners of their beards it might be thought that this applies even to a priest who is a leper we are therefore told that the leper must shave his beard once do we know that he must use a razor it has been taught the verse neither shall they shave off the corners of their beards could mean that even if they shaved it with scissors there would be a penalty and so we are told elsewhere neither shall thou mar the corners of thy beard this last verse alone could mean that even if he plucks it out with tweezers or a rohit knee there is a Penalty and so we are told neither shall they shave the corners of their beards. How do we make the inferences from these verses? The kind of shaving that also mars the beard is with a razor. But how does it follow from a? It not well be that even if the leper uses tweezers or a rohit knee, he has carried out his religious duty. The purpose of the verse being to tell us that even if he uses a razor, there is no penalty. I will explain if you assume that even if he uses tweezers or a rohit knee, he has carried out his religious duty. The verse should have remained silent on the subject, and I should have argued as follows: seeing that a Nazi right who has done what is forbidden is nevertheless obliged to use a razor, then the leper who is here doing a religious duty should certainly be allowed to use a razor. Talmud, Mas Nazir. Moreover, should you assume that if he uses tweezers or a rohit knee, he has carried out his religious duty, then because a razor is not mentioned explicitly, it should be. Entirely forbidden in accordance with the dictum of Rush Lakish who has said that wherever we find both a positive command and a prohibition then if it is possible to observe both well and good otherwise the positive command is to override the prohibition and what is our Eliezer's reason it has been taught why does scripture mention his head since it says in connection with the Nazi right there shall no razor come upon his head it might be thought that this is true even of a Nazi right who becomes a leper we are therefore told that the leper must shave his head how does it follow may it not well be that even if he uses tweezers or a rohit knee he has carried out his religious duty and should you object that the razor should not have been mentioned the answer would be that this tells us that the leper may use even a razor for I might have thought that because a Nazi right who uses a razor incurs a penalty so does a leper who uses a razor incur a penalty and so we are told that this is not so if you assume that a leper who uses tweezers or a rohit knee has carried out his religious duty then because a razor is not mentioned explicitly in his case it should be forbidden entirely in accordance with the dictum of Rush Lakish what interpretation do the rabbis put on the mention of his head they require it to override the prohibition against rounding the corners of the head as it has been taught the verse ye shall not round the corners of your heads might mean that the same is true of a leper and we are therefore told that he must shave his head but this can be deduced from the mention of his beard for it has been taught why does scripture mentions his beard since it says neither shall they shave off the corners of their beards it might be thought that even a priest who is a leper may not do so and we are therefore told that the leper must shave his beard now why should it be necessary to mention both his head and his beard it is necessary for head the all merciful mentioned his beard and not his head it might have been thought that the rounding of the whole head is not considered as infringing the prohibition against rounding and so the all merciful law also mentions his head Talmud, Mas Nazir B again had his head been mentioned and not his beard I would have understood that two things are implied first that the positive command to shave overrides the prohibition and secondly that the rounding of the whole head is considered to infringe the prohibition against rounding but there would still remain the question how do we know that a razor must be used and so the all merciful law mentions his beard and once does our Eliezer learn that a positive command overrides a prohibition he infers it from the command to wear twisted cords for it has been taught thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff linen and wool together Talmud, Mas Nazir but nevertheless thou shalt make the twisted cords of them the master said if any one of them pulled without a razor or left behind two hairs his act is invalid Araha the son of R.I.K. said this implies that Torah law accepts the principle that the majority counts as a whole in what way does this follow from the fact that the all merciful reveals in the cafe of the Nazi right that on the seventh day he shall shave it for we infer that here only is his duty unfulfilled until the whole has been shaved whilst elsewhere the majority counts as a whole R. Jose son of R. Hannah demurred to this but this verse is speaking of a defiled Nazi right in the West they laughed at this objection consider they said that a defiled Nazi right is required to use a razor in shaving his head is inferred from a ritually pure Nazi right it stands to reason then that we can now infer the rule of a ritually pure Nazi right from a defiled Nazi right is that just as when the latter leaves two hairs standing his act is invalid so when the former leaves two hairs standing his Act is invalid. Abbe propounded the following question: What would be the law if a Nazi right shaved and left two hairs standing, and then when his head showed a new growth, shaved off those two hairs? Would this hold up the termination of the Nazi right shape or not? Rabbah propounded the following question: What would be the law if a Nazi right shaved, leaving two hairs standing, and then shaved one and one fell out? Araha of Difti asked Rabbah, Has Rabbah any doubt in the case where hair is shaved one? At a time he replied, We must say then the question arises: If one fell out and he shaved the other, he then replied, Here is no pulling, for here is no hair. But if there is no hair here, then pulling has been performed. The meaning is, although there is no hair left, the duty to pull has not been validly observed. Mishnah: A Nazi right may shampoo his hair and part it with his fingers, but may not comb it. Gemara: He may shampoo his hair and part it with his fingers. Who is the author of this? Opinion it is our Simeon who says a breach of the law which is not intended is allowed but he may not call my tea here we come round to the opinion of the rabbis are we then to understand that the first clause is by our Simeon and the next one by the rabbis rabbi replied the whole is by our Simeon for a man who combs his hair intends to remove loose strands mission our Ishmael said he is not to cleanse it with earth because it causes the hair to fall out tomorrow the academy wish to know whether we read because it causes the hair to fall out or because of the kinds of earth that cause the hair to fall out where would a practical difference arise in the case where there is a variety of earth that does not cause it to fall out if you say that we read because it causes it to fall out then wherever we know that it does not cause it to fall out it could be used but if you say because of the kinds of earth that cause it to fall out that he may not use any kind at all this was left Undecided Mishnah, a Nazi right who has drunk wine all day long has incurred a single penalty only if he was told do not drink, do not drink, and he drank, he has incurred a penalty for each warning for pulling all day long, he incurs one penalty only if he was told do not pull, do not pull, and he did pull, he has incurred a penalty for each warning for defiling himself by contact with the dead all day long, he incurs one penalty only if he was told do not defile yourself, do not defile yourself, and he did defile himself, he has incurred a penalty for each warning. Talmud, Mas Nazir B. Gemara, it was stated, Rabbi citing Arhuna said scripture speaking of the Nazi right makes a comprehensive statement, he shall not make himself unclean when it adds, he shall not enter by a dead body, its intention is to utter a separate warning against defilement by contact and a separate warning against entering a tent, but not against defilement by contact from two scourses at the same time are. Joseph, however, said by God, Arhuna said that even for defilement by contact from two sources at the same time, there are separate penalties. For Arhuna has said that a Nazi right standing in a cemetery who was handed the corpse of his own relative or some other corpse and tou
Former that there is no concatenation is then defilement through concatenation. The Torah enactment has not our Isaac B. Joseph said. Our Jan A said that defilement through concatenation was held to be effective only as it affects terima and sacrificial meats, but not the Nazi rite or a celebrant of the Passover. Now, if as you assert it is a Torah defilement, why should there be this difference? There, concatenation of one man with another is meant in our case concatenation of the man with the corpse, but not against defilement by contact from two sources at the same time, said Rabbi, because he is actually defiled already. But in the case of defilement by contact and entering a tent containing a corpse, is he not also already defiled? Our Yohanan replied in the latter case, he is supposed to enter a house whilst undefiled in the former, which takes place in the open. There cannot be two penalties, Talmud, Mas Nazir, but even on entering a house as soon as his hands are inside, he becomes unclean so that when he has gone right and he is already unclean as a matter of fact said R. Eliezer if he put his hands together and entered there would be a penalty only for defilement but none for entering but if he drew himself up and entered defilement and entering occur at the same moment but it is impossible for his nose not to go in first as a matter of fact said Rabbah if he introduces his hand there would be a penalty for defilement and not for entering but if he introduces his body defilement and entering are simultaneous but it is impossible for his toes not to enter first our papa therefore said it is supposed that he entered in a box or a chest or a turret and his fellow came and broke away the covering so that defilement and entering are simultaneous Marbi R. Ashi said it is supposed that he entered whilst the other lay dying and whilst he was sitting there the spirit departed so that defilement and entering were simultaneous our rabbis taught to profane himself signifies that until the time that the other dies he is permitted to remain with him rabbi said that when they die signifies that he may be in contact with them until they die what is the difference between these two alternative reasons are Yohanan said that they differ only as to the text selected rush said they differ as regards the rule for a dying man the one who takes the text to profane himself considers a dying man as profanation whilst the one who takes one day Dai says that there is no prohibition until he is dead and so none in the case of one who is dying now according to the one who derives the law from to profane himself is there not the text when they die he requires this for the following inference of rabbi for it has been taught rabbi said that when they die he is forbidden to defile himself but he may defile himself by association with them when they are suffering from leprosy or an issue but does not the one who derives the law from when they die also require it for this inference if this is its sole purpose the text should read when dead because it says when they die we infer both things now according to the one who derives the law from when they die is there not the verse to profane himself to profane himself signifies the following is that one who is not profaned incurs a penalty but not the one who is already profaned but does not the one who derives the law from to profane himself also require it for this inference if this were its sole purpose the text should read to profane because it reads to profane himself we infer both things an objection was raised we have learned a man does not spread defilement until his life departs not even one whose arteries are severed or who is in the throes of death does so now according to the one who bases the rule on to profane himself does it not say here that they do not spread defilement defilement is not spread until the life departs but there is Profanation already Talmud, Mas Nazir Bar his citing rap said a priest if his father was decapitated must not defile himself for him for what reason the text says for his father meaning when he is whole and not when he is defective Arham Nana said to him in that case suppose the father were traveling through the valley of Erebot and robbers cut off his head would you also maintain that the son is not to defile himself for him you replied you raised the question of a methmizwa seeing that we consider it his duty to defile himself under such circumstances to strangers how much more so is this true of his father but is this considered a methmizwa has it not been taught a methmizwa is a corpse with none to bury him were he able to call and others answer him he is not a methmizwa and here this man has a son because they are traveling on the road it is as though he had none to bury him an objection was raised from the following it has been taught for her may he Defile himself signifies that he may defile himself for her herself but not for one of her limbs for he may not defile himself for a limb cut off even from his father whilst still alive but he may search for a bone the size of a barleycorn now what means he may search for a bone the size of a barleycorn surely that if there is a small part missing he may nevertheless defile himself no the author of that statement is Arjuna for it has been taught Arjuna said that he may defile himself for her but not for her limbs for he is forbidden to defile himself for limbs severed from his father whilst still alive but he may defile himself for limbs severed from his father after death but Arkahana taught amongst the Barathes of our Eliza B. Jacob the following one for her may he defile himself but he must not defile himself for limbs thus excluding an olive's bulk of the flesh of a corpse or an olive's bulk of nizzle or a spoonful of her cap it might be thought that he is also forbidden to defile himself for the spinal column or the skull or the greater part of the bodily frame of his sister's corpse or the majority of its bones but since it is written and say unto them it follows that scripture has permitted you an additional defilement Talmud, Mas Nazir it might be thought further that he is not to defile himself for the spinal column or the skull or the greater part of the bodily frame or the majority of the bones of the other relations but I will tell you why. That is not so his sister is distinguished from strangers by the fact that her body depends on him for its burial and he is required to defile himself for the spinal column or the skull or the greater part of its bodily frame or the majority of its bones and so in all cases where the body depends on him for burial he is required to defile himself for its spinal column or its skull or the greater part of its bodily frame or the majority of its bones this contradicts Rab does it not? The author of this Baritha too is Arjuna whereas Rab agrees with the following Tanifer it has been taught the story is told that the father of our Isaac the priest died at Kinzik and he was informed three years later he went and asked our Joshua B. Elisha and the four elders with him and they replied for his father when he is whole but not when he is defective Mishnah three things are forbidden the Nazi right is defilement polling and products of the vine defilement and polling have a stringency not possessed by products of the vine in that defilement and polling render void the previous period whereas partaking of products of the vine does not do so products of the vine have a stringency not possessed by defilement or polling in that products of the vine permit of no exception from the general prohibition whereas defilement and polling are allowed as exception from the general prohibition in the case where polling is a religious duty or where there is a methmizwa. Defilement also has a stringency not possessed by polling in that defilement renders void the whole of the preceding period and entails the offering of a sacrifice whereas polling renders void only 30 days and does not entail a sacrifice tomorrow why should not defilement also permit of no exception from the general prohibition in virtue of the following a fortiori argument from wine seeing that wine which does not render void the previous period permits of no exception from the general prohibition and defilement which does render void the previous period should certainly not permit of an exception from the general prohibition the text says nor defile himself for his father or for his mother signifying that it is only for his father or for his mother that he is forbidden to defile himself whereas he is required to defile himself for a meth then why should not wine permit of an exception from the general prohibition because of the following a fortiori argument from Defilement seeing that defilement which renders void the previous period permits of an exception from the general prohibition and wine which does not render void the previous period should certainly permit of an exception from the general prohibition the verse says he shall abstain from wine and strong drink thus forbidding wine that should be drunk as a ritual obligation as well as wine that he might drink from choice then why should not wine render void the whole of the previous period because of the following a fortiori argument from defilement seeing that defilement which permits of an exception from the general prohibition renders void the previous period then wine which permits of no exception should certainly render void the preceding period the verse says but the former days shall be void because his consecration was defiled signifying that defilement renders void but wine does not do so why should not polling render void the whole of the previous period because of the following a fortiori argument from defilement seeing that defilement the agent of which is not subjected to the same penalty as the patient renders void the whole of the previous period then polling where the agent is subject to the same penalty as the patient should certainly render void the whole of the preceding period the verse says but the former days shall be void because his consecration was defiled signifying that defilement renders void the whole of the preceding period but polling does not do so why should not the agent be subject to the same penalty as the patient in the case of defilement because of the following a
of the preceding period the agent should certainly not be subject to the same penalty as the patient. The verse says there shall no razor come upon his head and can be read as signifying that he shall not make it come himself and that no other shall make it come either. Polling should not permit of an exception from the general prohibition because of the following a fortiori argument front one seeing that wine which does not render void the preceding period permits of no exception from. The general prohibition and polling which does render void the preceding period should certainly permit of no exception. The all-merciful mentions both his hair and his beard and polling should not render void any of the preceding period because of the following a fortiori argument from one seeing that wine which permits of no exception does not render void polling which does permit of an exception from the general prohibition should certainly not render void we require a sufficient. Growth of hair and this would be lacking why should not wine render void 30 days because of the following a fortiori argument from polling seeing that polling which permits of an exception from the general prohibition renders void 30 days then wine which permits of no exception from the general prohibition should certainly do so is not the only reason because there must be a sufficient growth of hair after wine his hair is still intact Talmud, Mas Nazir B. Mishnah was the right. Of the polling after defilement performed he would be sprinkled on the third and seventh days poll on the seventh day and bring his sacrifices on the eighth day if he polled on the eighth day he would bring his sacrifices on that same day this is the opinion of our Akiva Artarfan asked him what difference is there between this Nazirite and a leper he replied the purification of this man depends on the lapse of seven days only whereas the purification of a leper depends also on his Polling and he cannot bring a sacrifice unless the sun has set upon him after his ritual bath. Gamara did Artarfan accept this answer or not come and here Hillel learned if the Nazi right polled on the eighth day he was to bring his sacrifices on the ninth. Now if you assume that he accepted the answer should he not bring his sacrifices on the eighth day? Rabbi said this creates no difficulty for the one case assumes that he bathed on the seventh day and the other that he did not bathe on the seventh day. Abbe said I came across the colleagues of our Nathan Bihashai seated at their studies and reporting the following teaching scripture says and come before the Lord unto the door of the tent of meeting and give them unto the priest when is he to come if he has bathed and waited until after sunset he may come but if he has not bathed and waited until after sunset he may not do so thus we see they said that this Tana is of the opinion that a Tibul after Gunnaro he is. Still like a sufferer from Gonorrhea, I obeyed and said to them if that is so then in the case of a defiled Nazi right where we find the verse he shall bring two turtle doves to the priest to the door of the tent of meeting we should also say that he is to come only if he has bathed and waited until after sunset Talmud, Mas Nazir and now where were the gates of Nikonar situated at the entrance to the camp of the Levites were they not and yet it has been taught one who is defiled by a corpse is allowed to enter the camp of the Levites and not merely one defiled by a corpse but even the corpse itself may enter therefore it says and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him the meaning of with him is in his own section i.e. in the camp of the Levites it must therefore be said Abay that a Tebul Yom after Gonorrhea is not like a sufferer from Gonorrhea but in spite of this because he still lacks atonement he is not to enter into the temple precincts foreseeing that the References to the camp of the Levites. Why is it called in the verse the tent of meeting to tell us that just as one who lacks atonement might not enter there, so one who lacks atonement may not enter the camp of the Levites. How is it known in that case it has been taught he shall be unclean? Includes also a Tebul Yom. His uncleanness is yet upon him. Includes also one who lacks atonement. Mishnah was the right of polling and ritual purity performed. He would bring three animals a sin offering, a burnt offering, and a peace offering. Slaughter the peace offering and poll thereafter. This is the opinion of our Judah. Our Eliezer said he would poll actually after the sin offering. For in all cases the sacrifice of the sin offering takes precedence. But if he polled after the slaughter of any one of the three, his obligation would be discharged. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said if he brought three animals without specifying what they were for the one suitable for a sin offering was to be. Sacrificed as a sin offering for a burnt offering as a burnt offering and for a peace offering as a peace offering Gemara our rabbis taught when it says and the Nazi right shall shave at the door of the tent of meeting scripture is speaking of the peace offering of which it is said and kill it at the door of the tent of meeting you say that scripture is speaking of the peace offering but may it not mean literally at the door of the tent of meeting I will explain if that were its meaning it would show contempt for the sanctuary our Josiah said it is unnecessary to rely on a mere assertion for the Torah says neither shalt thou go up by steps upon my altar and how much more so should it be forbidden to show contempt our Isaac said this argument is unnecessary for the verse continues and shall take the hair of his consecrated head and put it on the fire which is under the sacrifice of peace offerings referring to one who needs only to take it and put it on the fire and thus Excluding the case contemplated where he would need to take it, fetch it, and put it on the fire. Another version of our Isaac's dictum, our Isaac said, Scripture is there speaking of the peace offering. You say it is speaking of the peace offerings, but may it not mean literally at the door of the tent of meeting. The verse continues, and shall take the hair of his consecrated head, etc., signifying that he shaved where he broiled the peace offering. Abba on behalf of our Eliezer said, and it. Nazi right shall shave at the door of the tent of meeting signifies that whenever the door of the tent of meeting is not open, he is forbidden to shave. Our Simeon of Shizuri said, and the Nazi right shall shave at the door of the tent of meeting, but not a female Nazi right Talmud. Mas Nazir be lest the young priests become assailed by temptation through her. Our Simeon's colleague said to him, The case of the faithless wife disproves your point, for there it is written, and the priest shall set her. Before the Lord and we are not afraid lest the young priest be assailed by temptation through her. He replied, The woman Nazi right pencils her eyebrows and applies rouge whilst the faithless wife uses neither pencil nor rouge. Mishnah he then took the hair of his consecrated head and threw it under the cauldron. If he shaved in the province, he did not throw it under the cauldron. The above refers only to polling in ritual purity, whereas in polling after ritual defilement, he did not cast it under the cauldron. Our Meir said, All Nazi rites threw it under the cauldron with the sole exception of a defiled Nazi right who polled in the province's Gemara. He then took the hair of his consecrated head. Our rabbis taught he then took the broth, put it along with the hair of his consecrated head and threw it under the cauldron containing the peace offering. But if he threw it under the cauldron containing the sin offering or the guilt offerings, his obligation would also be discharged. But is there? A guilt offering in the case of a ritually pure Nazi right robber replied it means that if a ritually defiled Nazi right threw it under the pot of the guilt offerings his obligation would be discharged how do we know this robber replied the verse says which is under the sacrifice of the peace offering signifying that part of its sacrifice should be underneath it but if he threw it under the cauldron containing the sin offering or the guilt offering his obligation would also be discharged why the verse says the sacrifice of thereby including the sin offering and the guilt offering but have you not made use of the words the sacrifice of for the rule concerning the broth if that is its whole significance the verse should have said of the broth of the peace offerings why then does it say the sacrifice of clearly to include the sin offering and the guilt offering but perhaps its whole significance is this inference of the sin offering and the guilt offering if so the verse should have Read the peace offering or the sacrifice. Why does it say the sacrifice of the peace offering? We are thus entitled to and for both things. Our rabbis taught all Nazi rites through their hair beneath the cauldron, with the exception of a defiled Nazi rite who pulled in the province because his hair had to be buried. This is the opinion of our Meir. Our Judah said ritually clean Nazi rites, whether in the one place or the other, threw it under ritually defiled Nazi rites, whether in the one place or the other. Did not throw it under, whilst the sages said none threw it under the cauldron, excepting a clean Nazi rite who pulled in the sanctuary because the pulling had then been properly done in the prescribed manner. Mishnah he either boiled or half boiled the peace offering. The priest then took the boiled shoulder of the ram and unleavened cake from the basket and an unleavened wafer placed them on the Nazirel tents and waved them after this. The Nazi rite was allowed to drink wine and defile himself. For the dead Talmud, Mas Nazir A.R. Simeon said that as soon as one kind of blood had been sprinkled on his behalf, the Nazi right could drink wine and defile himself. For the dead Gemara, our rabbis taught, and after that the Nazi right may drink wine means after
Then when we are taught this is the law of the Nazi right signifies whether he has hair or not would this also mean that polling can be dispensed with or are we not taught further evolved Nazi right say Beth Shammai need not pass a razor over his head whereas Beth Hillel say that he must pass a razor over his head and Rubin has explained that Beth Shammai's need not signifies that he has no remedy whilst in Beth Hillel's view there is a remedy the above interpretation by Rubin of the Beritha. Agrees with that of our Petath for our Petath has said that Beth Shammai in this Beritha and our Eliezer hold the same opinion the dictum of our Eliezer referred to is the following it has been taught if the leper has no right thumb or great toe he can never become clean this is the opinion of our Eliezer our Simeon said that the blood should be put on their place and this would be valid whilst the sages said that it should be put on his left thumb and great toe and this would be valid. Another version Rabbah said the right of waving in the case of the Nazi right is indispensable whose opinion does this follow shall I say that of our Eliezer it would be obvious since our Eliezer said that the Nazi right cannot drink wine until after the completion of all that has to be done therefore it must be that of the rabbis but seeing that the rabbis say that polling itself is not indispensable certainly the waving which follows polling can be dispensed with but can it be dispensed with has it not been taught this is the law of the Nazi right signifies whether he has hands or no but then when we are taught this is the law of the Nazi right signifies whether he has hair or no would this also mean that polling is indispensable have we not been taught further evolved Nazi right say Beth Shammai need not pass a razor over his head whilst Beth Hillel say that he must pass a razor over his head our Avinah replied must according to Beth Hillel signifies that he has no remedy whereas according to Beth Shammai he has a remedy this interpretation of the Beritha by our Abana differs from that of our Petath Mishnah should he pull after one of the sacrifices and this be found invalid his polling is invalid and his sacrifices do not count but should he pull after the sin offering which was not offered as such and then offer the other sacrifices under their correct designations his polling is invalid and none of his sacrifices counts for him similarly should he pull after the burnt offering or the peace offering which have not been offered as such and then offer the other sacrifices under their correct designation his polling is invalid and none of his sacrifices counts for him our Simeon said that particular sacrifice does not count but his other sacrifices do count should he pull after all three sacrifices and one of them be found valid his polling is valid and he has only to bring the other sacrifices Gemara our Adabi Ahabah said this Mishnah tells us that our Simeon is of the opinion that a Nazi right who pulls after offering a voluntary peace offering has fulfilled his religious obligation why is this so because the verse says and put it on the fire which is under the sacrifice of peace offerings and not his peace offerings Talmud, Mas Nazir or Mishnah if a Nazi right on whose behalf one kind of blood has been sprinkled becomes unclean our Eliezer said everything is rendered void whilst the sages said he is to bring his remaining sacrifices after purification. They said to our Eliezer it is related of Miriam of Tarmat that one kind of blood was sprinkled on her behalf when she was told that her daughter was dangerously ill she went and found her dead and the sages told her to offer her remaining sacrifices after purification Gemara the Mishnah says our Eliezer said everything is rendered void but our Eliezer has said that whatever occurs after the fulfillment of the Nazi right period renders void seven days Rab replied by is rendered void here our Eliezer means renders his sacrifices void this is also clear from the sequel is whilst the sages said he is to bring his remaining sacrifices after purification it is related further of Miriam of Tarmat that one kind of blood was sprinkled on her behalf when she was told that her daughter was dangerously ill she went and found her dead and the sages told her to offer the remaining sacrifices after purification this proves that C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V-I-I -E Mishnah high priest and a Nazi right may not defile themselves by contact with their dead relatives but they may D-E-F-L-L-E themselves with a Mehmet's wife if they were walking by the way and found a Mehmet's wife our Eliezer says that the high priest should defile himself but not the Nazi right but the sages say the Nazi right should defile himself but not the common priest our Eliezer said to them rather should the priest who does not offer a sacrifice on defilement defile himself than the Nazi right who must offer a sacrifice on defilement they replied Rather should the Nazi right whose consecration is not permanent defile himself than the priest whose consecration is permanent Gemara it is clear that as between the high priest and the Nazi right the one authority is of the opinion that the high priest is of superior sanctity and the other that the Nazi right is of superior sanctity as between the high priest anointed with the anointing oil Talmud, Mas Nazir B and one consecrated by wearing the additional garments the former is of superior sanctity for the former must offer the bullet brought for breach of any of all the commandments but the latter cannot offer it as between an anointed high priest who has been superseded and one consecrated by wearing the additional garments the latter is of superior sanctity for he performs the temple service whilst the former is not permitted to perform the temple service as between one superseded on account of a nocturnal mishap and one superseded on account of a deformity the former is of superior sanctity for he will be fit to perform the temple service on the morrow whilst the one superseded on account of his deformity is not fit to perform the temple service the question was propounded as between the high priest anointed for a war and the deputy high priest which is of superior sanctity does the high priest anointed for war take precedence because he is qualified to go to war or does the deputy take precedence because he is qualified to perform the temple service come and here for it has been taught the only difference between a high priest anointed for war and a deputy is that if they were both walking by the way and encountered a meth the high priest anointed for war is to defile himself but not the deputy but has it not been taught a high priest anointed for war takes precedence of a deputy marzitra replied as far as saving his life is concerned the high priest anointed for war has a superior claim for many people depend upon him but as regards defilement the deputy is of superior sanctity as has been taught our Hanabi Antigona said that the reason the office of deputy to the high priest was created was that should any disqualification happen to him the high priest he can enter and minister in his stead now Eliezer and the sages differ only as regards a high priest and a Nazi right walking together but each one by himself would be required to defile himself how is it known that this is so our rabbis have taught you what does the passage neither shall he go into any dead body refer it can hardly be to strangers since this could be inferred a fortiori by the following argument seeing that a common priest who is allowed to contract defilement in the case of kinsmen is forbidden to do so in the case of strangers the high priest who is not permitted to contract defilement in the case of kinsmen should certainly not be permitted to do so in the case of strangers it follows that the passage refers to kinsmen and when therefore the text says nor for his father is he permitted to defile himself we infer that he is permitted to defile himself in the case of a corpse the burial of which is a religious duty Talmud, Mas Nazir the words nor for his mother form the basis of the Gezirah used by Rabbi for it has been taught Rabbi said in the case of a Nazi right when they die he is not allowed to defile himself on their account but he may defile himself if they are unclean through leprous plague or unclean issue but this covers the Nazi right only how are we to infer the same for a high priest as follows there is no need for the expression his mother in the case of the high priest and scripture need not have mentioned this since the same may be derived from the following a fortiori argument seeing that though a common priest may defile himself on account of his brother by the same father yet a high priest may not defile himself on account of his father then if a common priest may not defile himself on account of his brother by the same mother surely it follows that a high priest may not defile himself on account of his mother since this can be inferred by a process of reasoning why does scripture mention his mother in connection with the high priest it is available for purpose of comparison and to set up a gazer from like expressions the phrase his mother occurs in connection with the nazi right and the phrase his mother occurs in connection with the high priest and so just as in the case of the nazi right it is to his mother etc when they die that he is forbidden to defile himself but not when they are unclean through leprosy or unclean tissue so in the case of the high priest it is to his mother etc when they die that he is forbidden to defile himself but not when they are unclean through leprosy or unclean issue we have thus found the sanction for a high priest how is the same known of a nazi right it has been taught from the passage all the Days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall not come near to a dead body. Nefesh, it might be concluded that even the body nefesh of an animal is intended. The word nefesh being used as in the verse, and he that smite the nefesh of a
Inference is that he may not defile himself for his father or for his mother but he may defile himself for other corpses This follows by an argument of fortiori seeing that a common priest who may defile himself for his kinsman is forbidden to defile himself for other dead and a Nazirite who may not defile himself for kinsman is surely forbidden to defile himself for other dead Talmud, Mas Nazir B and so why does scripture say for his father or for his mother for his father or for his mother? He is forbidden to defile himself but he may defile himself for a methmizwa but even if this were not written he could infer it as follows a general prohibition is stated for the high priest and a general prohibition is stated for the Nazi right and so just as though there is a general prohibition for the high priest he is forbidden to defile himself for his father but he may defile himself for a methmizwa so when there is a general prohibition for the Nazi right it signifies that he may not defile himself for his father but he may defile himself for a methmizwa but it is possible to argue in another direction a general prohibition is stated for the common priest and a general prohibition is stated for the Nazi right and so just as though there is a general prohibition stated for the common priest he may defile himself for his father so too though there is a general prohibition stated for the Nazi right he may defile himself for his father scripture therefore says he shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother but he may make himself unclean for a methmizwa but surely this is needed to tell us the plain fact that he may not defile himself for his father in point of fact for his father tells us that he may not defile himself for his father for his brother he may not defile himself but he may defile himself for a corpse the burial of which is a religious duty or for his mother is used to form the basis of exertion while after the matter of rabbi whilst or for his sister is required for the following teaching for it has been taught for what purpose is for his sister mentioned if a nazi right was on his way to slaughter his paschal lamb or to circumcise his son and he heard that a near kinsman had died it might be thought that he ought to defile himself it therefore says he shall not make himself unclean but it might then be thought he should not defile himself for a methmizwa the text therefore adds for his sister implying that for his sister he is forbidden to defile himself but he may defile himself for a methmizwa our akiva said nefesh body refers to strangers dead to kinsmen for his father or for his mother teaches that he is forbidden to defile himself for these but he may defile himself for a methmizwa for his brother tells us that if he both high priest and a nazi right it is for his brother that he is forbidden to defile himself but he may defile himself for a corpse the burial of which is a Religious duty for his sister is required as has been taught if a man was on his way to slaughter his paschal lamb or circumcise his son etc. Whence does our Akiva derive the lesson learned by Rabbi from the Gezerah Shawah he will reply since it has been said that if he be both high priest and a Nazi right it is for his brother that he is forbidden to defile himself but he may defile himself for a methmizwa what difference does it make whether he is simply high priest or high priest and a Nazi right and whence does our Ishmael derive the rule about a high priest who is a Nazi right since the Almerciful allows the breach of a single prohibition in connection with a methmizwa what does it matter whether there is only one prohibition or two in that case for what purpose is for his sister required you might assume that in connection with a methmizwa the Almerciful permitted the defilement of a Nazi right and a priest because this is an offense which is merely prohibited but where the neglect of circumcision and the paschal lamb entailing karath is involved the Nazi right or priest should not defile himself for a methmizwa and so we are told that he should talmud, mas nazir on the view of our akiva seeing that whether he be simply a high priest or whether he be a high priest who is also a Nazi right we can infer from for his brother that he may defile himself for a neglected corpse what is the purpose of for his father and for his mother they are both necessary for were only his father mentioned it might be thought that the reason why he may not defile himself for him is that there is merely a presumption of paternity whereas for his mother who we know bore him he should defile himself again if the all merciful had mentioned his mother it might be thought that he may not defile himself for his mother because her children as descent is not reckoned through her whereas for his father since it has been affirmed by their families by their Father's houses, it might be said that he should defile himself. We are therefore told that he may defile himself for neither on the view of our Akiba. What is the purpose of neither shall he go into any dead body? Talmud, Mas Nazir B to any excludes strangers, dead excludes kinsmen, body Nafshah excludes a quarter of a log of blood coming from two corpses and informs us that it renders unclean by being under a covering with it as it is written, neither shall he go into any dead body. Nafshah Mishnah the Nazi right must pull for defilement contracted from the following sources of defilement for a corpse or an olive's bulk of the flesh of a corpse or an olive's bulk of nezzle or a ladle full of corpse mold or the spinal column or the skull or any limb severed from a corpse or any limb severed from a living body that is still properly covered with flesh or a half cap of bones or a half log of blood, whether the defilement is contracted from contact with them from. Carrying them or from overshadowing them for defilement contracted from a barley grain's bulk of bone whether by contact or carrying on account of these a Nazirite must pull and be sprinkled on the third and seventh day such defilement makes void the previous period whilst he does not begin to count anew his Nazirite ship until he has become clean and brought his sacrifices Gemara our rabbis taught after the demise of our Meir our Judah said to his disciples do not allow the disciples of our Meir to enter here for they are disputatious and do not come to learn Torah but come to overwhelm me with citations from tradition Simicus forced his way through and entered he said to them thus did our Meir teach me the Nazirite must pull for defilement contracted from the following sources of defilement for a corpses or for an olive's bulk of the flesh of a corpse our Judah was wrath and said to them did I not tell you not to allow the pupils of our Meir to enter here because they are Disputatious if he must pull for an olive's bulk of the flesh of the corpse and certainly he must pull for the corpse itself Talmud, Mas Nazir A.R. Jose commented people will say Meir is dead Judah is angry Jose is silent what is to become of the Torah and so our Jose explained it was only necessary to mention the corpse itself explicitly for the case of a corpse that has not an olive's bulk of flesh upon it but it can still be objected if the Nazi right must pull for a single limb then. Surely he must pull for the whole skeleton it must therefore be as our Yohanan explained elsewhere that it was only necessary to mention the corpse itself for the case of an abortion in which the limbs were not bound together by the sinews and here too it refers to an abortion in which the limbs are not bound together by the sinews Rabbah said it is only necessary to mention the corpse itself for the case where there is a greater part of the frame of a corpse or the majority of its. Bones which do not amount altogether to a quarter cab of bones for an olive's bulk of the flesh of a corpse or an olive's bulk of nestle and what is nestle the flesh of a corpse that has coagulated and liquid secretion from a corpse that has been heated and has congealed what are the circumstances if it be not known to belong to the corpse what does it matter if it has coagulated whilst if we know that it pertains to the corpse then even though it has not coagulated it should defile. Our Jeremiah replied secretion of uncertain origin is referred to if it coagulates it is cadaverous secretion otherwise it may be phlegm or mucus have inquired of rabbi is there defilement through corpse drakes in the case of defilement caused by animals corpses or not was the tradition only that corpse drakes coming from man defile but not corpse drakes coming from animals or is there no difference according to the opinion that the uncleanness is of the heavier type only until the Animal is unfit to be eaten by a stranger and is then of the lighter type until it is unfit to be eaten by a dog. There is no difficulty, but according to the opinion that the uncleanness remains of the heavier type until it is unfit to be eaten by a dog, what answer can be given? Come and here if he melted unclean fat with fire, it remains unclean, but if in the sun it becomes clean. Now, if you assume that the animal remains unclean until it is unfit to be eaten by a dog, then even if it fat has been melted in the sun, it should also remain unclean. It only melts after it has decomposed in the sun, and since it has decomposed, it is nothing but dust. We have learned elsewhere any jet of liquid poured from a clean to an unclean vessel is clean, save only a jet of thick honey and heavy batter. Talmud, Mas Nazir B. Betcham, I say also one of the porridge of grist or beans because at the end of its flow it springs back. Ram I. B. Have asked is there transference of defilement? Through a jet in the case of foodstuffs or does transference of defilement through a jet not apply to foodstuffs do we say that the principle applies to thick honey and batter because they contain liquor whereas foodstuffs contain
means the hollow of the handful. Now, are you at least agrees with the rabbis, but with whom does Hezekiah agree? Neither with our mayor nor with the rabbis. I will tell you the palm of the handful, and from the joints of the fingers upwards is the same measure. Our Shimai Biata said to our Papa, How is it known that from the joints of the fingers and upwards means towards the tips? Perhaps it means lower down the hand when the measure is the palm of the handful. This was not solved. Talmud, Moss. Nazir, our rabbis taught what type of corpse produces corpse mold that can defile a corpse buried naked in a marble sarcophagus or on a stone floor is a corpse which produces corpse mold if it is buried in its shroud or in a wooden coffin or on a brick floor it is a corpse which does not produce corpse mold that can defile a said corpse mold to defile must come from flesh and sinew and bone robber raised the following objection to Allah it has been taught corpse mold derived from flesh is clean this implies that if it be from bones it is unclean even though there be no flesh present say rather as follows corpse mold derived from flesh is clean unless there be bone in the flesh but there are no sinews it is impossible that there should be flesh and bones without sinews rab samuel b abba said that our yohan and said two corpses buried together act as guilt to each other our nathan son of our Ashai raised the following objection it has been taught that corpse mold Derived from two corpses is unclean, said Rabbi. We suppose that each was buried separately and decayed and together formed a little full of corpse mold. Rabbi Barhana said that our Yohanan said if a man cut the corpse's hair and buried it with it, it acts as gilgelin and the resultant mold does not defile. We have learned elsewhere every part of a corpse is unclean except the teeth, the hair, and the nails, but whilst still attached to the corpse, they are all unclean. Hezekiah propounded what? Is the law in the case of hair long enough to be pulled and nails long enough to be pared? Do we say that anything which is fit to be cut is as though already cut, or perhaps they are after all still attached, but cannot the question be resolved from the dictum of Rabbi Barhana? The reason that the hair acts as gilgelin is because he cut it, but if he does not cut it, it does not. He Rabbi Barhana might have meant this if he cut it, it acts as gilgelin, but if he did not cut it, he was. In doubt as to its effect, our Jeremiah propounded what is the law regarding corpse mold coming from the heel. Does our tradition specify corpse mold derived from a whole corpse but not corpse mold resulting from the decomposition of the heel, or is there no difference? Come and here, our Nathan son of our Ashai learned that corpse mold derived from two corpses is unclean. Now, if you assume that what comes from the heel is not counted as corpse mold, and if we look to the one corpse, the mold in the mixture may have been taken from the heel, and if to the other it may have been taken from the heel where the whole corpse has decayed and the corpse mold has been taken from the heel, there it would certainly be counted as corpse mold. But here the question is when one limb has decomposed and the mold has been taken from the heel, this was left unsolved. Our Jeremiah propounded does a fetus in a woman's womb act as Gilgelin or not, since a master has affirmed that a fetus counts as. The thigh of its mother is it therefore part of her body and so does not act as Gilgelin or perhaps since it would eventually leave the womb does it count as separated from her should you decide that since a fetus will eventually leave the womb it is separate from her Talmud, Mas Nazir be what would be the law regarding semen in a woman as womb do we say that because it has not yet formed into an embryo it counts as part of her body or perhaps seeing it has come from elsewhere it is not part of the body our Papa propounded what about excrement seeing that one cannot exist without food is it part of one's life or perhaps this too comes from elsewhere our Aha son of our Ika propounded what about his skin our Hunabimano propounded what about his phlegm and his mucus our Samuel Biaha said to our Papa if now you assume that all these mentioned act as Gilgelin how can there be corpse mold which defile if he was given to drink water from the well of the palm trees depilated with nausea? And was steeped in the hot springs of Tiberius. Abbe said, We hold a tradition that a corpse that has been ground to powder does not come under the law of corpse mold. The following was propounded if it were ground and then decayed. What would be the law is the reason that corpse mold defiles solely because flesh and bones and sinews are present and here they are present, or do we require it to have become corpse mold as in its original form and this has not occurred? This was left. Unsolved Ulubi Hanan learned a defective corpse does not come under the law of corpse dust, nor does it acquire the soil on which it lies, nor does it help to make an area into a graveyard. The following objection was raised. We have learned no because you say this of a corpse to which the law concerning the greater part of quarter cab and a little full of corpse mold applies. Would you say it of a living body to which the laws concerning the greater part of quarter cab of bones and a Little full of corpse mold do not apply. What are the circumstances? Surely that one limb has decayed, and similarly in the case of a corpse, even if one member has decomposed, the law of corpse dust applies. Does it say whereas in the case of a corpse, the law of corpse dust applies? What we are told is that there are corpses to which the law of corpse dust applies, but there are no living bodies to which the law of corpse dust applies. Rabbi propounded if a man's limb decayed whilst he was alive and he then died, what would the law be? Does the tradition specify corpse mold which decayed when he was dead, or perhaps it is enough that he is now dead? Come and hear the following. We have learned no because you say this of a corpse to which the laws concerning the greater part of quarter cab of bones and a little full of corpse mold apply. Would you say it of a living body, etc.? The reason that the law of corpse mold does not apply to a living body is because it is alive from which. We infer that if he died, the law of corpse mold would apply. Does it say whereas if he died, the law of corpse mold applies? What we are told is that there are corpses to which the law of corpse mold applies, but there are no living bodies to which the law of corpse mold applies. Rabbi propounded what is the law concerning a defective ant? Does the tradition specify a certain size and this is wanting, or does it specify a separate creature and this it is Talmud? Mas Nazir A.R. Judah. Discard a reply judge from the following. It has been taught from the verse whosoever doth touch them shall be unclean. It might be thought that this is only if he touches whole reptiles, and so scripture says, and upon whatsoever any of them doth fall from of them alone, it might be thought that part of them defile, and so scripture says, them how are the texts to be reconciled? He is not unclean unless he touches a part of one equivalent to a whole one and the sages. Estimated this to be the size of a lentil since the sand lizard at its first formation is of the size of a lentil hence it follows that tradition specifies a certain size or she may the reason that we require a particular size so that if it is not the size of a lentil it does not defile is because there is no life in it but when there is life in it it may be that no minimum size is required it is this question that is being put to you the backbone and the skull the question was propounded does the mission say the backbone and the skull or does it say perhaps the backbone or the skull robber reply come and here a backbone that has been stripped of most of its ribs is clean but if it is in the grave even though it is broken in pieces or separated into parts it is unclean because of the grave now the reason that the backbone is clean is that it has been stripped but if it were not stripped it would be unclean and so may we not infer from this that the correct Reading is either the backbone or the skull does it say but if etc. What we are told is that when the backbone is stripped it is clean but the other case still remains doubtful. Come and here our Judah says six things were declared unclean by our Akiba and clean by the sages and our Akiba retracted his opinion. It is related that a basket full of human bones was taken into the synagogue of the Tarsians and placed in the open air and theaters the physician together with all the physicians entered and said that there was not the backbone of a single corpse there. The reason that it was declared clean is that there was not a backbone from a single corpse but had there been either a backbone or a skull from a single corpse a Nazi right would have been required to pull because of it once it follows that we read in our mission either the backbone or the skull the case was put strongly not only was there not the backbone and skull of a single corpse but there was not even the backbone of a single corpse or the skull of a single corpse judge from the enumeration of the six things and what are the six things that our Akiva declared unclean and the sages clean a limb set up from two corpses a limb set up from bone severed from two living men and a half cap of bones taken from two corpses a quarter log of blood taken from two corpses a barley corn's bulk of bone broken into two parts the backbone and the skull Talmud Mas Nazir be now if you assume that either the backbone or the skull alone is unclean there would surely be seven things there when the number six was mentioned it referred to all those things where the majority differed from him but excluded the case of a barley corn's bulk of bone since it is an individual who differed from him for we have learned
Shoulder since this is a major part of a man's structure in high whilst Beth Hillel say the quarter cab must be taken from the corpse is from the greater part either in structure or in number for this numerical majority is to be found in the joints of the hands and feet Shammai says even a single bone from the backbone or from the skull defies by overshadowing Shammai is different as he takes a more stringent view can one infer from this that Shammai's reason is that he takes the stricter view but the rabbis would require both backbone and skull no for the rabbis may only disagree with Shammai concerning a single bone coming from the backbone or the skull but where these are complete one alone may be sufficient Rami Behama propounded what is the law in the case of a quarter cab of bones coming from the backbone and the skull when our mission is stated that a half cab of bones is required was it only where there are present bones from its other limbs too. But since the bones from the backbone and skull are treated more seriously, even a quarter cab of bones is sufficient, or perhaps there is no difference. Rob reply, come in here. We learned the backbone and the skull. Now, if you assume that a quarter cab of bones coming from the backbone and the skull is to be taken more seriously, it should stay for a quarter cab of bones coming from the backbone, etc. Talmud, Mas Nazir, but it was Rabba himself who said that special mention was required only for a backbone and a skull containing less than a quarter cab of bones. After hearing our active's opinion, he altered his own opinion. Come in here, Shammai says, even a single bone from the backbone or from the skull defiled by overshadowing Shammai is different, for he takes a much more stringent view. Can we infer from this that Shammai's reason is that he is strict, but according to the rabbis, there is no defilement by overshadowing unless there is a half cab of bones. Perhaps the rabbis only disagree with Shammai where there is a single bone but where there is a quarter cab of bones even the rabbis agree that this is sufficient our Eliezer said the elders of an earlier generation were divided some used to say that a half cab of bones and a half log of blood is required for everything whilst a quarter cab of bones and a quarter log of blood is not sufficient for anything others used to say that even a quarter cab of bones and a quarter log of blood is enough for everything the court that came after them said that a half cab of bones and a half log of blood is the quantity for making unclean everything a quarter cab of bones and a quarter log of blood is sufficient in the case of terima and sacred meats but not in the case of a Nazi right or one preparing the paschal lamb but surely the compromise of the third opinion is no true compromise or Jacob B.E.D. replied they had it as a tradition deriving from Haggai. Zechariah and Malachi on account of these a Nazi right must pull the word these in the first clause serves to exclude a barley corn's bulk of bone for touching or carrying which he must pull though not for overshadowing it the word these in the next clause serves to exclude a rock overhanging a grave or a half cab of bones Talmud, Mas Nazir B we see that only if there is a half cab of bones must the Nazi right pull but not if there is a quarter cab of bones what are the circumstances for? If we assert that there are amongst them bones of the barley corn in size then we can give as the reason that the Nazi right must pull the presence of the barley corn's bulk of bone the reference is to where the bone was crushed into powder or any limb severed from a corpse or any limb severed from a living body that is still properly covered with flesh what are the consequences if sufficient flesh is not attached and a Nazi right is defiled by touching or carrying such a bone are Yohanan? Said that the Nazi right is not required to pull because of them. Rush Lakish said that the Nazi right must pull because of them. Or Yohanan said that the Nazi right is not required to pull because of them. For it says in the first mission only any limb severed from a corpse or any limb severed from a living body that is still properly covered with flesh implying but not otherwise. Whilst Rush Lakish said that he must pull since this case is not mentioned in the subsequent mission to the argument of Rush Lakish. Or Yohanan will reply that whatever can be inferred from the rule of our mission is not mentioned in the subsequent mission but what of the half cab of bones mentioned in our mission which implies that only half a cab of bones can defile but not a quarter cab of bones. And yet the subsequent mission mentions explicitly that a quarter cab of bones do not defile in that instance where a quarter cab of bones not mentioned. I should have thought that he need not pull even if defiled through contact with it or carrying it and so the Mishnah had to mention the case of a quarter cab of bones in order to teach that it is only for overshadowing them that the Nazi right is not required to pull but what of the half log of blood mentioned in our Mishnah from which it may be inferred that only if the Nazi right is defiled by overshadowing a half log of blood is he required to pull but not by a quarter log of blood and yet the subsequent Mishnah mentions explicitly that a quarter log of blood does not defile in that case the purpose of mentioning it in the next Mishnah is to descend from the view of our Akiva for our Akiva has stated that a quarter log of blood coming from two corpses conveys defilement by overshadowing how are we to picture this limb severed from a corpse for if it has a bone of a barley corn's bulk what is our Yohanan's reason for saying that a Nazi right need not pull if he touches it whilst if it has not a bone of the barley corn's bulk what is Rush Lakish reason for saying that the Nazi right must pull if he touches it Rush Lakish will reply that in point of fact it has not a bone of the barley corn's bulk and in spite of this the Almerciful has included it amongst the things which cause defilement for it has been taught the verse and whosoever in the open field touches one that is slain with a sword or one that dieth of himself shall be unclean seven days has the following significance in the open field refers to one who overshadows a corpse one that is slain refers to a limb severed from a living body which is in such condition that if attached to the body it could have been restored a sword signifies that this is of the same degree of defilement as the slain body or one that dieth of himself refers to a limb severed from a corpse or a bone of a man refers to a quarter cab of bones or a grave refers to a close grave Talmud, Mas Nazir for a master. Said that defilement breaks through the ground and ascends and breaks through the ground and descends thus far defilement by overshadowing has been discussed whilst as regards defilement by contact Rab Judah said that it has been taught the verse and upon him that touched the bone or the slain etc. has the following significance the bone refers to a barley corn's bulk of bone or the slain refers to a limb severed from a living body which is not in such condition that if attached to the body it could have been restored or the dead refers to a limb severed from a corpse or the grave refers said rush lakish to the grave of those buried before the revelation at Sinai now what is meant by a limb severed from a corpse for if it has a bone of a barley corn's bulk it is covered by the rule concerning one who touches a bone we must therefore suppose that it has not a bone of a barley corn's bulk and in spite of this the all merciful law has included it amongst the Things whose contact defile are Yohanan on the other hand will say that in point of fact the limb severed from a corpse has a barley corn's bulk of bone in it and if the verse is unnecessary for teaching that the limb defiled by contact you can use it to teach that it defiles through carrying and be sprinkled on the third and seventh days and it makes void etc. The question was propounded when the Mishnah teaches until he has become clean does it refer to the seventh day meaning until after sunset so that the author is our Eliezer or does it perhaps refer to the eighth day the words until he has become clean meaning until he has brought his sacrifices so that it gives the view of the rabbis judge from the following since it teaches in the subsequent Mishnah that he commences to count immediately after purification it follows that until he has become clean in the first Mishnah means until he has brought his sacrifices and the ruling is that of the rabbis who assert that Nazi rightship after purification does not operate until the eighth day mission but for defilement caused by Seka Koth overhanging boughs or Peroth protruding bricks or a field that is a Bethpris or land of the Gentiles or the Golal covering stone or Dofexide stones of a tomb or a quarter log of blood or a tent in which is a corpse or a quarter cab of bones or utensils that have been in contact with the corpse or the defilement of a leper's tale of days or his period of declared leprosy for all these the Nazi right is not required to pull he must however be sprinkled on the third and seventh days Talmud, Mas Nazir B whilst the Uncle Anas does not render void the former period but he commences to resume counting his Nazarite ship immediately after purification and there is no sacrifice the sages said in fact that the days of defilement of a male or female sufferer from Gonorrhea and the days that a leper is shut up are reckoned as part of it. Nazarite Heshep Gemara by Sikakoth is meant a tree that overhangs the ground and by Peroth protrusions from a fence or land of the Gentiles. The question was propounded Did the rabbis enact that the land of the Gentiles causes defilement because of the air or did they perhaps enact only because of the
That a tent in motion is still counted a tent whilst the former holds that a tent in motion does not constitute a tent but have we not been taught our Jose son of our Judah says that if a chest is full of utensils and someone throws it in front of a corpse in a tent it becomes unclean whilst if it were there already in the tent it remains clean it must therefore be that both Rabbi and our Jose son of our Judah agree that foreign countries defile because of the air the latter holds that sense. Traveling in a chest is not common the rabbis did not intend the enactment to apply to such a case whilst the former holds that although it is unusual the rabbis intended the enactment to apply to it it has been taught to the same effect a person who enters a foreign country in a box or a chest or a portable turret remains clean whilst if he enters in a carriage or a boat or a ship with a mask he becomes unclean alternatively rabbi and our Jose son of our Judah may disagree here on it. Question whether a man traveling in a chest was declared unclean for fear lest he put out his beat or the greater part of his body it has been taught to this effect our Jose son of our Judah says a person who enters a foreign country in a box or a chest or a portable turret is clean until he puts out his head or the greater part of his body but he commences to resume counting immediately etc our Hista said it was taught that the days of declared leprosy are not counted only in the case of a short Nazi rightship but in the case of a long Nazi rightship they also help to discharge the days of his Nazi rightship. Arsha Rabia objected he commences to resume counting immediately and does not in all the previous period what are the circumstances for if it is speaking of a short Nazi rightship he requires 30 days growth of hair Talmud, Mas Nazir B and so it surely refers to a long Nazi rightship and yet it teaches that he commences to count immediately Arsha Rabia put the question and answered it himself the Mishnah is speaking of a Nazi rightship of say 50 days of which he had observed 20 days when he became leprous he must then pull for his leprosy when he is healed and observe a further 30 days of the Nazi right obligation in which case he has a 30 days growth of hair Rami B Mama raised the following objection we have learned a Nazi right who was in doubt whether he had been defiled and in doubt whether he had been a declared leper Talmud, Mas Nazir May eat sacred meats after 60 days and drink wine and touch the dead after 120 days in connection with this passage it has been taught this is only true of a short Nazi right ship but in the case of a Nazi right ship of say a year he may eat sacred meats only after 2 years and drink wine and touch the dead after 4 years now if you suppose that the days of declared leprosy help to discharge his Nazi right ship then 3 years and 30 days should be enough Arashi. Raise the following objection I am only told that the days of his defilement are not reckoned in the number of days of his Nazi right ship how do we know that the same is true of the days of his declared leprosy this follows by analogy after the days of defilement he must pull and bring an offering and after the days of his declared leprosy he must pull and bring an offering whence we should infer that just as the days of his defilement are not reckoned in the number of days of his Nazi right ship so the days of his declared leprosy are not reckoned in the number no if you say this of the days of his defilement where the previous days are rendered void because of them would you also say it of the days of his declared leprosy where the previous days are not rendered void because of them I can argue then in the following manner seeing that a Nazi right who undertakes his Nazi right ship at the graveside whose hair is right for polling because of his Nazi right ship does not count. The time spent at the grave in the number of days of his Nazi right ship surely the days of his declared leprosy when his hair is not right for polling because of the Nazi right ship should not be counted in this way we may only infer that the period of his declared leprosy may not be counted how do we know that the same is true of his tale of days this follows by analogy Talmud, Mas Nazir be just as after the days of his declared leprosy he must pull so after his tale of days he must pull. And so just as the days of his declared leprosy are not reckoned in the number of days of his Nazi rightship so his tale of days are not counted it might be thought that the same is true of the days that he is shut up and this too could be derived by analogy a declared leper defile both couch and seat and during the days that he is shut up he defies both couch and seat and so if you infer that the days of his declared leprosy are not counted in the number of days of his Nazi rightship. Neither should the days when he is shut up be counted in the number but this is not so if it is true of the days of his declared leprosy that the days are not counted it is because after his declared leprosy he must pull and bring an offering and therefore they are not counted whereas since after the days that he is shut up he does not need to pull nor need he bring an offering therefore they can be counted in the number of days of his Nazi rightship from these arguments the rabbis. Inferred that the days of the lepers telling and the days of his declared leprosy are not counted in the number of days of his Nazi rightship but the days of defilement of a male or female sufferer from gonorrhea and the days when a leper is shut up are counted now one of the arguments mentioned is no if you say this of the days of his defilement where the previous days are rendered void because of them would you also say it of the days of his declared leprosy where the previous days are not rendered void what kind of Nazi rightship is referred to should it be a short Nazi rightship then we require a 30 days growth of hair and there is not such a growth thus it must be a long Nazi rightship which is referred to and yet it says that they are not reckoned in the number of days of the Nazi rightship from this it follows that the period of declared leprosy is never counted this proves admission our Eliezer said on behalf of our Joshua that every defilement conveyed by a Corpse for which a Nazi right must pull entails a liability for one entering the sanctuary whilst thus defiled and every defilement conveyed by a corpse for which a Nazi right is not required to pull does not entail a liability for one entering the sanctuary while so defiled our said such defilement should not be less serious than defilement through a reptile Gemara did our Eliza receive the statement in the name of our Joshua did he not receive it in the name of our Joshua be metal as has been taught our Eliza said when I went to Articus I found our Joshua be Petharash sitting and expounding points of law in the presence of our one of them was as follows every defilement conveyed by a corpse for which a Nazi right must pull entails a penalty for entering the sanctuary and every defilement arising from a corpse for which a Nazi right is not required to pull does not entail a penalty for entering the sanctuary our said to him such defilement should not be less Stringent than defilement by reptile I then asked our Joshua B. Petharash are you at all versed in the sayings of our Joshua B. Memel he replied I am thus did our Joshua B. Memel tell me in the name of our Joshua every defilement arising from a corpse for which a Nazi right must pull entails a penalty for entering the sanctuary and every defilement arising from a corpse for which a Nazi right is not required to pull does not entail a penalty for entering the sanctuary thus we see that it was in the name of our Joshua B. Memel that our Eliza received it they replied from this it follows that whenever a tradition is transmitted through three men the first and the last name are mentioned whilst the middle name is not mentioned our nom and B. Isaac said we too have learned to the same effect Nahum the scribe said this was transmitted to me from Armisha who received it from his father who received it from the peers who received it from the prophets as a tradition handed to Moses on empty. Sinai if a man who has sown his field with two varieties of wheat collects them on one threshing floor he need leave only one PEA but if he collects them on two threshing floors he must leave two PEAHS now here Joshua and Caleb are not mentioned between Moses and the prophets thus it follows from this that intermediate names may be omitted mission our Akiva said I argued in the presence of our Eliza as follows seeing that a barleycorn's bulk of bone which does not defile a man by overshadowing compels a Nazi right to pull should he touch it or carry it then surely a quarter log of blood which defile a man by overshadowing should cause a Nazi right to pull if he touches it or carries it. if he replied what now Akiva to argue from the lesser to the greater is not permitted in this instance when I afterwards went and recounted these words to our Joshua he said to me your argument was sound but in this case this has been declared as a filed halachat Talmud, Mas Nazir Gemara. The question was propounded was it the law concerning a barleycorn's bulk of bone that was a halacha and that of the quarter log of blood that was being derived by argument and this is what is meant by saying that an argument from the lesser to the greater is not permitted in the case of a halacha or was it the law concerning a quarter log of blood that was a halacha while the law concerning a barleycorn's bulk of bone was simply used for the argument and this is what is meant by saying that an argument from the lesser to the greater is not permitted in the case of a halacha come and here it has been taught the rulings concerning a barleycorn's bulk of bone is a halacha the rulings of a quarter log of
In the private domain is it not from the regulations regarding a faithless wife whence it may be inferred that just as in the case of a faithless wife only the lover and his mistress are together so in every case of doubtful defilement in the private domain the defilement is assumed to be definite only if there were but two persons present whereas in the present instance the two Nazi rights and the one standing near make three so that it becomes the same as a case of doubtful defilement. In the public domain and the rule is every case of doubtful defilement in the public domain remains clean. Rabbi son of Arhuna replied the Mishnah assumes that the third person says I saw a source of defilement thrown between you or as she commented this is also indicated in the language of the Mishnah Talmud. Mas Nazir before it says but I do not know which of you it was which proves that he was not in their company they must pull and bring etc but why should they be allowed to pull? Perhaps they are not unclean and they will nevertheless have rounded the corners of the head. Samuel replied the Mishnah is speaking of a woman or a minor. Why does he not regard the Mishnah as speaking of an adult male Nazi right? The rounding of the whole head not being considered an infringement of the prohibition against rounding since he does not do so it follows that Samuel holds that the rounding of the whole head is considered an infringement of the prohibition against. Rounding Marzutra taught this exposition of Samuel with reference to a subsequent mission which reads a Nazi right who was in doubt whether he had been defiled and in doubt whether he had been a certified leper may eat sacred meats after sixty days etc. and must shave four times but why will he not have marred the corners of his beard? Samuel replied the Mishnah is speaking of a woman or a minor Arhuna said one who rounds the head of a minor is guilty Arabi Ahabah said to Arhuna. Then who shaves your children's heads he replied Hoba Rabbah exclaimed does Hoba wish to bury her children during the whole of our Adabi Ahabah's lifetime none of Arhuna's children survived seeing that both Arhuna and Arhuna hold that rounding the whole head is an infringement of the rule against rounding wherein do they differ Arhuna holds that the verse ye shall not round the corners of your heads neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard signifies that to whomsoever. Marring is applicable rounding is applicable and since marring does not apply to women rounding too does not apply to them Arhuna Ahabah on the other hand holds that both he who rounds and he who is rounded are included in the prohibition the one who rounds being compared to the one who is rounded to the effect that wherever the one who is rounded is guilty the one who rounds is also guilty hence since a child is not punishable and so is not guilty of the offense of rounding he who Rounds the child is also not guilty. Can we say that the question of rounding the whole head is the subject of controversy between Tanaim? For our rabbis have taught why does scripture mention his head since it says ye shall not round the corners of your head's Talmud. Mas Nazir, it might be thought that the same is true of a leper. Therefore, scripture says his head and another buried the taught why does scripture mention his head since it says with reference to the Nazi right there shall no razor come upon his head. It might be thought that the same is true of a Nazi right who becomes a leper. Therefore, scripture says his head. Now surely there is here a difference of opinion between Tanaim on the question of rounding the whole head. The Tanaim who refers his head to the Nazi right holding that the rounding of the whole head does not count as rounding and that the purpose of the text is to override the prohibition and positive command incumbent on the Nazi right whilst the other. Tana holds that the rounding of the whole head does count as rounding and the purpose of the verse is to override a simple prohibition said Rabbah it may be that both Tanaim agree that the rounding of the whole head does not count as rounding and the purpose of the verse according to the latter Tana is to permit rounding where he first rounds the corners only and then shaves the rest of the head since he would not be guilty if he shaved it all at the same time he is not guilty if he first rounds the corners and then shaves the rest but could scripture possibly intend this as not Reshlakish said that wherever we find a positive command and a prohibition at variance then if it is possible to observe both well and good otherwise the positive command overrides the prohibition we must therefore say that both Tanaim agree that the rounding of the whole head counts as rounding the corners and that the authority who utilizes the verse is head to prove that a Positive command may override both the prohibition and the positive command infers that a simple prohibition can be overridden from the command to wear twisted cords for the verse says thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff and it has been taught in explanation of this thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff wool and linen together but nevertheless thou shalt make the twisted cords of them why does not the one who infers this rule from his head infer it from twisted cords he will reply that the latter is required for the following dictum of Rabba for Rabba noted the following contradiction it is written and that they put with the fringe of each corner i.e. of the same material as the corner must there be a thread of blue yet it is also written wool and linen together how are these to be reconciled wool and linen discharge the obligation to provide fringes both for garments of their own species and also for other species but other kinds of material discharge this Obligation only for garments of the same species but not for garments of a different species and whence does the Tana who utilizes his head for the inference that a positive command overrides a simple prohibition learn that the positive command overrides both the prohibition and a positive command he infers it from the expression his beard for it has been taught why does scripture mention his beard since it says neither shall they shave off the corners of their beard it might be thought that the same is true of a priest who is a leper and so scripture says his beard why does not the Tana who utilizes his head for teaching that the positive command and prohibition can be overruled by a positive command infer it from the words his beard but according to your view when we have the rule elsewhere Talmud, Mas Nazir be that a positive command cannot override a prohibition accompanied by a positive command let it be inferred from the case of a leprous priest that it can override to this you reply that we can make no inference from the case of a leprous priest because the case of the priest is different since the prohibition overridden does not apply to all people equally so too we are unable to infer the Nazi right leper from the priest leper since the prohibition overridden in the case of the priest does not apply equally to all people now to what use does the Tana who utilizes the phrase his head for the Nazi right leper put it phrase his beard he requires it for the following that has been taught from the verse neither shall they shave off the corners of their beard it might be thought that even if he shaved it with the scissors he would be guilty and so scripture says elsewhere neither shall thou mar the corners of thy beard if it had only written neither shall thou mar it might have been thought that if he plucked it out with tweezers or a rohitney he would be guilty and so scripture says neither shall they shave off the corners of their beard what sort of shaving also mars I should say that this is shaving with a razor now according to the other Tana who utilizes the phrase his head for overriding a simple prohibition why is it necessary to write both his head and his beard for since the expression his head can be understood as implying the overriding of a simple prohibition and it can be understood also as implying the overriding of a prohibition accompanied by a positive command it can be applied indifferently to both and both could be inferred the priest leper cannot be inferred from the Nazi right leper since the latter can secure release from his Nazi right now the Nazi right leper cannot be inferred from the priest leper since the latter prohibition does not apply equally to all people finally we cannot infer from these a rule for other cases since the previously mentioned objections could be raised rap said a man made in the hair of his whole body with a Razor an objection was raised it has been taught one who removes the hair of the armpits or the private parts is to be scourged this refers to removal by a razor whereas the other of rab refers to removal by a scissors but rab also mentions a razor he means closely as though with a razor are high b abbasiding are and said one who removes the hair of the armpits or of the private parts is to be scourged an objection was raised it has been taught removal of hair is not forbidden by the Torah but only by the sofrim what he too meant by scourging is scourging inflicted by the rabbis Talmud Mas Nazir others say that the above argument took the following form are high b abbasiding are and said one who removes the hair of the armpits or the private parts is to be scourged because of infringing the prohibition neither shall a man put on a woman's garment an objection was raised we have been taught removal of hair is not forbidden by the Torah but only by the sofrim that statement of Aryohanan agrees with the following Tana for it has been taught one who removes the hair of the armpits or the private parts infringes the prohibition neither shall a man put on a woman's garment what interpretation does the first Tana put on the verse neither shall a man put on a woman's garment he requires it for the following that has been taught why does scripture say a woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man etc if merely to teach that a man should not put on a woman's garment nor a woman a man's garment behold it says of this action this is an abomination
it was permitted some say that he asked him whether he might scratch through his garment during prayers and he replied that it was forbidden but this is not the accepted ruling Talmud. Mas Nazir Bimishan if one of them dies or Joshua said that the other should seek some third person prepared to undertake a Nazirite vow together with him and say if I was defiled you are to be a Nazi right immediately but if I was clean you are to become a Nazi right at the end of 30 days they then count. 30 days and bring sacrifices for defilement and sacrifices due on terminating a Nazirite heship in purity and the first one says if I am the one who was defiled the sacrifices for defilement are mine and the sacrifices in purity are yours whilst if I am the one who remained clean the sacrifices in purity are mine and the sacrifices after defilement are sacrifices offered in doubt they then count a further 30 days and bring one set of the sacrifices in purity and the first one says if I am the one who was defiled the sacrifice for defilement offered previously was mine and the sacrifice in purity was yours and this is my sacrifice in purity whilst if I was the one who remained clean the sacrifice in purity was mine and the sacrifice after defilement was offered in doubt and this is your sacrifice in purity Ben Zoma said to our Joshua who will listen to this man and undertake a Nazarite vow together with him what he must do is to bring a bird as a sign offering and an animal as a burnt offering and say if I was defiled the sin offering I as part of my due and the burnt offering I as a voluntary offering whilst if I remain clean the burnt offering I as part of my due and the sin offering a sacrifice offered in doubt he must then count 30 days and bring the sacrifices in purity and say if I was defiled the former burnt offering was a voluntary one and this is the obligatory one whilst if I remain clean the former burnt offering was the obligatory one and this the voluntary one these others are the rest of my sacrifices are Joshua retorted the result will be that this Nazi right will bring his sacrifices half at a time the sages however agreed with Ben Zio Gamara but let him bring them half at a time Rav Judah citing Samuel said our Joshua only said this in order to sharpen the wits of the students Arnam and said what would our Joshua do with the intestines to prevent them decomposing mission a Nazi right who was in doubt whether he had been defiled and in doubt whether he had been a confirmed leper may eat sacred meats after 60 days and drink wine and touch the dead after 120 days since polling on account of LEPRU's disease overrides the prohibition against the polling of the Nazi right only then the leprosy is certain but when it is doubtful it does not override IT Talmud Mas Nazir Gamara Aitan had taught the procedure laid down in the mission applies only in the case of a short Nazi right ship but in the case of a Nazi right ship of say a year he may eat sacred meats only after two years and drink wine and touch the dead after four years it has been taught further in connection with this he must poll four times at the first polling he brings a pair of birds a bird as a sin offering and an animal as a burnt offering at the second polling he brings a bird as a sin offering and an animal as a burnt offering at the third he again brings a bird as a sin offering and an animal as a burnt Offering at the fourth he brings the sacrifice due on terminating the Nazi right ship in purity it has just been said at the first polling he brings etc. In this way whatever the facts are he offers the correct sacrifice for if he was certainly a leper but was not defiled the pair of birds are in discharge of his obligation the bird as a sin offering is a sacrifice offered in doubt and is to be buried and the burnt offering is a free will offering he cannot however be shaved a second time. Seven days hence for perhaps he is not a confirmed leper and the all merciful has said of the Nazi right there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled if on the other hand he was not certainly a leper but he was defiled then the bird as a sin offering is in discharge of his obligation the pair of birds being prepared without the temple court are not in the category of profane animals brought into the temple court whilst the animal as a burnt offering is a Free will offering finally if he was neither a leper nor defiled then the pair of birds are in any case prepared without the temple court the bird as a sin offering is to be buried and the animal as a burnt offering is in discharge of his obligation as a clean Nazi right but surely he requires a guilt offering the author of this very is our Simeon who says that he brings one and makes a stipulation at the second and third polling a pair of birds is unnecessary for these have been prepared what doubt is there remaining that perhaps he was actually a confirmed leper because of this he offers one of the two birds as a sin offering for the doubt on account of the tale of days and one for the doubt on account of defilement at the fourth polling he brings the sacrifice in purity and stipulates Talmud Mas Nazir be that if he was actually a clean Nazi right the first burnt offering was in discharge of his obligation and the present one is a free will offering whilst if he was defiled and a confirmed leper the first burnt offering was a free will offering and this one is in discharge of his obligation and the other animals are the rest of his sacrifice a Nazi right who was in doubt whether he had been defiled but certainly been a confirmed leper may eat sacred meats after eight days and may drink wine and touch the dead after 67 days one who was in doubt whether he had been a confirmed leper but had certainly been defiled may eat sacred meats after 37 days and may drink wine and touch the dead after 74 days one who was certainly defiled and certainly a confirmed leper may eat sacred meats after eight days and may drink wine and touch the dead after 44 days our Simeon Biohe was asked by his disciples may a ritually clean Nazi right who was a leper pole once only and have it reckoned for both purposes he replied he cannot pull in this way they then asked him why he replied if both the Nazi right and the leper Pulled in order that it should grow again or both pulled in order to remove the hair your suggestion would be sound but as it is the Nazi right poles to remove the hair and the leper poles to let it grow again they then said granted that it should not count for both pullings after the period of confirmed leprosy let it still count for both after his tale of days he replied if both were required to pull before the sprinkling of the blood of the sacrifice your suggestion would be sound but here the leper poles before the sprinkling of the blood and the Nazi right after the sprinkling of the blood they next suggested that though the one polling should not count both for the days of his leprosy and his Nazi right ship yet it ought to count for the days both of his leprosy and of his defilements our Simeon however said to them if both pulled before bathing your proposal would be sound but the defiled Nazi right poles after bathing and the leper before bathing another version of the discussion is as follows they said to him you have given a good reason why two should not count both for his tale of days and for his Nazi right ship but why should not one polling count for his period of confirmed leprosy as well as for his defilement since in both cases the polling is to allow the hair to grow he replied in the case of a ritually clean Nazi right who is a leper the purpose of the one polling is for the hair to grow again and the other is to remove the hair whilst in the case of a defiled Nazi right who is a leper the latter polling takes place before bathing and the former after bathing Talmud Mas Nazir Ar Hayat taught the following differences the leper polls before bathing the unclean Nazi right after bathing the former before the sprinkling of the blood the clean Nazi right after the sprinkling of the blood since polling on account of LEPRU's disease etc Rami Bihama propounded are the four pollings required for carrying out a Religious duty or whether they are merely in order to remove defiled hair the practical issue is whether this may be removed with nasha for if we say that they are a religious duty it would not be permitted to treat the hair with nasha whereas if their purpose is simply the removal of defiled hair treatment with nasha would be permitted what then is the Laura reply come and here and he is required to undergo four pollings now if you assume that their purpose is simply the removal of defiled hair three pollings alone should suffice hence you may prove that they are all religious duty this proves that chapterix mission gentiles have no competence for Nazarite heship but women and slaves have the Nazi right vow is more stringent in the case of women than in the case of slaves for a man can compel his slave to break his vow but he cannot compel his wife to do so Gamara the mission teaches that gentiles have no competence for Nazarite heship etc how do we know this for our rabbis taught scripture says speak unto the children of Israel but not to Gentiles and say unto them thereby including slaves but what need is there of a verse seeing that there is a principle that every precept incumbent on women is also incumbent on slaves robber replied Nazi rightship is different from other laws for there is a verse when a man vowed a vow to bind his soul with a bond which thus refers to one who is his own master and excludes slaves who are not their own masters now because slaves are not their own masters it might be thought that they are precluded from making Nazarite vows and so we are told this is not so the master stated speak unto the children of Israel but not to Gentiles but does
Note that the laws of defilement do not apply to them. The verse says, but the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from the midst of the cattle assembly, referring to such as form a cattle and excluding Gentiles who do not form a cattle. How does it follow that the laws of defilement do not apply to Gentiles? Perhaps all that is meant is that he is not liable to correct excision, but the laws of defilement do apply to him. Scripture says, and the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean, teaching that whoever can become clean becomes unclean, and whoever cannot become clean does not become unclean. But perhaps we may say that while the laws of purification do not apply to Gentiles, yet the laws of defilement do apply. Scripture says, but the man that shall be unclean, aid shall not purify himself. Or Ahabi Jacob said, Nazi rightship is different for here. There is a verse, and you may make them an inheritance for your children after. You from this we learn that to whomsoever the laws of inheritance of slaves apply to him, the laws of defilement apply, and to whomsoever the laws of inheritance of slaves do not apply to him, the laws of defilement do not apply. If that is the reason that Gentiles cannot become Nazi rights, then slaves too should not be able to become Nazi rights. In point of fact, said Robert, the following is the reason that Gentiles are wholly excluded from Nazi rightship. It is quite permissible in the case of Arakan to argue thus when it says the children of Israel, it implies that Israelites can bow Arakan, but not Gentiles. I might go on to infer from this that Gentiles cannot be the subject of Arakan vows either. Scripture therefore says all, but you cannot similarly argue here in the case of Nazi rightship as follows the words children of Israel imply that Israelites can undertake Nazi right vows and bring the offering due on terminating the Nazi rightship, but not Gentiles. I might go. On to infer from this that Gentiles cannot become Nazi rights at all scripture therefore says man for I will say such an argument is inadmissible since the exclusion of Gentiles from bringing the Nazi right offering is not inferred from this verse but from elsewhere as has been taught our Hosea the Galilean said the verse for a burnt offering serves to exclude a Gentile from bringing the Nazarite offerings why not argue as follows the words children of Israel imply that Israelites can undertake life Nazarite ships but not Gentiles I might go on to infer from this that Gentiles cannot undertake ordinary Nazarite vows either scripture therefore says man are you had and replied is the life Nazarite mentioned in scripture why not argue as follows the words children of Israel imply that Israelites can impose Nazarite vows upon their children but not Gentiles I might go on to infer from this that Gentiles cannot become Nazi rights at all scripture therefore says man but Aryo Hanan has said that this is a traditional ruling with regard to the Nazi right. Why not argue as follows? The words children of Israel imply that Israelites can pull with the offerings due for their fathers' Nazarite sacrifices, but not Gentiles. Talmud, Mas Nazir A. I might go on to infer from this that Gentiles cannot become Nazi rights at all. Scripture therefore says man, but it has been stated. Aryo Hanan said this is a traditional ruling with regard to the Nazi right. Now, if it is a fact that man includes Gentiles, what need is there for the expression when a man shall clearly utter a vow according to thy valuation occurring in connection with a reckon? For consider a reckon are compared in this verse with vows as it says when a man shall clearly utter a vow according to thy valuation and it has been taught in connection with vows. Scripture mentions the word man in order to include Gentiles who are allowed to vow God offerings and free will offerings just as. Israelites do what need then is there for the verse when a man shall clearly utter in connection with a reckon in point of fact this word man is required for the inclusion of a youth who can discriminate but has not quite reached manhood this is all very well if we accept the view of the authority who considers that a youth who can discriminate but has not quite reached manhood has a scriptural right to make vows but if we accept the view of the authority who considers this right to be rabbinic what need is there for when a man shall clearly utter etc it serves to include a gentile youth who can discriminate but has not quite reached manhood this is all very well if we accept the view of the authority who argues as follows the words children of Israel imply that Israelites can be the subject of a reckon vows but not gentiles I might go on to infer from this that gentiles cannot vow reckon scripture therefore says man if however we accept the view of the authority who Argues as follows the words children of Israel imply that Israelites can vow reckon but not Gentiles I might go on to infer from this that Gentiles cannot be the subject of a reckon scripture therefore says man our difficulty remains foreseeing that even a baby a month old can be the subject of an reckon vow what need is there of when a man shall clearly utter our Adabi Ahab replied its purpose is to bring within the scope of the rule an adult Gentile who although he is an adult cannot make even ordinary vows if he cannot discriminate now what need is there of the phrase when a man shall clearly utter mentioned in connection with the Nazi rightship foreseeing that the Nazi rightship is compared with ordinary vowing what need is there of when a man shall clearly utter it serves to include illusions the significance of which is not manifest for it has been stated Abbe said that illusions whose significance is not manifest have the force of a direct statement Whilst Rabbah said that they have not the force of a direct statement now if we accept Abbe's view there is no difficulty but if we accept Rabbah's view what can we reply in point of fact when a man shall clearly utter is necessary for Artarfan's case for it has been taught our Judah on behalf of Artarfan said that not one of these people is a Nazi right because Nazi rightship is not intended except when assumed unequivocally this is all very well if we accept the view of Artarfan but if we accept the view of the rabbis what can you reply in point of fact it is necessary for the following which has been taught in element of vows has no foundation and is without scriptural support our Eliezer says that it has scriptural support for scripture says twice when a man shall clearly utter one signifies a distinct binding expression and one a distinctness which opens the way to an element Talmud Mas Nazir Bimish of the Nazarite vows of slaves are more stringent than those of women. For he can declare void the vows of his wife, but he cannot declare void the vows of his slaves. If he declares his wife's vow void, it is void forever. But if he declares his slaves' vow void, he becomes free and must complete his Nazarite ship. Gemara, our rabbis taught what can his master compel him to disregard the vow of Nazi rightship, but not other vows or vows involving a reckon. Why this difference in the case of the Nazarite vow, the All Merciful has said to bind his soul with a bond, showing that only those who are their own masters are referred to, and excluding slaves who are not their own masters. But if this is the reason, the same should be true of other vows. Our Shishi replied, We suppose here that a cluster of grapes lay before the slave. In the case of vows where if this cluster becomes prohibited to him, others will not become prohibited. His master cannot compel him to eat this one. But in the case of a Nazarite vow, if this one becomes forbidden, all others. Become forbidden, and that is why he can compel him to eat it. But do not ordinary vows include the possibility that there is available only the one cluster of grapes in question, so that if he does not eat it, he will grow weak, and yet the vow takes effect. Rabbi therefore said, We suppose that a pressed grape lay before him in the case of vows, he is prohibited from eating that one only, and so his master cannot compel him to break his vow. But in the case of the Nazarite vow where he is also prohibited from eating others, he can compel him to break his vow. But do not ordinary vows include the possibility that there is available only the one pressed grape in question, so that if he does not eat it, he will grow weak, and yet the vow takes effect. Abbe therefore replied, The barrier really means what is his master obliged to compel him to disregard the vow of Nazi rightship, but he does not even have to compel him to disregard ordinary vows or oaths. This is because it Verse says if anyone swear to do evil or to do good just as doing good is a voluntary undertaking so must the doing of evil be a voluntary undertaking the doing of evil to others being thereby excluded since he has not the right to harm others Mishnah should the slave flee from his master's presence Armeir said that he must not drink wine but our Jose said that he may Gemara is it possible that Armeir and our Jose differ in regard to the following dictum of Samuel for Samuel has said should a man renounce ownership of his slave he becomes free no deed of emancipation being required does Armeir agree with Samuel and our Jose differ from him no both hold this opinion of Samuel but the one who says he should drink considers that since he is ultimately to return to his master he ought to drink in order not to grow emaciated the other who says that he should not drink considers that he should feel the pangs of deprivation in order that he should return to his master Talmud. Mas Nazir Mishnah if a Nazi right pulls and then discovers that he was defiled then
The depth now on Rush Lakish's view that defilement should be visible like a road there is no difficulty but on R. Eliezer's view that it must be evident to him what matters it if there is someone at the end of the world who knows of it further there is the following if a man finds a corpse lying buried across the road he becomes unclean in respect of Terima but remains clean as regards Nazi rightship and celebration of the Passover but what is the difference we must therefore say that the rule of defilement of the depth is known by tradition before polling however etc who is the author of the mission R. Yohan and replied R. Eliezer who considers that polling stops him from drinking wine Rami Bimama propounded what would be the law if the Nazi right became unclean during the fulfillment of his Nazi rightship but discovered this after the fulfillment is at the moment of discovery that is important and this occurred after fulfillment or not the practical difference being the Period that is to be rendered void Talmud, Mas Nazir be Rabba reply come and here before polling however either type of defilement renders it void how are we to understand this if he discovered the defilement during the period of fulfillment would it be necessary to tell us that the Nazi rightship is void it follows that after fulfillment is meant hence discovery after fulfillment renders void the question however still remains whether the whole period is rendered void or only seven days but on whose view is this question asked shall I say on the rabbi's view it is obvious that the whole period becomes void whilst on Arlizer's view any defilement contracted after fulfillment renders only seven days void the reply is that Arlizer said this of one who actually becomes unclean after fulfillment whereas here the defilement of the depth occurred before the fulfillment do we then say that the whole is rendered void or is this case different since discovery did not Come until after fulfillment the same passage answers this question too for it says either type of defilement renders it void making no distinction between them or rabbis taught if a man finds a corpse lying across the road he becomes unclean in respect of terima but remains clean in respect of the Nazarite vow and celebrating the Passover this is only true if there was no room for him to pass without actually walking over the corpse but if there was room for him to pass he remains clean even in respect of terima further it is only true if the corpse was found whole but if it was found with its limbs broken or dislocated even though there was no room to pass we can see that he may perhaps have passed between the pieces if however the corpse was in a grave then even if its limbs were broken or dislocated he becomes unclean because the grave unites it further we say this only of one who was walking on foot but if he was carrying a load or riding he becomes Unclean because it is possible for one walking on foot to avoid either touching the corpse or making it vibrate or overshadowing it but it is impossible for one carrying a load or riding to avoid either touching it or making it vibrate or overshadowing it further this ruling applies only to a defilement of the depth but if it was a known source of defilement all three become unclean a defilement of the depth is one which is not known to anyone living even in any part of the world if however someone living even at the other end of the world knows about it it is not regarded as a defilement of the depth if the corpse was hidden in straw or in pebbles it counts as a defilement of the depth but if in the sea or by darkness or in a cleft of the rocks this does not count as a defilement of the depth defilement of the depth was held to apply only in the case of a corpse the law regarding defilement of the depth is as follows if he goes down a dead reptile when Floating does not defile for it has been taught if there is a doubt concerning a source of defilement floating in a vessel or on the earth it is treated as clean our Simeon said that in a vessel the doubtful object is treated as unclean whilst on the earth it is treated as clean Talmud, Mas Nazir what is the first ten is reason our Isaac Beobudimi said scripture says ye shall not mistake yourselves abominable with any swarming thing that swarms signifying no matter where it swarms and says further on the earth how are these verses to be reconciled where there is no doubt that he touched it he is always unclean but if there is a doubt he remains clean and what is our Simeon's reason Ola said scripture says nevertheless a fountain shall be clean and continues but he who touch it their case shall be unclean how are we to reconcile these whilst floating in a vessel a doubtful object is treated as unclean but on the earth it is treated as clean our rabbis taught where there are doubts concerning any source of defilement that is carried or dragged along the objects are regarded as unclean because it is as though they are at rest but where the doubt concerns things that are thrown they are treated as clean with the exception of an olive's bulk of a corpse one who overshadows a source of defilement and all other things that propagate defilement upwards as well as downwards this last expression serves to include sufferers from gonorrhoe male and female. Rami Bihama propounded what is the law concerning a corpse lying in a vessel floating on the surface of the water is the vessel the criterion or the corpse should it be decided that the vessel is the criterion what would be the law if the fragment of the corpse was lying on a dead reptile seeing that the latter defile only until evening and the former for seven days are we to consider it as though it were lying in a vessel or should it perhaps be considered a compact source of defilement? Should it be decided further that this is considered as though it were lying in a vessel and therefore is treated as though defilement were certain what would be the law of a dead reptile were lying on a floating animal carcass seeing that both defile only until evening are they to be regarded as a compact source of defilement or should we consider rather that of the one in olive's bulk is necessary whilst of the other lentil's bulk is sufficient further what would be the law of one reptile lay on the other here certainly the measure is the same but perhaps seeing that they are distinct we should regard it as lying in a vessel again should it be decided that in the case of one reptile lying on another it is regarded as though it lay in a vessel because the two reptiles are distinct what would be the law regarding a reptile floating on a liquefied animal carcass seeing that it has been liquefied is it to be regarded as liquid or do we perhaps say that after all it is now a solid again should you decide that it is a solid what would be the law regarding a reptile floating on an effusion of semen should you decide that the latter because it originates by detachment from the human body is a solid what would be the law regarding a reptile floating on water of cleansing that was floating on the surface of ordinary water we do not know all these problems remain unsolved Talmud, Mas Nazir B. Arham said a Nazi right or a celebrant of the Passover who walks over a grave of the depth on the seventh day of purification after defilement is clean the reason being that defilement of the depth is not potent enough to render void the Nazi rightship or the Passover rob objected if it was to purify himself after defilement through contact with the dead he remains unclean because where the status quo is one of defilement the defilement remains but where it is one of purity he remains clean Arham Nana replied I admit you are right in the case of a Nazi right who needs polling Rabbah then said to him and I admit you are right in the case of a celebrant of the Passover who has completed all preliminaries Abbe said to Rabbah but has he not still to wait for the sun to set he replied the sun sets of its own accord Abbe too gave up this opinion for it has been taught if it is on the day of fulfillment she must bring a further sacrifice but if during fulfillment she need not bring one it might be thought that she is not required to bring a sacrifice for a birth occurring during the fulfillment but must bring one for a birth occurring after the fulfillment and discharge her obligation for both births and so scripture says and when the days of her purification are fulfilled which signifies that if it occurs on the day of fulfillment she must bring a sacrifice but not if it occurs during the fulfillment whereon Arkahana explained that the difference was due to the fact that she needed to bring a sacrifice now in the other case has she not still to wait for the sun to set Abbe replied the sun sets of its own accord mission if a man finds a corpse for the first time lying in the usual position he may remove it together with the soil that it occupies if he finds two he may remove them together with the ground they occupy if he finds three then if the distance between the first and the last is from four to eight cubits this is a graveyard site Talmud, Mas Nazir he must then search beyond for a distance of twenty cubits if he finds a single corpse at the end of twenty cubits he must search beyond for another twenty cubits the reason is that there is now a presumption whereas if he had found it first he would have been able to remove it together with the soil it occupies Gamar Rab Judah said if a man finds but not if he knows it is to be found there a corpse but not one who had been killed lying but not seated in the usual position but not with its head lying between its thighs will be Hanna. Taught a defective corpse does not acquire the ground it occupies nor does it help to form a graveyard side why does not the law of the mission apply to all these because we say that perhaps it is the body of a heathen if he finds two corpses with the head of one beside the feet of the second and the head of the second beside the feet of the first they do not acquire the soil which they occupy and do not help to form a graveyard side if he finds three corpses one of which was
Virgin soil, the following objection was raised that has been taught and what quantity of earth are we to understand by the ground which it occupies? Our Eliezer B. Arzadik explained that he takes the chips of the coffin and the lumps of earth, discarding what certainly did not belong to the body and leaving whatever was doubtful for removal. The remainder adds together to form the major part of the structure of the corpse, the quarter cab of bones, and the spoonful of corpse mold are. Eliezer agrees with the following tenet for it has been taught what quantity of earth is meant by the ground which it occupies. Our Yohan and citing Ben Aze said he takes a loose earth and digs up three finger breadths of virgin soil. He must then search beyond IT Talmud. Mas Nazir B. Rabba said if he searched, found a corpse and removed it, searched again and found another and removed it, and then searched again and found a third corpse, he must not remove this one for reburial with. The other two nor the other two for reburial with this one other say that Rabbah said as permission had been given to remove the others he may remove them all but why should not the field become a graveyard side Resh said the rabbi seized upon any pretext to declare the land of Israel clean suppose he searched beyond it for twenty cubits in one direction only and did not find another corpse what is the law Armanash of Jeremiah citing Rab replied this is a graveyard. Side what is the reason that we say this Resh said they seized on any pretext to declare the land of Israel clean mission every doubtful case of leprous disease encountered for the first time before you and cleanness has been established is clean after Uncle Anes has been established doubtful cases are unclean tomorrow how do we know this Rab Judah citing Rab said the verse says to pronounce it clean or to pronounce it unclean scripture mentions cleanness first in that case even after. Uncleanness has been established, doubtful cases should be clean. We must therefore say that this dictum of Rab quoted by Arjuda was uttered in connection with the following omission. It says if the bright spot appears before the white hair, he is unclean, but if the white hair appears before the bright spot, he is clean. If there is a doubt, he is unclean. Our Joshua said it is doubtful. What is meant by it is doubtful. Rab Judah replied, It is doubtful and consequently clean. May it not mean that it is doubtful and consequently unclean. Rab Judah citing Rab said the verse says to pronounce it clean or to pronounce it unclean. Scripture mentions cleanness. First mission of person suffering from a flux is examined regarding seven things before the presence of Gonorrhea has been established. Is with regard to food, drink, burdens, leaving sickness, a vision, or an impure thought. Once Gonorrhea is established, he is no longer examined. Flux resulting from an accident to him, doubtful flux and his. Issue of semen are unclean for there is a presumption of Uncle Anes if a man gives another a blow from which he was expected to die and he partially recovered and then grew worse and died the other is liable for murder our Nehemiah exempts him since there is a presumption in his favor tomorrow how do we know this Nathan said the verse says and of the Gonorrhea that have the issue whether it be a man or a woman the male at his third experience of issue is compared to the female but have we not been taught our Eliezer says at the third issue we examine him but not at the fourth in point of fact they disagree on the question of stressing the particle the our Eliezer lays stress on the particle the whilst the rabbis do not do so flux resulting from an accident to him doubtful flux Talmud Mas Nazir Rabba said do not suppose that the meaning of doubtful flux is that there is a doubt whether there was an issue or not in point of fact the issue must be a certain one it Doubt being whether it was due to an issue of semen or whether it was caused by a separate gonorrhea attack once uncleanness has been established if there is a doubt he is unclean this issue of semen is unclean in what respect is the semen unclean for if it be in respect of touching it how is it worse than the issue of semen of a clean person it must therefore mean that the semen of a sufferer from gonorrhea defile through being carried but who is known to hold the view that the issue of semen of a sufferer from gonorrhea defile if carried for if you say that it is the following tan as has been taught our Eliezer says that the issue of semen of a sufferer from gonorrhea does not defile if carried whilst our Joshua says that it does defile if carried because it is impossible that it should not be diluted with gonorrhea fluid even our Joshua only says this because it is diluted with gonorrhea fluid but not when it is undiluted in point of fact said our Abbey Purpose of the mission is to lay down that subsequent gonorrhea issue is not ascribed to the prior flow of semen. Our Papa tried to argue with Rabba that this was because the flow resulted from his weakness following the gonorrhea. Rabba said to him, Have we not learned to proselyte defile if subject to a gonorrhea flow immediately after conversion? He replied, There cannot be greater sickness than this. We must say, in fact, that to what extent semen of a sufferer from gonorrhea defile is a controversy of Tanaim, for it has been taught the semen of a sufferer from gonorrhea defile for 24 hours if carried. Our Jose, however, says for the whole of the same day wherein does their controversy lie in respect of the point raised by Samuel. For Samuel noted the following contradiction it is written, If there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of that which chanceth him by night, etc., and it is written further, When evening cometh on, he shall bathe himself in water. The one who says twenty-four hours infers this from when evening cometh on, and the other infers it from that which chanceth him by night. Now to the one who infers it from when evening cometh on, it may be objected. It is written that which chanceth him by night. He will reply that it is customary for an omission to occur at night. Mission Samuel was a Nazi right in the opinion of our near as it says, and there shall no razor more come upon his head. It says with reference to Samson and no razor more, and it says with reference to Samuel and no razor more. Just as more in the case of Samson, I as used of a Nazi right, so we should say more in the case of Samuel, I as used of a Nazi right. Our Jose objected, but has not more reference to fear of a human being. Our near said to him, but does it not also say? And Samuel said, how can I go if Saul hear it? He will kill me, which shows that he was in fact afraid of a human being. Gamar Rab said to his son Hi Talmud, Mas Nazir B. Snatch the cup and say grace. So also did Arhuna say to his son Rabbi, snatch the cup and say grace. Does this mean that it is better to say the blessing than to make the responses? Has it not been taught? Our Jose says that he who responds Amen is greater than he who says the blessing. And Arnieri said to him, I swear that this is so in proof of this. It may be noted that the ordinary soldiers begin a battle, but the picked troops gain the victory. There is a difference of opinion between Tanaim on this matter, for it has been taught both the one who says the blessing and the one who responds Amen are included in this verse. Nevertheless, reward is given first to the one who says the blessing. Our Eliezer citing Arhanan said the disciples of the sages increase peace throughout the world as it is said, and all that children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of that children.